Uh, members, the Speaker has been informed by the Chief Electoral Officer that Paul Rankin has been returned as a member of the Assembly for Ligon Valley constituency to fill, to fill the vacancy. Uh, members, quiet please. To fill the vacancy which resulted from the resignation of Edwin Pitts. Mr. Rankin signed the undertaking and role of membership yesterday afternoon in my presence and that of the clerk to the Assembly and entered his designation. That concludes that item. Uh, the first item of business on the order paper is the consideration of business not concluded on Monday the 14th of March. As all business yesterday was concluded, we will move on. The next item of business is the final stage of the Adoption and Children Bill. I call the Minister of Health to move the final stage. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the final stage of the Children's Adoption Bill. Thank you. Uh, the final stage of the Adoption and Children Bill has been moved. The Business Committee has agreed there should be no time limit on this debate. I therefore call the Minister of Health to open the debate, please. <coughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, I, I have great pleasure today in moving the final stage of the Adoption and Children's Bill. Born out of the, the draft adopting the Future Strategy in 2006, this bill has been long awaited by all those involved in the adoption process and in children's social care. Indeed, the fact that Michael Majimsey was the first minister to try to secure these changes is indicative of just how long the wait has been. So on behalf of the adoption agencies, fostering service providers, health and social care trusts, foundry organisations and the young people and their families who have contributed their expertise and experience throughout the development process. I am proud to have been able to bring this bill forward during my tenure as Health Minister. By way of this bill, children in Northern Ireland, who are some of the most vulnerable children living here, can now enjoy the same rights as in other parts of the United Kingdom. I agree with the comments of the Chair of the Health Committee made during further consideration stage. This is among the most important pieces of legislation that will be made by this House in this mandate. Make no mistake that the changes that will be made by the Bill will change lives. The lives of adopted children and their families who provide them with loving homes, children on the age of care and children in care. It will mean that adoptive families can enjoy additional support, will strengthen and widen support for families in need, and will enable some children to leave care sooner and will ensure that greater support is in place for care leavers and for longer. In recent stages of the Bill, we have focused on amendments, as is the nature of the legislative process. When dealing with these technical matters, however, it can be all too easy to lose sight of the broader benefits of the Bill. With your indulgence, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly highlight some of the major changes which will be brought about by the Bill to remind us all of why this, what this Bill is really about. The Bill will place the welfare of the child at the heart of an adoption decision-making, and that's by way of measures like the welfare checklist. Children and young people will be, able, will be given a voice, and their thoughts and feelings will be given greater weight. They will be empowered to be more involved in the decisions that affect them. The Bill will reduce uncertainty and delay in the adoption process, by requiring courts and adoption agencies to adhere to the no delay principle and will require courts to draw up a timetable for proceedings. As a result, we should, should expect to see unnecessary delay removed and the time frame for adoption potentially reduced. The bill will introduce a framework for adoption support and that includes financial support and access to counselling, advice and information. Birth families and adoptive families will be able to request an assessment of needs for adoption support at any time, either before or after an adoption order has been made. And in keeping with the will of the House, Trust will also be under a duty to provide adoption support services, which will have been assessed as needed uh, to certain specified categories of persons. Placement orders will replace freeing orders. Freeing orders have been widely criticised, partly because once made, parental responsibility for the child transfers completely from the child's parents to the adoption agency. What will that mean in practical terms? It actually means parents will share parental responsibility for their child with the adoption agency until the final adoption order is made. 
It will also mean that prospective adopters will share parental responsibility when the child is placed with them, and this is an important departure from current arrangements. It is intended to be fair to parents and to minimise the risk of a contested court hearing and crucially provide greater certainty for children and prospective adopters. The Bill will provide a new framework for contact, requiring courts to consider arrangements for contact and enabling courts to make orders specifying the arrangements for contact. And in keeping with the certain, uh, centrality of the child aims of the Bill, children will be empowered to make or influence decisions about contact, and that includes being able to apply to the court to seek or vary or revoke previously agreed contact, no contact arrangements. All adopted people should have the right to find out about their family history and background when the time is right for them. The Adoption Contact Register enables adopted adults and their natural parents and relatives to register their willingness for contact. Under the Bill, it will be possible for adopted adults to indicate who they want to and don't want to have contact with, and for relatives to indicate whether they want to have contact with the adopted person. The Bill will introduce a new framework allowing for an adoption agency to provide intermediary services that may lead to sharing of information and facilitating contact. The intermediary agency will have an important role to play in providing specialist support and advice to all parties throughout the process. The Bill will strengthen safeguards for children being brought into or out of Northern Ireland through an inter-country adoption by way of additional restrictions and tougher penalties. The Bill enables my department to establish a designated list of countries outside the United Kingdom, Channel Islands and Isle of Man, which have sufficiently robust adoption procedures and safeguards in place to enable adoptions in that country being legally recognised in Northern Ireland. Having a designated list acts as a further safeguard for children being brought into this country from overseas. I am confident that the Bill will build greater confidence in the adoption system as a whole uh, through better, more streamlined processes and the offer of additional support and the access of an independent review mechanism to facilitate the review of decisions relating to, to suitability to adoption. It is my belief that by improving confidence in our adoption systems, we will encourage more people to come forward as potential adoptive parents. That can only be good for the children in Northern Ireland for whom adoption is considered the best way forward. The Bill will also improve outcomes for children and families in need, children in care and children leaving care. For children and families in need, the Bill will give social workers more flexibility to provide financial support to them. Disabled children and their parents will be able to benefit from a residential short break without the child having to become looked after. For looked after children, we will enhance current care planning arrangements by placing care planning on a statutory basis. Not only will trust be required to prepare a care plan for the child within a time scale set by the court, regulations will specify that the plan must contain uh, and duties to keep the plan under regular review will apply. The Bill will also introduce a set of corporate parenting principles, and what, this sets, and what this set of principles does is capture in one place very clear expectations of trusts when looking after children in care. And this includes having the promotion high aspirations for them, delivering safety and stability for them, and preparing them for adult and independent living, ensuring they receive the same opportunities and life chances that any good parent would seek <coughs> for their own child. Under the Bill, looked after children will be supported to raise issues or make complaints about the services they receive and have their views responded to appropriately. Statutory independent advocacy services will be available to support each child through this process. While fostering panels currently exist, the Bill will enable my department to make regulations setting out the functions of fostering panels and how they should operate. Also, individuals who disagree with the decision made about whether they should be approved or continue to be approved to foster will be able to ask for an independent review of the decision. This is similar to the independent review mechanism being introduced for adoption decisions. Support provided to care leavers as they move into independent living or further in higher education will be enhanced under the Bill, which will place the GEM scheme on a statutory basis and extend support to care leavers in education or training to the age of 25. Trusts will be required to publish information on the services they offer for care leavers to ensure they and those acting on their behalf 
are fully aware of what is available to them in service items. Of particular significance, the Bill will also introduce a special guardianship order, which will offer a new option for permanence for children and young people where adoption is either not possible or considered unsuitable, and will enable them to be brought up in a secure and stable home until aged 18. Unlike adoption, when a special guardianship order is in place, the legal ties between a child and their family will not be severed. Importantly, we have applied the learning from England and Wales and created additional safeguards and strengthened support arrangements. Mr Deputy Speaker, members will be aware that a number of amendments have been made to the Bill since its introduction. The amendments came about following Health Committee scrutiny, and I would like to thank the Committee members and the stakeholders who responded to the call for evidence. The time frame for scrutiny of this Bill was greatly compressed, and the efficient and diligent work of the Committee, as evidenced in their comprehensive final report, was pivotal in getting this Bill to this stage. And I thank them, Mr Deputy Speaker, for their contributions. I will very briefly remind members of the amendments made to the Bill, which, in my view, most definitely strengthen this Bill and should lead to improved outcomes for children and families in Northern Ireland as a result. We have further broadened the definition of harm in the Children Order, more explicitly linking it to the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, Northern Ireland 2021, so potentially offering greater, greater protections to children and young people living with domestic abuse. Following comments from the Committee and stakeholders, we have created an automatic right for those involved in special guardianship applications or arrangements to receive an assessment of need and support where a trust has determined by way of its assessment that support is required. Access to information was one of the key themes that emerged from the work of the Truth Recovery Design Panel, which was appointed to work with victim survivors of mother and baby institutions, Magdalene Laundries and workhouses in Northern Ireland. Amendments have been made to the Bill in recognition of this, allowing the Department to make new regulations concerning the disclosure of information and enabling the birth relatives of adopted persons to benefit from a wider range of intermediary services to obtain information and make contact if both parties agree. I would like to take this moment to, to thank the victims and survivors of mother and baby institutions for their engagement with this sensitive and important aspect of the Bill. Deputy Speaker, further amendments were made following committee scrutiny, including strengthening of the duties of trusts in relation to looked after children. When the Bill is passed, trusts will have to promote, support and facilitate their learning and development and their achievement. We have put it beyond doubt that advocacy services provided to looked after children must be independent. Also, this House will be given the opportunity to engage in debate on a greater number of statutory rules developed by the Department and be confident that it will receive triennial reports on the operation of the Children's Order. Finally, Deputy Speaker, the House will be fully cited on how implementation of the Bill is progressing, again by way of reports from the Department, which you will continue to receive until all the provisions in Parts 1 and 2 of the Bill are commenced and fully reported on. I have made a number of commitments during the Bill's passage, not explicitly linked to its provision. They include a commitment to explore whether there is scope under the 93 Hague Convention and or domestic legislation to establish a special arrangement between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. This is with the aim of streamlining or harmonising current practice and or procedure, and it relates to the adoption of children between the two jurisdictions. And of course, this will require the full cooperation of the Irish Government. I firmly believe and I hope that you will agree that as a result of the scrutiny that this Bill has received during its passage in the Assembly, we now have an improved, more robust overarching legislative framework within which we can now start to make the changes needed to improve the lives of children and young people in care and in adoption. Mr Deputy Speaker, while reaching final stage is a significant milestone that we deservedly celebrate today, I do not have to remind members that this is not the end of the matter. There are numerous sets of regulations to be made, supported by detailed guidance, to give operational effect to many aspects of the Bill. All of these are just as vital as the primary legislation itself, and planning is already underway to ensure a smooth and effective implementation phase uh, implementation process. We plan to consult widely on any regulations and guidance, 
continuing the constructive engagement we have had with stakeholders throughout the process of bringing this bill to final stage. And on that note, Mr Deputy Speaker, to finish, I would like to thank everyone who had a part in getting this bill to this stage. My thanks to the committee is already on record, and I would like to repeat my thanks to the Chair, members and staff for their work on the committee report. I also wish to recognise the input of the Office of Legislative Council in the preparation of the legislation. Its support and advice throughout has been invaluable and greatly appreciated by my department. Finally, and whilst they are far too modest to say so themselves, this bill would not be happening were it not for the sheer persistence and dedication of my own officials, very ably led, of course, by Eilish McDaniel, that being Julie Stevenson, Liz Marsh as two of the main ones. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, also key to this bill and this legislation over a number of years was Francis Nicholson, who is due to retire um, from the department after a lifetime of dedication and service. And Frances actually extended her retirement date to see this piece of legislation through, but also to work on the sealing of records as well. And I want to thank the entirety of the team for the support they have given me, given the committee, but also given the children who will benefit from this bill. Mr Deputy Speaker, 16 years after this process started, I am delighted to say that I commend this bill to the House. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Health Committee, Colm Gildenew. Gorma Agut, Laskian Korya, Agus is more an honour, Dom, Ave and Shaw, our son, Rin Slantia, and you. It is an honour indeed to be here on behalf of the Health Committee today at the final stage of this hugely important bill, as the Minister has outlined. I would also like to begin with thanking the Minister of Health for introducing this bill. As he has stated, it is a bill which is much overdue and is, is one that makes a massive difference to the people that it impacts. Um, I also like to thank the departmental officials for their support in bringing this legislation forward and their detailed briefing to the committee over a number of months. And I would uh, echo the, the minister's um, uh, words there in relation to Ellis McDaniel and her team in terms of their diligence, their availability to us as a committee, and their, their, uh, their, their clear level of commitment to getting this bill completed and to its, its drafting. As I have said last year, call you, at other stages of consideration of this bill, this is a hugely significant piece of legislation that has the potential to provide real benefits to some of the most vulnerable people in our community. The committee welcomes this bill and its aims and believes that the bill can have a real impact and provide support and help to children and young people. The committee welcomes that the bill will align adoption law with the relevant provisions of the Children Order to ensure that the child's welfare is the paramount consideration in decisions relating to adoption. We also welcome that the bill will provide a new right for adopted children and adoptive parents to request an assessment of their needs for adoption support services and, following a committee amendment, that the bill will now place a duty on adoption authorities to provide services which have been identified as needed. The bill makes significant changes to the children order that will improve outcomes for children and young people, including the duty to safeguard and to promote, facilitate and support the child's learning and development and achievement in relation to education and training. It will also extend the age limit for support provided to care leavers who are still engaged in education and training from 24 to 25. And the bill will allow specified care leavers aged between 21 and 25 to pursue a new course of education or training and places the going the extra mile scheme on a statutory footing to enable care leavers to continue living with their foster parents up to the age of 21. Indeed, during the committee's consideration of evidence last year, Corley, the committee met with young people who are engaged with VoIPEC, and I am delighted to see some of those young people here in the gallery today. So I'd like to say hello to Naomi, Martha and Jack, and their, mentor, their mentors Lee and Nicola. And indeed, I'm also delighted that we're joined today by Mac, all age nine of them there, and he's up there hiding behind that television. But I can assure you, members, he's not missing a single thing, and he's here today to make sure that we do it right. So um, I also have to say that I, I was va hugely impressed, and, and I referred to children and young people being vulnerable earlier. It's not that they are vulnerable in themselves. 
It's that the circumstances and the challenges that have been placed before them put them into vulnerable positions, and that's why I think we have such a duty to work with them and for them and to deliver for them. So I'm, I'm delighted they're here today. During our discussion with these young people, they outlined the importance of them being involved in decisions about their own lives. They stated that they wanted options and to feel empowered to make their own decisions. And I thought one of the key statements during that, that engagement was young people saying, if we have options, we have a voice. And I think that's crucial. And I think this bill does provide options and therefore does provide a voice to those young uh, people. I would like to pay tribute um, to, to the, them and the work of organisations like Voipik who give a voice to children and young people in care. And I hope they will continue to engage and to be involved and to be heard when the regulations to implement the bill are brought forward in the next mandate. Indeed, since we last met the young activists of Voipik, since we last met the young activists of Voipik have themselves developed a guidance document for how meetings with children and young people should be arranged and conducted. I would hope that the 12 principles that those young activists have indicated and enshrined will become standard practice for professionals engaging with young people in the future. The committee would like to place on record its thanks to those organisations that provided written evidence and oral evidence to the committee on this bill. I would like to thank those adoptive parents and foster parents, along with Adoption UK and Fostering Network, who met with members to discuss the bill and the issues that they face. I would encourage the Department to engage with the experts in this area. That is those children and young people who are in care or have gone through care, and those adoptive and foster parents who are all themselves experts by experience. The committee has always said last year in Corlea, that co-design and co-production are the best processes for ensuring that services and support are directed to those who need it. And we would encourage the department to ensure that co-design and co-production are key elements to the implementation of the legislation going forward. I would like to thank committee members for their consideration of this bill. The committee tabled a number of amendments to the bill at consideration stage to strengthen the bill, and I thank members for their engagement. And I think it is noteworthy, noteworthy that we did have consensus on progression of the bill. We had hugely diligent work from all members. We met multiple times in the, in the evenings uh, during the days to ensure that we were shaping this bill in a way that would bear maximum impact now that it has finally uh, arrived to this point. Um, I would like to thank the committee team and the bill clerk for their support throughout that entire process in what was quite a complex bill um, and, and a bill that I think there was a huge sense of responsibility on all of us to get it right and to get it as good as we could. So I thank the committee clerk and, uh, in, in what was a hugely pressurised time given all of the other legislation that we were also considering. But I believe no stone was left unturned in this or, or in any of the other bills in terms of doing everything we could to, uh, to, to shape it and scrutinise it. So therefore, last year, Corlea, I, as chair of the committee, I commend the bill to the Assembly, and I look forward to seeing the real impacts and benefits it will have for children and young people over the coming years. I would now make just a few very brief comments as, as Sinn Féin spokesperson, just to say that I firmly believe this is one of the most important and rewarding pieces of work that I have been involved in in this Assembly largely because it impacts uh, people, young people, who I have mentioned earlier, who are placed in particularly challenging circumstances by the way society has operated, and uh, I think we, we owe that to them. I also think it's been a, a huge um, plus in terms of the quality and levels of engagement that we've had by those experts being experienced throughout the bill, and I think you can see uh, that process has worked really well in the sense that it has been uh, included within, within the, uh, the, the the, uh, the details of the bill. So, in terms of engagement, I think it's, it's a really good model and, and it demonstrates the worth of continuing and, and quality engagement. I also welcome the commitments from the Minister and the work that has been done throughout the passage of the bill in relation to the North South issues. And I know that both Department officials and the Minister have committed to seeing how we can ensure that we maximise the benefits of having people here potentially who are kinship or, or foster or placements. Who, uh, who would be in the child's best interest, and that's what we have sought to put at the centre of all of our work in relation to the bill. So I want to also, on behalf of Sinn Féin, thank everyone that took part, in particular all of the young people up in the, in the gallery today. I'm delighted to see you here today, to see the conclusion of your work, and to see the fact that your voice does matter, and you do have options, and you're exercising those options by being here today, and by helping us to shape and deliver this bill on your behalf. 
So um, just, just to conclude, I think this is an example, as we have seen m several times, particularly over the last number of weeks, given the timetabling, this Assembly at its very best. This Assembly identifying something that needs to be legislated for, going out and engaging with those people who have the information to shape the legislation, and coming in here then and delivering that legislation on behalf of those people outside these walls. And I just think that's the perfect example of the way this Assembly should and could operate, and I look forward to seeing much more of that in the future and us being effective in relation to that. Gorham Yagov, Concord. I now call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, today is a momentous day for um, our Assembly in bringing the Adoption and Children's Bill to final stage. It is a long-awaited uh, bill, Mr Deputy Speaker. I sincerely believe it will bring about much-needed overhaul and reform of our adoption system after 35 years. The need is all too clear uh, for a more fit-for-purpose, responsive and child-focused uh, adoption process in Northern Ireland. It is of utmost importance that we reform our systems and bring them into the 21st century. This bill also makes amendments to the Children's Order 1995 to improve outcomes for looked-after children and young people um, who have left care. A new, clear and more robust system will ensure better and fairer outcomes for children, young people, prospective parents and social care staff who do immense work in supporting those within the system. And it must be said that through each stage in the legislative process, the welfare of the child has been at the heart of every member's comments. I want to thank the Minister of Health, Robin Swan, who um, in his role has guided this, this extensive piece of legislation through the Assembly. Um, as Deputy Chair of the Health Committee, I also want to uh, put on record my thanks to um, the <coughs> Chair, Colin Gildernew, and the committee um, members for all their work, and also to recognise the, the, the fantastic contributions from all those organisations, such as Voipec, and great to see you here today, um, uh, in terms of the scrutiny process in uh, us dealing with the, the evidence, oral um, and written and indeed the formal and informal sessions that we had with these organisations, were, which were incredible, incredibly useful. I also wanted to thank um, the committee clerk, Keith McBride, for his work and for the entire team uh, at the Health Committee, who have been under incredible pressure in the last um, couple of years in particular. So we, we thank them for that good work. And also, of course, to the, to the, um, the Bill's Office team. Uh, and indeed the health officials who have put an incredible amount of work in, I would say, over many years to see this uh, piece of legislation come to fruition. Um, I think it is, uh, there has been significant and, um, development and supportive amendments to the bill which are, which are welcome and we see the value in those. So, Mr Speaker, now the real work begins to see this bill fully implemented. I support this motion uh, on this stage of this. Bill. Thank you very much. Sir Colin McGrath on Kanchai. Call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak today on this bill, not least because it's at its final stage, uh, and it shows this place at its very best. Whenever we come together, whenever we work hard together, whenever we put in the hard work in the committee stages together, we can deliver change which actually impacts and helps people in their lives. And surely that is the purpose of this space, to do all that we can to try and help and assist people. And it wasn't a small task, as people have said. Sometimes bills go through here with one or two clauses. Uh, as introduced, there was 160 clauses in this bill, never mind the number of schedules after that. Even just reading it uh, was a mammoth task on its own, never mind trying to assess what it does uh, and any of the changes that we wanted to make. Um, I want to put on record our thanks for all of those that helped and assisted, uh, from Keith and the team, uh, the committee members, the department staff, uh, and on the organisations that came in and spoke. But to set all of that aside, whenever all of us as adults and all of us uh, that are paid get round the table and, and do our work, it can uh, reach an achievement. But I will always remember the session that we had with the young people, because their voice is the most important. They have got the real life experience and are able to tell us exactly what the problems are, and we were able to interpret that and make amends and work with the department to deliver real change that will help other young people. 
uh, and for those young people that participated in this process uh, from VoIPIC um, can be really proud that they're helping uh, people in the future. You're helping other young people who may face problems, who may now not face those problems because of your contribution. And that's an absolutely fantastic achievement. And we really, really appreciate the contribution that you have made to this bill. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, news has come, uh, unfortunately, to light today regarding a children's mental health charity in which the needs of children and young people were not met. Uh, and there were significant failings that have taken place there. So the needs of our children and young people must be paramount in all that we do. Uh, for those children that need a forever home, uh, they carry with them a range of needs which are complex uh, and varying. Their needs and their care are of paramount importance. Uh, I believe that the legislation that we are passing today at its final stage will do just that. It will help and it will assist. The legislation which all quarters of this House have helped deliver today should be fit to meet the needs of the 21st century and our ever-evolving society. And one only has to look um, at the tragic displacement of millions from Ukraine, uh, which will have included many, many children. There will undoubtedly be many children that are not travelling with their parents, and as a result of that conflict, they will now find themselves of, in a scenario of looking for a home. People across the world are willing to open their homes uh, to those that are in need to find and help families that are ripped apart. The plights that these people face, I believe, speaks to the very core of this legislation and the spirit in which it has been drafted. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is certainly my hope that this legislation is delivered that more families from across the north will consider adopting children. Uh, who maybe had not given it consideration until they've heard about the passage of this legislation and the help and the support uh, that there will now be, uh, the additional help and support that there will now be for people that enter into that process. While adopting one child may not necessarily, necessarily change the world, for that child, their world will change forever. And that has to be something that we have to try and support and assist. Mr Deputy Speaker, the SDLP will support the bill today and look forward to seeing its outworking in the lives of children and families right across the north. Thank you. I now call Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, this is a significant and important piece of legislation. <clears throat> it is making good law <clears throat> that has the current and future welfare of adopted children at its core. It improves the outcomes for looked after children and young people, and also young people who have left care. It also caters to meet the needs, be it either financial or support, for adopters. And we must never forget the selfless part that adopters play in providing a child with a stable family setting. The benefits of this legislation will, be, will greatly improve the quality of life for many people for years to come. I also welcome the provision within the bill uh, to make access to information for adopted adults that little bit easier. I'm delighted to see the bill uh, reach this point, and today will be seen as a good day for those adopting and most importantly for those children in care and who have been adopted. It has taken 16 years, but it has finally arrived, and I commend the Minister for his leadership and determination to finally deliver this legislation. I also wish to place on record uh, my appreciation to his staff who have worked so diligently in creating uh, this legislation. And as Mr. McGrath has alluded to, um, this House can demonstrate through this piece of legislation when we all work closely together what we can actually deliver uh, for the people of Northern Ireland. This is maybe one of the easier pieces of legislation that we can all take a collegiate approach on. But I would like to see the day when we can all work together and deal with the hard and more difficult pieces of legislation that come through this House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. 
Um, the very first meeting I had in my constituency office upon, upon being appointed to the Health Committee here at Stormont was with Adoption NI. They wanted to impress upon me the need for urgent reform and updating of existing provisions relating to adoption law here in Northern Ireland. It was then already two years since the Children Order and nearly another six have since passed. But today let us look at this from a positive light that we now have legislation which perhaps advances us even beyond neighbouring jurisdictions. It is an exciting day and listening to the Health Minister and the Chair of the Health Committee read out some of the benefits, um, some of the provisions within this Adoption of Children's Bill, it, it filled my heart with joy and I'm sure others in this chamber the same and those in the balcony and watching in. In addition to Adoption NI, there are many, many other organisations who have been so instrumental in shaping this um, bill before us today, notably but not exclusively um, Bernardo's, uh, NSPCC, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, NICI, um, Family Roots, Family Care Adoption Services, Fostering Network UK, the British Association of Social Workers, Action for Children, Home for Good and of course um, uh, the Foster, sorry, Fostering Network UK, I hope I got them, but most notably FOIPIC and the young people who they um, engaged um, with us um, so eloquently and powerfully and they had such an impact on us in, in our endeavour to ensure that we made sure that this um, legislation today was fit for purpose and met the needs of young people. I sincerely thank them all for their endeavours and their support to us on the Health Committee. I'd also like to thank those individuals who came to us privately to recount their experiences. Some of them are quite painful. Some of them are quite distressing to hear, but they did so um, with the purpose of ensuring that others coming after them would see a different um, process and different regulations in place to support um, the, the journeys of others. The Minister and his officials within the Department of Health also need much praise for producing such a comprehensive bill, which, uh, as others um, have noted, made its passage with very few amendments. Um, such was the um, comprehensive nature of it and, and the thorough um, work that went into bringing it in at first stage. As the Chair has noted, I think the committee, with the support of the clerk and the other staff, did work very um, well together. Um, we, we worked extremely hard on this bill. We wanted an outcome um, that would re result in a much more efficient system that will change lives forever. From the outset, I have been concerned that the bill was incomplete given the lack of certainty around records, and the Minister has spoken about this today. And I again commend the um, member of the Health Committee, Alan Chambers, for bringing forward the Private Members Bill um, relating to the preservation of documents for historical institutions. We are working, as, as we all know, through this in the, in the Chamber, and it would have been great if we had been able to get through this Adoption Children's Bill, because as I, I, I told the, the um, members of the Birth Mothers and their Children for Justice in a meeting not that long ago, they themselves played a role in, in shaping what we have in front of us today, because none of us want to ever see um, anything even close to that repeated again, what they experienced through those children, uh, mother and children's homes. Um, so I warmly welcome this PMB. Um, I also uh, uh, was disappointed that the um, potential amendment right removing the defence of reasonable chastisement was ruled outside of scope and um, again I, I think that we will be able to make progress on that in this assembly. I know that my colleague um, Naomi Long in her capacity as Justice Minister is working with her officials on potentially including it in a miscellaneous um, provisions bill at the start of the next mandate. So that's something that I think that the children's sector in particular will, will warmly um, get behind and support. In closing, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is a very um, human penalty which is being paid for such outdated provisions relating to adoption and support for children still being um, in place. And I think we now have an improved bill and it is now time to get on with delivering it and making life better for countless children and their families across Northern Ireland. Thanks very much. And Jiglin, Nicola Brogan, Horcher, Niskalain, Lidahal. Can we bring Nicola Brogan on the screens, please? Nicola, um, are you with us? Yeah, um, can you see me there? Can you? Sure, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm, okay. um, I'm delighted to be speaking here at the final stage of the Adoption and Children's Bill. As you know, it's a long-awaited piece of legislation and it has secured well.
it spreads or to great that it has reached the final stage. The bill seeks to reform the legal framework governing the delivery of adoption, making it more child centred and more consistent with international human rights. It aims to improve outcomes for children, parents and carers, including the introduction of special guardianship. It enhances services available to children and parents and carers, as well as hoping to improve the outcomes for children in care. Um, it's a lengthy and complex piece of legislation, and I commend and thank all those who worked so hard to deliver it, including um, agencies such as NICI, BOYPIC, Human Rights Commission, Bernardo's, um, and the NSBCC, and many other agencies. Crucially, um, last concord of the development of the bill um, has also included input from children, young people, and their parents. And it's really important that the voices of children, and young people, not only heard but are heeded. So I'm really glad that they've been able to shape this legislation um, with their um, views and opinions. That's conclude by thanking um, the minister and his team um, of officials for the work they've done in bringing this legislation together, and the committee and the committee chair, Colin Bildenu, for all the work that they've done, and the committee clerk team as well. As I say, it's been, there's a lot of work that's been into this year, a long way piece of legislation, and uh, as it is very complex. So. We do appreciate all of the efforts put in place. Gormagat, Gormagat, Hain. I now call the Minister of Health, Robin Swan, to conclude the final stage. Um, and thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm very grateful to members not only for their contributions today, but for their unwavering support for the bill throughout its passage. I do believe that this legislation will be all the more effective in practice because of their contributions and those of the many children and young people, adoptive parents and foster carers who provided that valuable insight into their experiences and needs during the development of this bill. I must commend officials and social workers in the Health and Social Care Board, the five Health and Social Care Trusts and many other voluntary organisations which support children's social care and adoption in Northern Ireland, both for their input to this legislation over many years and for the superb work they do every day, often in challenging circumstances, to improve the lives of vulnerable children and young people. Mr Deputy Speaker, just uh, to comment briefly on some of the contribution from, from members. Uh, from the Chair, uh, in his role, can I thank him for his stewardship of the committee and support through what has been, I think, as Mr um, McGrath indicated, a bill with 160 clauses and five schedules. So, a significant piece of work and how it was managed and through, how it was delivered uh, through the bill, but also for his contribution and the acknowledgement of the role of the young people and their carers who the committee engaged with as well. Uh, in regards to engagements, as I said earlier on, Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill has been 16 years uh, in the development, and there's been many people who have been engaged with and I'm sure have felt let down after their engagement did not produce to where we are, but I am thankful that we are where we are today, that the final stage of this bill, but I think as Mr McGrath said as well, and the Vice Chair Pam Cameron indicated, that this bill produces uh, the best of this place and bringing forward this legislation in regards to the work that we, we have been able to do together, uh, not just from a department side of view in the Health Committee, but also from all parties uh, working around all issues. This bill, the organ and tissue uh, donation bill, health and social care bill, and Mr Deputy Speaker, all pieces of major legislation that have been brought through this House recently, um, and all pieces that have come through in a collaborative, supportive sense, because um, it's been a pleasure to work with the members of the Health Committee in regards to, to this and other pieces of legislation, because, Deputy Speaker, the members of the Health Committee have kept the party politics out of health, as we've promised and committed to coming into this mandate. And I think that's why we're able to achieve such significant pieces of legislation. And I only hope that continues over the next weeks and months, but also well into the next mandate as well. In regards to the issues raised by Mr McGrath in, in regards to uh, incoming uh, children uh, due to Ukraine, while not directly related to the crisis in Ukraine last week, my department launched an appeal for foster carers and supported lodging hosts to provide a safe home for refugee children who arrive in Northern Ireland without a parent or guardian. So that work has already been done, but it is expected that the majority of children displaced and seeking refuge from Ukraine will be with a parent or care 
and therefore will not be considered an unaccompanied minor in need of transfer into the care of health and social care trusts. But there are support mechanisms being put in place by the Home Office, supported by all departments uh, in the Northern Ireland Assembly. In regards to, to Mr Chambers' contribution, uh, acknowledging again that today is a good day, and again his thanks to the staff involved, but again, as I think as Ms Bradshaw indicated, also his contribution in bringing forward a, a subsequent piece of legislation that was outside the scope of this bill and the preservation of documents, which will be equally important. But I think, as Ms Bradshaw also indicated, was a piece that came out of the, the engagement process around this bill that was something that was indeed necessary. So I want to thank Mr Chambers for taking on, on that piece of work. M Mr Deputy Speaker, in Ms Bradshaw's co contribution, she said um, that having listened to Colm and myself uh, filled her heart with joy. I am not sure how often any politician in this place has been able to use that sentence. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I will, will say, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, I thank her for, her for for her comment because I think it actually sums up the relationship and the working relationship that has been between the Department and the Health Committee and the officials in getting this bill to the place it should be, and that is to support the children and young people across Northern Ireland and their carers and prospective adoptive parents who need the support that this piece of legislation will bring. As I mentioned earlier, Mr Deputy Speaker, in many ways the work to give effect to the bill has only just begun. It will now be for my department to set out in secondary legislation and guidance the operational detail of the changes that we are agreeing here today. There will be an extensive public consultation on that detail, and members and stakeholders, again including the children and young people, will continue to have a vital role to play by sharing their views, their experiences and expertise throughout the important next phase. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is 35 years since the last major reform of Northern Ireland adoption law took place. During that time, Northern Ireland society has thankfully changed, adapted, developed and evolved in many ways, but the fundamental needs of children and young people remain unchanged. Their need for care and protection remains, and I will conclude by reflecting on the well-known proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. It means that, in addition to a safe and loving home, a child needs support from and positive interaction with an entire community, an extended family, friends, carers, teachers and many others in order to thrive in life. The passage of this bill marks an important step towards ensuring that some of the most vulnerable children in Northern Ireland will receive that care and protection which they have a fundamental right to receive. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend this bill to the House. Thank you. Minister, the question is that the Adoption and Children Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. And the final stage of the Adoption and Children Bill has now passed. The bill has passed. Thank you. So, if members just take their ease while we move to the next item of business, please.
Uh, members, the next item of business is the final stage of the private tenancies bill. I guess now she is in a in a bubble. Let's in Kim Jan and Aka Khorhon Tosse. And I call the Minister for Communities to move the final stage. I beg to move. Uh, go to um, the final stage of the private tenancies bill has been moved. The business committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and therefore I call the minister to open the debate. Thank you. Uh, when I come in to post, I knew that reform was already urgently needed. The improved protections within the private I knew that reform was urgently needed to improve protections within the private rented sector. Regulation of the sector has barely changed, but more and more families live within it. More and more children and vulnerable people, and for many people and families, it is not a choice. They have no option. The improvements secured through this bill have been a long time coming and will enhance the conditions for tenants living in the sector. It seems incredible that some of them have only arrived in 2022. Electrical checks, carbon monoxide detectors, things which are years and decades overdue. I have been very clear that this bill is the first step. There is a lot more to be done in terms of reforming the private uh, rented sector and we have a lot to get on with. The changes set out within the bill will Im provide improvements to safety, security and standards within the private rented sector and will assist tenants who are struggling to afford the rent. Everyone um, should have a safe home. We will finally have electrical safety standards and fire and carbon monoxide detectors within private mm -hmm. rentals. I have laid the foundations for energy efficiency improvements which will reduce fuel poverty and assist us in meeting our climate change targets. I'd like to thank Kira Ferguson for working with my team within the department on her amendment on notices to quit. And I've always said that the current notice to quit periods are too short and that the bill will now increase the notice to quit periods in the longer term once regulations regarding exceptions have been made. I want to reiterate that the bill is just the beginning of private rented sector reform. The Department will now begin the next phase of work on the regulations. And I would like to acknowledge and thank the contribution of many stakeholders who have been involved with this bill, including those within the housing sector, uh, organisations such as Housing Rights, members of this Assembly who have engaged in the debates wholeheartedly over the past eight months. Again, I would also like to thank the Chair and the Vice Chair, and indeed all those members on the Communities Committee for their dedication and support in progressing the bill to this stage. I would like to thank uh, the team within my own department, the Assembly staff team, the Office of Legislative Council and the various legal teams who have all worked on the bill and enabled it to get it to this stage. I hope that all parties can give the bill their full support today and I commend the bill to the Assembly. I beg to move. I now call Paula Bradley, Chair of the Communities Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the committee has taken a keen interest in all housing matters since it was established in 2020, and on behalf of the Committee for Communities, I welcome the final stage of this bill. We have been debating this bill in the context of the private rented sector, now accounting for over 17 per cent of housing stock in Northern Ireland, and also being home to a consider considerable number of vulnerable households. I would like to again highlight that the committee remained focused throughout the bill in seeking to find a balance between protecting tenants and over-regulation, which could drive landlords from the sector, thus compounding housing problems further. This bill has had a somewhat rocky path over the past couple of weeks, but we have reached the last stage on that path. However, we know that it will not solve all housing problems. There are some issues, there are some issues need to be dealt with over a longer time scale, and the committee recognises that this is the first phase of reform with the second phase to follow in the new mandate. I welcome the fact that this bill will now offer tenants better protection and make the duties of both landlords and tenants clearer. This bill will bring welcome changes, a requirement for all private tenants to receive written notice of details of the tenancy, a receipt for all payments in cash made by the tenant in respect of the tenancy, an issue that the committee was pleased that the minister took forward at its request, improved notices to quit periods that landlords must give tenants and in a prescribed format, a, requ a requirement to consult on methods of rent payments 
other issues that was that other issue that was brought to the fore by the committee a restriction on rent increases a limit on deposits an obligation on private landlords for the first time to provide and keep in proper working order smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and also to carry out per periodical electrical safety checks and new powers for councils to introduce and enforce minimum energy efficiency standards in private rented homes. I would again like to thank the Minister for taking forward the amendments we request requested, as the Bill is stronger as a result. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the final stage of the Bill and would like to put on record the Committee's thanks to the officials and the Minister for their assistance in the scrutiny of it. Also, a final word of thanks again to the Bill Office, the Business Office and the Committee team who have all played a role in assisting the Committee through this Bill. Thank you. Next year, I'm Sir Kira Ferguson on Kanchai. Now call Kira Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I too is delighted in speaking to welcome the final stage of the private tenancy bill, which is a first phase as re reiterated by the Minister over the past two years. We all agree that this is a much needed piece of legislation to strengthen the rights and protections of those living in the private rented sector. That now accounts for over 17 per cent of the housing stock here in the North with a vast amount of people with a range of specific needs and requirements. This legislation is not only vital, but it provides crucial protections to our private renters. It will ensure that our homes um, where people are in the private rented sector are safe, are warmer and are more efficient. It will protect renters from being charged more than one month's rent for a deposit, which is currently creating an inequality of access into the private rented sector. And it will also prevent renters from facing multiple rent increases in any one year. And finally, it will prove essential in extending the notice um, to extending the notice period that renters are entitled to from landlords. And I'd like to thank also the work of the department officials in working with myself and also uh, members of the committee in being able to um, ensure that that these entitlements and notice to quit have been strengthened, have been improved, um, and will ultimately reinforce a safety net to protect people from eviction, which I think is critical. This bill does all of this and more, and it's incredibly uh, welcome for the reforms that it introduces, as it will enhance the security and sustainability of our renters here. I would like to thank the Minister for Communities and all the members who sit on the Committee for Communities for their continuous work that has went into strengthening and protecting this vital piece of legislation. I also want to thank Housing Rights, Renters Voice and other groups and housing professionals who informed the debate throughout the legislative process, who fed into the views and voices of those with lived experience and who emphasised throughout the imperative need for this housing sector to, to have provided long-awaited reforms that were required. We all have a collective duty to follow this legislation with the next phase of work to support people across society in being able to not only find but keep their homes. We must continue working collectively here to deliver more housing, tackle poor standards, prioritise homeless prevention and deliver housing as a standalone outcome in the programme for government. I just want to finish again by welcoming the significant progress that has been made here today to strengthen the protections and to safeguard our private renters. Thank you. Item, sir, Mark Durkin, Hun Kanchai. Call Mark Durkin. I welcome uh, us reaching today the final stage of the private tenancies bill after what has been a few arduous and uncertain weeks, uh, to say the least, politically. But that's nothing compared to the arduousness and uncertainty that so many people living in the private sector have experienced over the past few years. Protections within the private rented sector in Northern Ireland have been severely lacking to date. There has been no specific legislation in place to protect many private renters, many of whom, most of whom probably, have been pushed into the sector given a dearth of social housing stock. The bulk of these tenants consist of young families, many lone parent families who will have been most adversely impacted by the pandemic and whose financial outlook will undoubtedly be even more precarious given the cost of living crisis that is engulfing our communities. 
The provisions set out in this bill will prove crucial for them in the time ahead, from improved electrical safety to notice to quit enhancements. This much needed legislation marks the first step, as others have said, in a robust framework of measures to strengthen tenancies by improving safety, security and quality of the private rented sector. Essentially, it is the long overdue safety net that will improve the often precarious nature of private tenancies. The past couple of years have highlighted the importance of secure, stable housing and the central role that it plays in all of our lives. It is the foundation on which people and their families build their lives. Having somewhere safe and secure to call home is even keener felt in the current climate. This is a good, solid piece of work and one which will act as a springboard for further essential reforms, including strengthening policy around security of tenure and grounds for eviction. We do need, I mean, we really must ensure that we take those next steps to protect people swiftly. I welcome very much the inclusion of the clause at further consideration stage, compelling work to be done on the issue of rent control. And while Mr Carl will and is undoubtedly aggrieved at what happened with his well-intentioned, but perhaps a wee bit ill-informed um, amendment at the last stage, he does deserve credit for this being on the face of the bill. And I, I hope I'm back in the next mandate to work with him and others to ensure that this meaningful piece of work is done. Uh, I also hope that the Minister's efforts to lift the freeze on local housing allowance rates to provide an added layer of protections for low-income households who private rent as they navigate the cost of living crisis come to some fruition. Finally, I would like to thank departmental and committee officials and pay tribute to all the agencies within the housing sector, particularly housing rights, who have helped to push and progress this vital piece of legislation. It could not have been achieved without their contribution, assistance and continued patience. I look forward to those further legislative steps in the next mandate to make private rented reforms in the North as comprehensive and effective as they need to be. Can we bring Kelly Armstrong on the screens, please? Uh, invite Kelly Armstrong to make a contribution, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, on behalf of the Alliance Party, I confirm we will be supporting this final passage of the Private Tenancies Bill as it passes from this House to Royal Assent. The intentions of this bill is to assist as far as possible with making the private rented sector a safer and more secure option for those who require or wish to be housed within the sector. The private rented sector provides a flexible tenure choice for many tenants, particularly young professionals. However, as it considered the bill, sorry, however, as it considered the bill, it remained mindful that houses um, do um, provide housing for a significant number of vulnerable households, and that many third sector bodies and indeed constituency offices (MLAs) um, have been contacted by people concerned about private tenancies. But they have played a vital or pivotal role in providing support and advice to vulnerable tenants in the sector. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this bill, I believe, does find a balance between protecting tenants and the potential for overregulation, which could drive landlords from the sector, thus compounding housing problems. As we all know, there are not enough social homes to meet the demands of all renters. Therefore, as we know, many people either choose or have no option to rent than to rent from a private landlord. In protecting private renters, the balance has to be struck to ensure we do not drive private landlords away from this sector. During the progress of this bill, the amendments brought forward have managed to achieve this objective. The Minister has confirmed it is her intention, and I hope the next Minister for Community's intention to deal with the issue of rent caps. That piece of work will need consultation and careful consideration if it too is to achieve the balance between protecting renters and potential overregulation of the private rented sector. Today we have a piece of legislation that will limit the amount of deposit that can be charged, how often rents can be charged, that provides fair notice to quit periods for tenants and landlords, that confirms responsibility for electrics, fire, carbon monoxide monitors 
and Schedule 2, which provides the Department with the power to make regulations that will make it obligatory for domestic private rented properties in Northern Ireland to have a minimum energy performance certificate rating. Mr Speaker, this legislation has not passed without some difficulty. It was very difficult to work on this bill when the Minister and her department undertook consultation in the middle of committee stage. While I do not disagree with the outcome, I have to say that the approach taken to this bill was far from satisfactory. Committees are supposed to scrutinise and support a minister and their department. I feel that the Committee for Communities was not treated with respect during this process. By taking a bill to second stage before consultation was completed was a mistake. I expect if this had not been the end of the mandate with time running out, the minister would have completed all consultation before bringing such an important um, piece to the House. Mr Deputy Speaker, yesterday we considered the Committee for Procedures Review of Private Members' Bills. Perhaps it is time the House also considered how bills are brought through the House by ministers and departments. Perhaps it's time to ensure all bills have been through full consultation before they are introduced. I am sure the Minister would agree that while the outcome of this bill is progressive and will help private tenants, the process of this bill was made more difficult by the late consultation. To conclude, Mr Deputy Speaker, today we are passing the final stage of the Private Tenancies Bill. There are many who played their part in the process, including Renters Voice, Housing Rights, Chartered Institute of Housing, Property Pal, NUS, USI, the Landlords Association, Housing Executive, Fuel Poverty, Poverty Coalition, Electrical Safety First and the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service all provided valuable evidence to support this bill. I would like to thank the Minister and her officials, the committee clerks, Rays and all who have managed to get this bill to completion before the end of this mandate. Thank you. Thank you. I guess now hear him, Sir Jerry Carroll, on can I call Jerry Carroll? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. While treating the bill at this final stage, there isn't much in the bill uh, that I would be opposed to. Indeed, I think it was the second stage. I said there's stuff in the bill that uh, was generally uh, welcome and positive. However, I think on the whole, this bill is an absolutely missed opportunity, a missed opportunity for those in private rented accommodation. And the message sent to hundreds of thousands of private renters is don't look to the minister, don't look to the executive if you're looking to cut uh, and freeze rents. And my amendment wasn't just well intentioned, it was well supported by those who are private renting. Uh, many rules went out the window. <coughs> Excuse me, many rules went out the window during uh, COVID. But one thing remains uh, now and throughout is that landlords' ability to operate with impunity when it comes to uh, rent and setting the rate for private renters. When you think about it, Mr Speaker, during COVID, the last two years, we saw legislation in place that limited people's ability to leave their house, implementing effective curfews and restrictions on people's ability uh, to move. But when it comes to cutting and freezing rents in an unprecedented crisis, cost of living crisis, we heard cries of horror uh, from inside this house, um, loud, more loudly from some of the landlords who were represented on the opposite uh, benches, benches. I assure you. I, I, I thank uh, the member for, for giving way. And on the issue of rent control, it, it is one that was debated extensively at committee, and we were told again and again by officials that it could not be done in this piece of legislation and explained to why it could not be done, as well as the, the horror with which his amendment was received in this House. Would the member, the member acknowledge the opposition in the sector from both Housing Rights, who are an expert organisation in this field, and Renter's Voice to the unintended consequences that his amendment, if carried, would have brought? Um, I know Housing Rights raised some issues with it. I am not aware of Renters Voice did, if they did, probably to be uh, corrected. Um, but the point still stands. Uh, there was a, the parties in this House voted to uh, reduce rents and then did a U-turn. Uh, quite laughable uh, and embarrassing stuff. Uh, and the message sent out uh, is that there is no restrictions on landlords' ability uh, to continue to make uh, profit and to squeeze private renters at a time of unprecedented uh, crisis. So it's not good enough to say or to imply that this issue will be dealt with, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at some stage down the line, when we may not even have a communities minister, we may not have an executive or even an assembly uh, to speak of. People needed this help now. They needed this help many years ago when this bill has failed uh, to protect those people being hit by extortionate rents. And I don't use that word uh, lately. So, in conclusion, we needed to put um, housing. 
before private profit, but this bill, this bill has failed uh, to do that. So I think it's disappointing in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to hear him, sir. Out in the bubble, the Lishan Kirm Jeranach, a host, a hero, sir. Thanks very much, and thank you to everybody who has spoken, not just today, but throughout the lifetime um, from when this bill was first um, presented here to the Assembly last year. And I suppose just to pick up on the point in terms of the consultation, I mean, obviously we did have a, a completely shortened mandate. Um, there has been a lot of work that's been done between the department and the committee to get through a lot of legislation in that shortened mandate as well. And I think if I had left the consultation to be completed before bringing the bill to the House, then we wouldn't be starting here today with this piece of legislation, because clearly we wouldn't have had the time to do it. So I had to bring the piece of legislation when I did last year to ensure that we were getting it through before the end of this mandate. And thankfully, we are doing that. Um, and that was the work with officials within my department and also with the committee as well. I have consistently demonstrated my determination to ensure that all rents are fair um, and that tenants are protected within their homes. I have been a housing campaigner for most of my adult life. I work with those um, who are in private rented accommodation, those within social housing, those who are homeless as well. I do that not just as a minister or an MLA, I do that as a housing activist and campaigner, a community activist and campaigner. And that's something that I will continue to do because it's part of who I am as a person. I also clearly articulated the risks of an ill-conceived amendment, which would, in effect, have meant that the protections that are secured within this piece of legislation would have been lost. It's clear, I have the clear legal advice that the amendment would have killed the bill. And that was the concern that was rightly um, also demonstrated from those housing campaigners that have been fighting for these additional protections for years. And I am glad that I, as Minister, within a shortened mandate, have been able to bring these protections for those within the private rented sector forward. I have ensured that the concerns of the housing sector and, indeed, the legal advice was heard within the Chamber and ultimately ensured the protections for people and for families are being brought forward. So, in that effect, I commend this bill to the House. Thank you. The question is that the private tenancies bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. And the final stage of the private tenancies bill has now passed. The bill has passed. Thank you, members. Just take their ease while we move to the next item of business, please. Members, uh, the next item of business is the final stage of the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill. 
Uh, the Minister is unwell today and self-isolating, so has informed the Speaker's office and will participate remotely. So I now call the Minister of Justice. To, well, first of all, I invite her to come on screens. And I now call, good to see you, Minister, and wish you well. Um, you. I now call the Minister of Justice to move officially the final stage. Back to move. Thank you. Uh, the final stage of the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill has now been moved. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, and I call the Minister of Justice to open the debate, please. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am delighted to prevent, present the final stage of the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill to the Assembly today. I appreciate that my challenging legislative programme in this mandate with a record five substantive bills progressing over its final two years, has placed considerable demands on the Justice Committee and the Assembly. And I'm incredibly grateful for the cooperation of both in bringing this last of the five bills to conclusion today. Whilst it is the last, it is by no means the least in terms of its importance or its reach. The provisions of this bill, which members have debated extensively over recent months, are well known and I don't intend to rehearse them again today, as I realise that time is at a premium in the Chamber at this point in the mandate. However, collectively, they make an important contribution to tackling sexual and domestic violence and abuse. They also contribute positively to the Executive's wider agenda of creating safer communities and protecting women and girls, as unfortunately it remains the case that most victims of sexual offences tend to be female. I want to thank the committee in particular for its support and commitment in completing the scrutiny of the provisions in the bill. Committee members, both past and present, are to be commended for the commitment and diligence with which they brought to this task. The bill has benefited greatly from their input at consideration and further consideration stages, not least by the inclusion of a cyber flashing provision championed by the committee and which I would not have been able to bring forward as minister given the current lack of an executive. I want to place on record my gratitude to the current and previous chairs, deputy chairs, members and staff of the committee for the energy that they brought to their legislative scrutiny responsibilities throughout the mandate. I am very grateful to them for the careful and meticulous manner in which they discharged those heavy responsibilities in what was a very compressed time frame. Taken as a package, the five bills passed represent a step change in how we protect and support those subject to serious domestic and sexual abuse as they pass through the justice system. Recognising that pursuing justice in such cases can itself be traumatising. This was something which was identified by Sir John Gillan in his review of serious sexual offences and hopefully the measures introduced via this and other bills and via procedural changes will help to provide the reassurance needed for victims to have the confidence to come forward and report offences. I also want to give a special word of thanks to the expertise of the staff in the Office of Legislative Council and the Department Solicitor's Office, who have worked so closely with me and my officials on bringing the bill to this point. I want to pay tribute too to my own departmental officials for their dedication and commitment to delivering what has been a challenging legislative programme, including some fairly complex legislative fixes. They have not only progressed the legislation itself, but have also worked tirelessly with other justice sector partners, community and voluntary organisations, and with victims themselves, both to inform the legislation and to prepare for the introduction of these new laws so that they have the impact intended. As a minister, I am enormously indebted to my departmental officials. And if I may break with convention, I want to say a special word of thanks to Brian Grimmick for his role in delivering this bill. I hope that as he retires, it will be a fitting full stop to his DOJ legacy. Last, but by no means least, to those victims with whom I have met, who responded to consultations and engaged with the department and to the organisations who represent them so ably. I want to say thank you for having helped shape this legislation. You courageously shared with us the often harrowing and distressing experiences which you had endured as victims 
And in doing so, I hope that we have been able to shape these provisions in ways that will improve the experience of the justice system for future victims and offer them additional protection. My priority since I took up the role of Justice Minister have been twofold. To protect the most vulnerable people in our community and to demonstrate to an increasingly sceptical public the value of these institutions in delivering better outcomes for our community. I believe that the five substantive pieces of legislation, including this bill, which I have advanced with the assistance of the Executive and this House, are a demonstration that both of those are possible. Today is a good day for the Assembly, a day when we underline the true value of devolved government, a day when we demonstrably give priority to the safety and well-being of the weak and vulnerable in our community, a day when we unambiguously signal that we stand together to stop sexual offending and to protect traffic victims. On days like this, I am proud to be an MLA and the Minister of Justice. The challenge to us all is to build on such days to ensure the continuance of effective devolved government in Northern Ireland so that those whom we represent see and feel the benefit of the work that we do. I'm heartened on occasions such as this where we can set aside political differences and work for the greater good. It is my hope that we can move forward in this place committed to building on this collaborative approach, recognising that it is our duty to do so and our best means of protecting the most vulnerable people in our society. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. I now call Chair of the Justice Committee, Mr Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I also wish the Minister well and trust that she has a speedy recovery so that she'll be able to get on the doors, but maybe not that speedy, maybe just back in train in time for the elections. But in all good uh, humour, we do wish the Minister well. And we are disappointed that she's not able to be with us in person uh, in the Chamber today. On behalf of the Committee for Justice, I welcome the final stage of the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Bill. And I do think that this is a day that some of us thought we might not uh, actually have seen. I can remember when I took over from my colleague and friend, uh, Mr Paul Given, that uh, I had a meeting with the Minister to discuss what was a possible way forward. And I'm glad to say that uh, our both collective efforts have brought us uh, to this point today. And I do want to place on record, as I will do uh, through my comments, my appreciation uh, for what has been achieved to bring us to this point in time. This bill has undergone extensive and detailed scrutiny and debate, both during committee stage and during lengthy debates uh, at consideration stage, at further consideration stage, this has resulted in a large number of amendments being made and a range of new provisions added which have improved and strengthened this legislation, providing additional protections for some of the most vulnerable in our society, victims of sexual abuse and child exploitation, victims of human trafficking and modern slavery. And that is to be most welcome. As the Minister's outline, Part 1 of the Bill introduces the new offences of upskirting and downblousing. The Committee was concerned that the scope of the offences as originally drafted when the Bill was introduced was framed too narrowly, with the requirement to prove that the perpetrator acts uh, with the intention of either looking at the image for the purpose of sexual gratification or to humiliate, alarm or distress the victim. Members were also not convinced that the offences would satisfactorily address a scenario where they were committed or, it is claimed, were committed for the reasons of banter or group bonding. To address its concerns, the committee brought forward amendments to provide for a separate, standalone, reckless element to be included in the upskirting and downblousing offences to cover a situation where a person is reckless as to whether the victim is humiliated, alarmed or distressed. And we welcome the support of the Minister and the Assembly in this regard. This provides a more robust approach to these offences and should better protect victims from this unwanted behaviour that should not be tolerated in any shape or form. Part 1 also implements uh, a review of the law carried out by the Department of Justice on the child sexual exploitation 
on sexual offences against children. While well, welcoming the additions to the legislative framework, which will strengthen the uh, arrangements and go some way to improve the response to the unacceptable reality of child sexual exploitation in Northern Ireland, it is important to acknowledge that there is much more work to be done in this area, and it is something that I have no doubt that the next Justice Committee and Minister will return to. The protections provided in this bill for children have been enhanced by new provisions brought forward by the Minister to extend the abuse of trust to include uh, certain activities in sports or faith settings. I do not intend to rehearse all the background to the Committee's position in relation to this provision. Suffice to say that the Committee members shared the disappointment and concern of the Northern Ireland uh, Commissioner for Children and Young People, NSPCC, Bernardo's and other organisations that provided evidence on this issue that the provision does not provide more extensive protection and cover children in a wider range of settings. And members remained to be convinced that the abuse of trust provision is comprehensive and expansive enough to provide the protection that all children and young people are entitled to from adults in a position of trust. Given these genuine concerns, the need for a robust, regular and ongoing review mechanism to provide for review of the evidence of risk of harm was an even greater importance. And the Committee welcomed the support of the Assembly for its amendment to the legislation to provide for this. The Committee also welcomed the firm commitment given by the Minister during the further consideration stage debate that the Department will carry out an urgent review of the sectors involving tuition, uniformed and non-uniformed youth activities to determine whether there is evidence of a risk of harm that would warrant a legislative intervention, and this will start in this mandate and proceed as quickly as possible. This immediate review and the requirement for ongoing reviews will enable appropriate action to be taken quickly, if necessary, and now provides some reassurance. The Committee also appreciated the support for the inclusion in the Bill of its amendment, which places a duty on the Department to provide and review in due course guidance, training and data collection on Part 1 of the Bill. The Committee believes that these uh, key components uh, to the effective implementation of Part 1 of this legislation, and in particular the new offences being created, the need for a clear understanding and effective implementation of the new offences by the criminal justice agencies will assist in obtaining successful prosecution. <coughs> is vital otherwise, it will be impossible to build victims' confidence in the system and encourage them to come forward, report offences and engage and participate in the criminal justice process. Turning to Part 2 of the Bill, the Committee welcomes the process to implement the recommendations of the Sir John Gillan Review of the serious sexual offences cases which these provisions represent. Recognising that this is only a small part of the work required to implement the review findings in full, the committee will be recommending to the next Justice Committee that it should continue to monitor progress by the Department to take forward the plan to deliver all the recommendations and in particular the work on the issues of, con uh, of consent and the other issues that will require legislation. Deputy Speaker, I want now to turn to the Committee's amendments that considerably, I think, improve and enhance the support and the protection provided to the victims of trafficking exploitation, and which became part of the Bill following the support of this Assembly. The victims of such heinous crimes as trafficking and modern slavery deserve our full support and protection. And it certainly is an awful indictment in any society in the 21st century that we are still having to deal with this awful scourge. The need for additional statutory support for victims while in the national referral mechanism process and following receipt of a positive conclusive decision was raised with the committee in the evidence received in the bill and was the, and was the lack of progress in relation to the provision of the slavery and trafficking risk orders to assist in preventing modern slavery and trafficking related crime. These orders have been operational in England and Wales since 2015, and Scotland also has the equivalent orders in place. 
Given the widespread support for them and the examples of their, the beneficial use in England and Wales, the committee is of the view that they should be introduced to Northern Ireland without any further delay. And there is now a duty on the Department of Justice to bring forward protective measures for victims of slavery and trafficking, such as the STROs, by 2024. The committee was also pleased to say the Department has launched a consultation which will inform the development of STROs last week. The additional support that will now be provided to victims of trafficking and modern slavery following support for the committee's amendments and the amendment brought by the minister at further consideration stage is also a very positive outcome. The extension of the statutory defence for victims and survivors of human trafficking, which aims to ensure that a victim of trafficking is not punished for unlawful act committed as a consequence of trafficking to include Class A drugs, will update the, posi the position to reflect the more recent types of criminal exploitation of traffic victims that, will, that has emerged. Mr Deputy Speaker, the frustration with this part of the bill uh, by the key stakeholders and organisations that support victims of trafficking and modern slavery was the opportunity that had been taken by the Department to provide more meaningful support uh, and uh, protection. The committee has taken that opportunity and the provisions that have been added to build on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Criminal Justice and Support for Victims Act 2015, which my esteemed colleague and friend, Lord Morrow, had the foresight and the tenacity to bring through this Assembly to ensure that Northern Ireland had some of the most progressive legisl legislation to deal with human trafficking and exploitation and provide support to victims. I am very pleased that the committee has had the chance to build on that through this bill. The development of a longer term strategy for human trafficking and modern slavery by the Department will provide further opportunities to improve support to victims and tackle and prevent what is the most despicable of crimes. Turning to the other new provisions now included in the bill, the committee was particularly pleased to gain the support of the Assembly to include its amendment that creates a new offence of cyber flashing. Given the legislation already is in place for a number of years in Scotland and the UK Government's commitment to legislate for this in England and Wales in the near future, the committee considered it would be an opportune time to provide for a similar offence in Northern Ireland and ensure that this jurisdiction is not left behind and the support of the Minister in this regard uh, and the collaborative approach to reach an agreed framework for the offence was much appreciated. The new offence will send a clear message to the perpetrators that such behaviour is wrong and potentially harmful, will assist the police and the public prosecution in obtaining prosecutions, hopefully provide reassurance to victims that this type of crime is being taken seriously by legislators and, importantly, provide a positive foundation for education and prevention initiatives. This is an example of the Committee and the Assembly recognising emerging threats and unacceptable behaviours from changing technology and moving quickly to ensure that legislation is up to date to be able to meet such challenges. The Committee also welcomes the clarification and certainty on the common law position that has been provided by the new provision that sets out that a person cannot lawfully consent to their serious harm for the purposes of sexual gratification, where serious harm within the definition of the text of the provision occurs. The perpetrator will not be able to raise the claim that the victim consented to the harm being inflicted. The need to clarify and strengthen the legal framework with regards to this issue and the relation to the new offence of non-fatal strangulation or asphyxiation that the Minister brought forward and was included in the Bill at consideration stage was highlighted to the Committee during the Committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Bill. It was not possible to address either this issue at that time. However, the Minister initiated a review of the position which has resulted in the much-needed changes being made in this bill. And I congratulate the Minister on bringing forward uh, at this stage rather than waiting for the new mandate. The new provision to widen the scope of the offences of disclosure of private photographs or of films with intent to cause distress to include the threat to disclose is also very welcome. The threat to disclose is frequently made through online means 
and has led in some cases to tragic consequences for victims, particularly young people. Therefore, closing this loophole as soon as possible is a necessity. Mr Deputy Speaker, the aim of the Justice Committee throughout this process has been to ensure the best protection and support possible is provided through this legislation for children and young people, for victims of sexual offences and for victims of human trafficking and modern slavery. I am very proud of the work that the Committee has undertaken in relation to this Bill in what was a relatively short timescale due to the end of the mandate this month. The Committee did not just scrutinise the provisions in this Bill in a full and thorough uh, manner, but actively looked at the current legislative provision and identified opportunities to improve it and deal with emerging types of offending behaviour. This was not without its challenges, and I want again to thank the current and previous members of the committee for their commitment and diligence in carrying out the scrutiny of this legislation, and to both past and present members of the committee for their contributions to this work during the last two years. The committee has undertaken an impressive workload, particularly in relation to the bills, which in my view have contributed to the development of the improvement of the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also want to place on record again the appreciation of the committee to all the organisations, stakeholders, who contributed to our scrutiny process by taking the time to provide written and oral evidence during the committee stage of this bill, and particularly the victim of voyeurism offence, who shared their personal experience and whose contribution was invaluable in highlighting the need for the new voyeurism offences to be comprehensive and operational. I also want to thank the organisations who work tirelessly to support and protect children and young people and victims of human trafficking and modern slavery. Without those organisations, the lives of victims would be much bleaker. I want to welcome to this House in the public gallery today uh, two members of staff of CARE NI. I want to welcome uh, Lauren and Rebecca, and I want to thank them for all the work that they have uh, given in regards to this, not only in the Northern Ireland legislation process, but also in the legislation process in the House of Commons. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Minister and her officials, and I concur with her comments in relation to uh, the officials who have come to the Department uh, to brief the Committee on a number of occasions. And I want to add uh, my best wishes to Brian Gimmick, who will retire, and thank him for his patience, uh, for his endurance uh, when he came repeatedly to the committee over a, a period of time. <coughs> I also want to thank our assembly staff, and in particular, if not with convention, uh, not being given to one who is always known for applying to convention, I want to thank the bill clerk, Stephanie Mallon, who is also uh, in the chamber today, uh, who has worked tirelessly to advise and assist the committee in bringing forwards and amendments. And I know that I speak on behalf of the committee, that without her work and the work of officials in this building, we would not have the bill before us today that we have. And so, to them all, thank you very much. And I just want to conclude a few comments, Mr Deputy Speaker, as a member of this House, as a member of the Democratic Unionist Party, to say that while there are many things about this uh, process, uh, about a five-party mandatory coalition, about the challenges uh, in working uh, with uh, the structures that we unfortunately have to work with not being a normal democracy like many other jurisdictions in the world. However, I think that this bill is an example of what can be done when we keep our focus on the reason as to why we are here. It is to surely improve the lives of some, and we, we use this phrase and I have to say sometimes, I trust it never becomes just a trait phrase. Those who are the most vulnerable in our society. I think we have seen in the last number of days what can happen when someone acts with vileness and with evil intent. And we have seen all too well the horror of what is going on in the land of Ukraine. However, 
we need not close our eyes to what is happening in our streets in Northern Ireland, to the vile and hideous crime of human trafficking. And I trust that as a result of this collective effort of this House, that there will now be in the criminal justice uh, toolbox the proper and appropriate means whereby those who are engaged in this most vile of crimes will be brought to book and will be made answerable to the courts for what they have done. And that this bill will bring some support, additional support, help and assistance to those who are the victims of such crimes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Sinead Ennis. Mr Deputy Speaker, this Assembly has passed many key pieces of legislation during this term and will continue to do so right until uh, the moment it is dissolved in a few days' time. I am proud to be associated with the positive and progressive work of the Assembly um, in recent times, but prouder still of the legislation we have passed that is designed to protect women and girls and minority groups from sexual violence and exploitation. As I said during the consideration stage of this uh, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill, the criminal justice system does often represent failure. A failure to tackle crimes, a failure to tackle perpetrators, a failure to protect the best interests of uh, the victims at court, a failure which is all too often favoured an abuser over a victim, and a failure which often represents trauma and humiliation for a victim. But I am proud that over the last 24 months, this Assembly has taken a stand to reverse this trend and to build a criminal justice system that protects women and girls and one that aims to find and punish perpetrators. The Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, the Protection from Stalking Bill, the Committal Reform Bill and now this Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victim Victims Bill are all major pieces of legislation which so show our commitment to tackling gender-based violence as well as trafficking and exploitation. This bill will implement key Gillen Review recommendations, such as the exclusion of the public from all serious sexual offences uh, hearings. And why is that important? Well, I believe that this measure will increase the confidence of victims to report their experiences to the police and know that not only will their case be taken seriously, but that they will be protected against indignity, humiliation and additional distress throughout their journey through the justice system. Through this bill, we have also created new offences of upskirting and downblousing and have also made cyber flashing a criminal offence. This bill includes amendments to modern slavery provisions in the NI Human Trafficking Act to extend support to victims of slavery, servitude and forced compulsory labour. And uh, it includes an increase to the scope of the existing offences relating to the abuse of positions of trust of a child to include faith and sport settings. It includes an abolition of the so-called rough sex defence and the creation of a new offence of non-fatal strangulation. And sadly, at least three women have been killed in the North by men who claim that the woman had consented to the violence. And let me make it clear, there is absolutely no excuse or justification for strangling or beating a woman to death during sex. And despite the fact that legal precedent has been set that victims' consent to sexual gratification is not a defence, this defence continues to be raised. Victims are not to blame. Their abusers are to blame. Victim blaming and victim shaming is unacceptable, and I am very pleased that this bill includes a provision which will explicitly prohibit this defence being used. In bringing my remarks to a close, Mr Deputy Speaker, like the Chair, I want to take this opportunity to thank my fellow committee members, past and present, for all their hard work on this bill. I want to thank the NGOs, the departmental staff, committee clerks and staff from the Bill's office, particularly Stephanie Mallon, for your invaluable assistance in helping us shape and scrutinise this Bill. I want to thank the Minister for her dogged determination to get this important piece of legislation through in this mandate. But crucially, I want to thank those people, those victims and survivors who bravely shared their sometimes harrowing lived experience with the Justice Committee in the hope that we would produce good legislation that will protect others from sexual violence and exploitation in the future. Today marks an important milestone in the battle against sexual offending and human trafficking. This bill puts the interests and welfare of victims front and centre, and I now look forward to seeing the provisions of this bill fully enacted in the future. Gurr I call Sinead Bradley. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And before I begin, I too would like to go on record to wish the Minister well and our committee um, representative, uh, Doug Beatty from the UUP, who I believe is also unwell, so I, I wish him well too. Um, and I would like to take the opportunity to rep uh, welcome those representatives from Kerr and I to the Public Gallery. I stand today on behalf of the SDLP to welcome this final stage of the Justice and Sexual Offences and Trafficking Bill. And I'd like to commend the work of the Assembly Clerks, all the departmental officials, those we meet and the many who we don't meet who are working behind the scenes, the Bill's office, fellow committee members, the Minister herself, and also uh, the Chair quite rightly put on record to wish Brian well in his retirement. And I, I count myself amongst those who, who leaned on Brian quite heavily and tested his patience perhaps at times, but it was always um, in, in very good nature and, and a very important uh, person to relay thoughts to. So we genuinely appreciate that. And quite rightly, people have singled out Stephanie Mallon, who I repeatedly thank in this house, because Stephanie is, you know, we're, we're not far past International Women's Day. And if ever there was an empowering woman in this house, I have to say it's Stephanie, who gives validity to people erring ideas in a safe space and, and being able to tease out. So I commend Stephanie and her style of work. Thank you. Um, in introducing the, in this final stage of the bill, I have to say that I particularly have to welcome the upskirting and downblousing and sending of unwanted sexual images. We've heard from stakeholders how these initiatives, uh, these really quite invasive crimes, have caused significant psychological and emotional harm to victims. It's therefore welcome that these offences are treated in a way that clearly underlines the severity of these crimes, which cause fundamental harm to the victim's sense of personal autonomy and safety. And I want to place on record my sincere thanks to those stakeholders who advocated so passionately, I have to say, on behalf of victims whose needs are at the heart of this bill. And I trust that those people who bared their soul to us and told us of their experience will see how, in doing so, their story has been heard and they have affected the shape of this bill. And it is hoped, and I think it is worth stressing, that these measures to serve really serve to deter this behaviour happening in the first place. We hope that these offences are never committed. But just by having this bill in place, we really are looking at deterring people in the engagement of such offences. The new legislation undoubtedly sends a message that such behaviour is criminal and cannot be dismissed as banter or a joke, and that this behaviour simply will not be tolerated. On the issue of sexual images, let's be absolutely clear. Obtaining images of another person's private parts without consent is never okay. When this bill comes into effect, it could be considered criminal. And I want that message to clearly leave this House today. That is what we are achieving in adding those conditions to this bill. I hope sincerely, and I genuinely mean this, that the existence of this bill in of its very self will serve as a powerful catalyst for behavioural correction within society. Society at large needs to know, as a matter of urgency, that these behaviours now have no place to hide. The I was only joking defence is no longer there. The banter defence has gone. Everyone will agree, no doubt, that has worked on this bill, that there is an important piece of child legislation protection built in, and it seeks to add a further layer of protection to children who may be targeted by adults who, for example, may be attempting to groom a child by be pretending to be a child themselves online. The provision is essential in the context of soaring online child sexual abuses cases recorded by the police in Northern Ireland. In fact, figures obtained by the NSPCC show that there is an 80% increase over the past three years. 80% increase over the past three years. And that's the reported cases. The police have indicated to us 
that they really do not know the size or scale of this problem. And I believe that it has been reported that during the pandemic, this online activity has become one of the largest problems in our society. And this bill goes some way to speak into that. I will indeed. Well, thank the member for giving way. Will the member join with me in thanking those officers who have to sit through these pictures and some very harrowing scenes and, and, and actually trying to protect some of the most vulnerable in society and that we owe them a debt of gratitude? I do indeed. I thank the member for the intervention. and I know members of the committee, including the chair, did meet with the cyber crime unit and, and I think, believe it's quite a harrowing job at times to be done, but it is critical. And the value of this bill will depend heavily on how well resourced those officers are. But it's absolutely correct to put on record our thanks to them and I thank the member for doing that. The bill also makes it a legislative requirement that victims of human trafficking are guaranteed up to 12 months support and more if they should need it. This support can be include, include things such as access to health care, housing, legal and financial assistance. And I welcome in particular the provision that this level of support can exceed the 12 months as this vulnerable group will often have complex needs to which there can be no quick fix. The provisions are particularly timely in the context of the Ukrainian crisis, as the Chair correctly pointed out. And I believe while we all watch the harrowing, harrowing images coming from Ukraine, we can see just how vulnerable those people have become so quickly. It, it's almost overnight from living what appears to be a normal day-to-day -day lifestyle and they're thrown into the depths of the most vulnerable position a person can be in. And no, I will indeed. Member, for, for giving way. Uh, the member is absolutely right in terms of human trafficking and what a despicable uh, crime it is and the attempt by the bill to address it. We were faced last night by equally harrowing reports on the media uh, where the police are investigating what is essentially trafficking, but local trafficking of children, taking the children to local hotels and other spots uh, for sexual gratification and using and abusing the children uh, by feeding them drugs and alcohol. Would the member agree with me that indeed human trafficking isn't just something that happens of taking, bringing victims to Northern Ireland, but indeed we need to be aware that human trafficking is existing within our own society. I thank the member for intervening because it was a very worthy intervention, and it is absolutely true. I think the, the notion that trafficking is about people coming to us has to be a myth that's completely busted. And you're right, you know, the thoughts of those young people and there will be people in society who are exploitative and they know that those young people perhaps come from vulnerable backgrounds and they target them and it is happening on our very doorsteps so we all need to be alert to it and we need to put in place legislation that speaks directly to it and I believe we have gone significant ways in doing that but every person has a part to play in that. It is not just the legislators or it is not just the police. Any person who suspects anything of that nature has a duty, a moral duty, to step forward and make it known. So I genuinely thank the member for that intervention. But I do recognise, and, and I, I appreciate the context it was in, but as we talk of those people who are there, constantly measuring societies and the weaknesses within it, they're there to exploit people when they hit a vulnerable point. And that's exactly, I have no doubt, what they will do to the Ukrainian families as they see them move, desperately move, trying to find some type of home or some type of stability for themselves and their children. And those people are there, I have no doubt, waiting to find what they can make out of it. And we all have a duty, whether it's in this place or outside of it, to play our part. 
the provisions are particularly timely, as I said, in, in relation to that Ukrainian con uh, crisis. And traffickers offer these false promises to people, such as employment, security, and help, and even help of reuniting victims, which could become a problem we all need to, to try and get ahead of to keep the communication channels open. And they try to exploit them because they know they are vulnerable. And that is the key point. This bill, throughout, from the, from the front page to the very back, has within it efforts to reach vulnerable people of many ages and of different uh, situations. So we really need to keep mindful of all those vulnerable people in our society who will sadly try and have to seek shelter through this bill and the others connected to it. The bill is an important piece of legislation, and I know that's a, a common phrase that's used in this House very often, and, and most bills do tend to, to have a very important objective behind them. But I truly believe the weight of this bill in changing the outcome and lives for many people could never, never be, and should never be, undervalued. And it's, it is designed to safeguard some of the very most vulnerable people in our society. And that is why we are particularly welcoming it to its final stage here today, because people have and are due a right to safety and a protection from abuse. The SDLP have a long list of items that we would love to see in this bill that sadly didn't make it here, but that's, today is not the day for that discussion. Today is the day for sending out the messaging that comes from this bill. It starts here and it starts now. Those people who are out to exploit society, this bill is moving closer to you. And I think we all have a part to play in sending out that messaging. Finally, I, I want to close by one last um, moment, Chair, if I might, to, to really thank all those victims who came on board and spoke not just to committee, but have spoken to the other organisations who helped shape this bill. It is their experience, sadly, that have brought us here. It is their lived experiences that have made us realise there was a need to take action in the first place. And I hope they feel empowered by saying the decision that they took to engage has led to something worthwhile. And I also hope that they take real comfort in knowing that they have done something to lay a path to safeguard potential victims coming behind them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am pleased today to be able to speak on behalf of Alliance at the final stage of the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill and to speak in support of the bill, but also to concur with the uh, many comments made by previous speakers in relation to victims and the work that has to be done across the Justice family and beyond on behalf of those victims. Deputy Speaker, the Bill represents the last of five substantive pieces of legislation that the Minister wished to see passed through the House over the past two years. And I commend the Minister of Justice for already delivering an ambitious legislative programme to reform our justice system and introduce greater protections to vulnerable people in our communities. This Bill, along with the others, will make a significant difference to those who suffer abuse and exploitation. The provisions of this bill have been debated, debated extensively at consideration and further consideration stages, and I do not intend to repeat any of the points made there today. But what I will say, Deputy Speaker, is that this bill addresses a number of issues relating to the experiences of victims in the justice system, including the exclusion of the public at all serious sexual offence court hearings. As a member of the Policing Board, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am all too familiar with the devastating scale of sexual violence against women in Northern Ireland and of the research which indicates that the vast majority of victims do not report perpetrators to the police. By prioritising the safety and well-being of victims entering the justice system and abolishing shame or fear of blame and closing gaps in the law that offenders try to exploit, I hope we can today mark the beginning of the end of unreported sexual offending and send a strong signal that we stand to protect victims and the vulnerable in our community. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call Peter Weir. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, can I join with others, I think, in welcoming this legislation 
I would also, I think, wish the uh, Minister a swift and full recovery, ahead of, particularly ahead of the elections. Um, I suspect today we've got a little bit of a flavour of the canvas material that she'll be uh, using. We've got a few lines without having to, to move to East Belfast to, to get that. But uh, I sincerely wish her a, a full uh, recovery. Can I also join with others, I think, in thanking all those who have contributed uh, to this bill and the point that we have reached today? Um, particularly, I suppose, as a member of the committee since June of last year, uh, I also particularly want to thank the committee staff who have been so diligent in helping us to bring this to this point, and also, I think, those who have contributed in terms of making submissions um, to the committee. Uh, and uh, I would join with others in welcoming the representative of Kerry and I who have been vigilant, particularly around the issues of human trafficking. This is a good day, but it is also a critical day for all those who have been victims, whether they are victims of um, sexual violence, whether they are victims of exploitation, of abuse of trust, of trafficking, or indeed a combination of, of all those things. I think this is their day and something which I think is a vital level of, of progress. Uh, I don't want to reiterate a lot of what has been said already, but I just want to perhaps touch on two points. First of all, I suppose that it, on the issue of trafficking, and I think that the idea and indeed what has been uppermost in our minds probably in recent weeks um, has been the, um, the vulnerability of innocent people uh, suffering at the hands of evil often having to cross, cross jurisdictions and seek sanctuary, and we've seen that particularly with, with Ukraine. And I think that should focus our minds on the issue of human trafficking. Uh, but it is also, I think, as uh, Sinead Bradley indicated, not something which is a, and Robin Newton as well, is not a faraway problem in a distant land which has nothing to do with us. Very sadly, human trafficking is at the heart of our community. And whether that is the exploitation of children, whether that is migrant workers, uh, sex trafficking. Uh, it exists behind the closed doors of, uh, of houses in our streets, in our cities, in our towns, uh, and in our villages. And vigilance and action against it must be critical. That is why I think today's uh, the progress of the bill uh, has been very important. Mention, I think, has already been made. I think it has been very important that from a legislative point of view, we have given that guaranteed support of up to 12 months uh, level of, of support. I think that that will help both empower and equip the victims of human trafficking and help them to rebuild their lives. But it is also the case that uh, the position that has been agreed by this Assembly is not to cap that. And where there is the need for the Department to give support beyond that 12-month period, that is also something that is um, able. I think one of the proudest moments in this House a number of years ago was when my friend and colleague Lord Morrow's bill on human trafficking uh, was passed. I think that was critical in the approach that we take to human beings. Uh, and it was also, I think, for once, no and quite often we, we are seen to be in catch-up mode. But we led the way uh, through that bill. And today I think we lead the way again on the issue of human trafficking. And that is important as well. But the second point, I think, this relates to human trafficking, but also relates to other aspects as well, is not to see this as simply a final position. There is always a danger, I, I think, that all of us as legislators can fall into, of seeing a problem, seeing legislation as the solution, and once we've delivered the legislation, well, that's it out of the way. We can put that up on the shelf and forget about it. Legislation should not be the end of a process. It is part of a process. It is, if you like, a comma rather than a full stop. And I think nowhere is more of this more true than the legislation that is in front of us today on a number of reasons. Mention has been made of some of the amendments that were made and indeed provisions put in in terms of the implementation of this, because it's not simply a document which sits on the shelf. It is how this is delivered on the ground in practice. And so, for example, in terms of issues around sexual exploitation, the level of guidance that is given out there, the level of training that is provided, and indeed the level of review that is provided will be critical as we move forward in relation to this. Uh, secondly, it is also the case 
uh, that this legislation, particularly around some of the new offences that are contained within it, has been driven by a changing society in which those in engaged in, this, in these evils within this bill find new ways to exploit others and abuse others. I I'll give way, yes. I, think that, uh, I thank the member for giving way. And just, I'm, I'm not man, man, minded to speak on this at any length, but just want to thank the minister and all those that have gone before. But the, the, the member raises a really, really interesting point with regard to what's going on in the world at the moment. And we know that there are tens of thousands, if not more, of Ukrainian um, refugees that are going to need to find refuge. And we have all, all, already seen that, that offer of homes and many people from Northern Ireland have, have taken uh, the, the, that, that mantle up and are offering safe space. But we also know that there are predators out there who have in the past, and we've went through the pain recently of the, the, uh, the apologies, which in some ways didn't go far enough from some of the institutions. And we know that there are predators out there who perhaps would use these opportunities for malevolent purposes. Uh, would the member be interested maybe to get the minister's position on the use of this uh, legislation and the application of it to protect those people who may be travelling from war-torn Ukraine and may be availing of safe spaces that, that should be safe. To, so that I mean, I'll be keen to hear what the, the Minister has to say. I think this, is, this bill is multifaceted and it, it touches on a range of victims. And there is the vulnerability, for example, of those particularly who will be seeking to be exploited coming from the Ukraine who are seeking sanctuary. There are others who will be visitors to this, this country who also need protected, but also many also of our own um, indigenous um, population whether that's children, whether that, I think, is, as I think a very good point was made by Mrs. Bradley, uh, whether it is uh, those, for instance, who are being abused because of imagery that we have, for instance, in terms of issues around cyber flashing, around upskirting or down blousing. Um, it is the case has been indicated this is something which is now going to be a criminal offence and cannot be simply be laughed off as, as something. Uh, a group of lads are doing or whatever. This is something which is, is criminally wrong and I think a clear message needs to go out. But the point I was making in, in relation to that is that some of the offences, be it the upskirting, the downblousing, the cyber flashing and use of technology in that basis would have been something that 20, 30 years ago would simply, uh, whether conceived or not, would actually have been not something that was technologically possible or at least within the reach uh, of many people. And the point I'm making in relation to this legislation, we have made, I think, what are very important steps in trying to cover that situation by this bill. But we must not assume that, particularly in the world of technology, particularly in the world of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse, that the world stands still. And consequently, while we've taken these actions today, we need to be vigilant as we move ahead in the months and years to come that where we need to update, where we need to cover new avenues of crime that we do so. And the final point, I suppose, in terms of um, seeing this as, as simply part of a process, mentions me very specifically of the issue of potential abuse of trust situations. Uh, and I know it's, it's something, I know particularly the, the member for North Down, uh, Ms Woods, raised on a number of occasions as well. Uh, I think it is critical that it, at least while I suspect the committee purely on its own merits would probably have gone further. We have reached a situation where at least the, this is something which is under a level of robust reviews. We have the coverage, particularly of those of um, religious organisations and sporting organisations uh, within the legislation. But it is critical that the scope of this is something which is done in a very proactive manner to be kept um, under review. Uh, mention, I think, the example was given uh, that, and I think there is to some extent a lack of logic to say, for example, if there is uh, a youth organisation and if that youth organisation is meeting in the church hall, potentially it is covered by that as part of the, the church, but if the same youth organisation was not linked in with the church, but for example using a local community centre, there is no reason why abuse in both those situations should not be directly covered. And it is critical, I think, that as we move ahead in terms of abuse of trust, clearly it's got to be evidence-based, it's got to be grounded. But we need to be very proactive in trying to cover those situations. And that is why I think it is critical that we have this level of um, review. So I think this is a very welcome day, but it also remains a certain element of work in progress. We are 
uh, in the process of making improvements. Let us bank the improvements we have made, but let us keep that vigilance to ensure that, that bearing down on those involved in this range of criminal activities is done to the maximum extent, because critically it is about the protection of those victims and potential victims that we must always remain focused. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on the final stage of this bill. I recall elements of this bill uh, being discussed back in 2015, so it, is, it has been a long time coming and could have been on the statute books much earlier in this mandate had we not had a suspension for three years. Nonetheless, I welcome the addition of additional offences as outlined by other members, including upskirting uh, following a campaign by teachers who were the victims of it early in 2020. And Mr Weir is right about having to be fleet of foot, in a sense, in terms of the change in dynamics and the threats faced by our children and young people and women in particular. Um, the, as a member of the policing board, we receive updates on a regular basis from the National Crime Agency, for example, which is determining that there's up to 16,000 to 23,000 children and young people at risk uh, from uh, sexual offences and, and grooming online. Uh, those are horrendous figures and must be a nightmare scenario for any family. And the legislation is welcome, but we need resources uh, behind the legislation, Minister, and I'm sure you'll agree there are concerns about the current backlog in terms of PPS progress in the cases and also uh, in, in terms of how um, uh, alleged offenders seek to manipulate the justice system in creating many delays and uh, I will hope that uh, uh, that will uh, be rectified. I, I, I want to also say today, if I, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, t tonight the BBC uh, Northern Ireland Crime Programme is going to outline and put out a fresh appeal by the police for witnesses in relation to the murder of a young woman in my constituency, Laura Marshall. She was a 31-year-old dental nurse who was uh, seriously assaulted and murdered in her own apartment in Lurgan in April 2016. And I would hope that anyone watching today who might have that vital piece of information might step forward. But in terms of this legislation, Minister, the legislation is only as good in terms of how it's enforced and how it actually enables by the sentencing that the, the judges and others may hand down of cultural shifts and, and changes in behaviour because of the penalties uh, that might well be handed out uh, as a consequence of the legislation uh, being made available to them. But th there, are, there is much more uh, that we need to do in terms of cyber crime units. We, we need proper resources. And you know, we always know that criminals and perpetrators are often a step ahead of the law. And I would hope, Minister, that in any forthcoming mandate and when we do get an executive up and running again, that, uh, that those uh, parties who actually have praised this bill actually put the resources behind the implementation, both in deterrence and in prevention, whether that is preventing the crime by some of the uh, charges uh, that are brought and people brought before the courts, but also in terms of our education programme and building uh, positive relationships and changing that cultural shift uh, of what, uh, because I'm sure many of us look back at some of the TV programmes we used to watch would be far from acceptable and quite rightly so today. So I think there's a huge cultural shift needed. I think this legislation goes a long way in recognising the challenges that are there in, in modern day society. But uh, as others have said, we can't be complacent and must be prepared uh, at very short notice, not only to resource, but also to bring forward legislation to deal with whatever other uh, offences and, and measures that perpetrators uh, would seek to use to bring harm, particularly to women and children. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to wish the Minister well, and I hope she makes a quick recovery. And I am glad, uh, like others have said, that we're here today to pass the final stage of the Justice, Sexual Offences and Human Trafficking Bill, and this bill is a long time coming, and the provisions within it, and now with the amendment standing part, will help to protect people in Northern Ireland. 
I don't seek to take long at this stage. Much of what needs to be said has already been said today, but also at previous stages and throughout committee. And thanks must go to the Minister, her departmental officials who have worked tirelessly on this, to our committee staff and also to Stephanie, um, who must rightly be mentioned as an absolute legend, really. Um, thank you very much uh, for all of your work throughout committee on this bill, but also for the last two years. I also want to thank Amy and my team too, and all the sector organisations, stakeholders and individuals who engaged with us over the last year. It cannot and will not have been easy to do so, especially bearing one's experiences of some of the most traumatic things that they've been through. And I welcome that the bill now has clauses on cyber flashing, abolishing the so-called rough sex defence and introducing a provision on threats to disclose private sexual images. The bill will improve the operation and effectiveness of the justice system as well by enhancing public safety and improving services for victims of sexual offences and victims of trafficking and exploitation only if it is well resourced, if people are aware of it and if people are trained in it and know how to use it. With the changes that have been made, it will go some way to close gaps, resolving inconsistencies and modernising our law, but it does need funding. It needs to be understood and it needs to be implemented. And as a member of the unofficial opposition in this place, it is only right that I highlight what the bill could have been. In my view, it has been a missed opportunity and it is my understanding that in many ways this is entirely down to the DUP. So I would cast our minds back to last summer when the content of this bill was being chopped and changed. And from my perspective, it is absolutely shameful that important legislation, including requirements to comply with a Supreme Court ruling on non-court disposals for under 18s, technical changes to civil legal aid and statutory charges, changes to court security powers and procedural adjustments regarding video links and appeal arrangements are not here. For some unbeknownst reason to the committee, powers to transfer the functions contained with the Section 43 of the Justice and Security Act from 2007, from the Secretary of State to the Department of Justice to restart the accreditation process for organisations delivering community-based restorative justice were deemed too controversial for this bill. The most shameful of all was the removal of legislation that governs bail and remand for children. To strengthen the automatic presumption of bail for children and to introduce specific conditions to meet before a child can be remanded in custody and for how long. These changes were desperately needed not even, not least to in, in order to comply with the UNCRC. Suppose it concerns that the bill could become a vehicle for legislative contact that some ministers did not agree with should not halt the democratic process in this House. It is for the Assembly to decide, not ministers directing what we can and can't talk about. The fact that this bill was deliberately trimmed down to narrow its scope and limit the opportunity to have a proper debate on issues like the minimum age of criminal responsibility and removing the defence of reasonable chastisement is disgraceful. And despite my attempts, there is nothing in this bill on equal protection or indeed fundamental to addressing youth justice recommendations we have known about for decades, raising the age of criminal responsibilities. And these matters will have to be addressed in the future. And with regard to sexual offences, fundamentally, the work as recommended by Sir John Gillan on consent must be expedited. We need to focus on consent and radically reform how it's understood in our criminal justice system. A failure to protest or resist when subject to sexual abuse is never a form of consent. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, we need to have mandatory, comprehensive, age-appropriate relationship and sexuality education for everyone in Northern Ireland. This bill covers matters, as we know, related to child sexual exploitation, abuse of trust in relationships and sexual offences, including the new crimes as, such as upskirting, downblousing and cyber flashing. The bill requires guidance to be produced, but there is no statutory requirement for our children and young people to have any knowledge or awareness of these specific issues about why it's illegal and wrong to do these things. Consent matters, and it is so important when it comes to these issues that we're legislating for through this bill. Our conviction rates for sexual offences remain shockingly low and that must be addressed urgently too. It is not enough for executive parties to pay lip service to a strategy to tackle violence against women and girls on one hand and then fail to prioritise the legislative reform 
that we need to address these shockingly poor outcomes for women and girls that are sexually assaulted and abused. This bill will go some way, Mr Deputy Speaker, but we have so much more to do. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Deputy Speaker, there's much that's valuable and worthwhile in this bill. My concern remains that by the inclusion of the very dubious Clause 19, that it, the bill might in fact be jeopardised as to its viability within the competence of this House by reason of its flagrant breach of Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. I've addressed the House at some length in the past and to no avail on this issue, but Article 19, uh, Clause 19 introduces a blanket and mandatory ban on public hearings, uh, which is wholly incompatible, I submit, to the expectations of Article 6 and in conflict with the very clear jurisprudence uh, under Article 6, whereby there are multiple cases which make it plain that you can only have a ban on a case-by-case -case basis, not on a blanket basis. But this House knows better, and this House decided that Article 19 uh, is something that it would support and repudiate it, any suggestion of tempering it to make it uh, beyond doubt that it would be human rights compliant. No doubt the Attorney General will have to take a view as, the compli as to its compli uh, compliance with human rights, but certainly for my mind, Article uh, Clause 19 is one which needlessly raises a question over that. I now call on the Minister of Justice, Naomi Long, to conclude the final stage. Can we have the Minister under our screens, please? I would ask members to take their ease just a few moments. There seems to be a technical difficulty here, and we hope to bring the Minister back. Could we have the Minister of Justice onto our screens? Thank you, and Mr. I call Deputy the Minister of Justice to conclude the final stage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, for the opportunity to close this final stage of the Justice Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill. I am extremely grateful to all of those who have spoken in support um, of the legislation today. Sexual offences cause very serious physical, psychological and emotional trauma to victims, violating them in the most personal and intimate of ways. It is often accompanied by a sense of humiliation um, and shame on the part of the victim and is too often a taboo subject in wider society. There is no shame in being a victim of sexual abuse, none whatsoever. The only shame lies with the perpetrator. The intrusive nature, however, of investigation and trial itself can be traumatic. And this bill, alongside other provisions which have progressed during this mandate, will assist in addressing many of those concerns as identified by Sir John Gillan. I hope that this important bill will play a crucial part in tackling those taboos and help to generate the confidence in victims to come forward and report their experiences to the police, knowing that they will be believed and will receive the support and protection that they need and deserve. Human trafficking, whether from, to, through or within Northern Ireland, is a trade in human misery by those seeking to profit from the desperation of others. Trafficking exploits those who are particularly vulnerable in fear or desperation for sexual exploitation, forced domestic servitude or other forms of modern slavery. It is important that we recognise the impact that this can have on the individuals trafficked, understand their fear that of recrimination and retribution where they cooperate with the authorities and the anxiety which many will have that having been coerced or forced into illegal activity themselves, they may face criminalization if they do come forward. It is important today that we reinforce the message to such victims that this is not the case. You will be listened to, 
protected and crucially you will be supported as you try to rebuild your life. This bill makes further provisions uh, for that protection and I want to encourage anyone, whether a victim themselves or someone who believes in, that such trafficking or modern slavery is taking place, to come forward and report it to the police. Mr Deputy Speaker, I now want to turn to the comments which have been raised by some members very briefly. First of all, with respect to budget and resource, I have spoken at length about the challenges which we face in the Department of Justice in respect of the draft budget. It will simply not be possible to invest and fund these services as we would wish in these crucial issues unless we see a change to that draft budget. There is no point in me saying that we will simply prioritise this within the department because that alone will not be enough to overcome the deficit in terms of funding. It is important, therefore, that not just the Department of Justice, but that all parties make representations in that regard when it comes to consideration of the draft budget and the consultation. I believe that justice has a crucial role to play in terms of the health and well-being of our society. It is also an important part of the mechanisms we have to create safer communities. And I think it is important for that reason that it is a properly funded service um, and one that is able to discharge its functions um, in an efficient and effective way. That brings me to the point um, around uh, the issue of speeding up justice. And I recognise that there are delays in the justice system. We were making inroads into those at the start of the mandate, but COVID has, of course, set that back and created additional backlogs. With the additional COVID funding that we have received to date, we have now seen those COVID backlogs being reduced. We've also introduced the Committal Reform Act earlier this year, which will allow us um, to speed up justice in the longer term. However, all of those efforts will again be dependent on continued funding and investment. The court system is currently running at 115% of its normal capacity. That is not able to be sustained unless we are able to sustain the human resources um, and the funding required to go with it. With respect specifically to the issue raised um, with, respect, with regards to Ukraine, I think we need to recognise that there are issues. There is, first of all, the need um, for immediate humanitarian support to those both in Ukraine and those fleeing from Ukraine. And I've previously said to members that I believe it is important um, that the UK plays a full role in that. As a minister, I have been briefed um, by the head of civil service regarding the latest proposals from the UK government um, in terms of how families here um, and people here can go about offering support directly um, to those who are displaced um, and who arrive in Northern Ireland seeking our support. However, it is a complex system that has been put in place and it is heavily reliant on the generosity of individuals and their ability to identify those with, for whom they could provide support. And I think that the system will need to be reviewed and overhauled if it is to meet the needs of what is a growing population um, of people who have been displaced from Ukraine in tragic circumstances. In terms of protecting those people, I believe that the best way we can do so is to provide safe and efficient routes to the UK legally in order that they do not fall foul of traffickers and do not fall into that system in order to be able to make it to Northern Ireland. And I think the recent announcement saying that we would only deal with those who arrived in the UK under their own steam risks people falling into that trap of relying on others to traffic them here if they don't have the means at their disposal to escape. I think that is a high risk approach and I think it is one that we should address with the UK government to seek better um, interventions that will support people to get here. In terms of how we deal with the issues um, around human trafficking and modern slavery more generally and a number of members have raised the issue of vulnerability, again firmly whilst it is not um, a responsibility of the Northern Ireland Executive or indeed of the Department of Justice, I believe that the hostile environment policy being implemented by the UK government makes it more difficult for us to reach people um, who are vulnerable, who are trafficked, who are enslaved, because I believe that their fear is that they will simply be deported um, under the hostile environment policy to then be re-trafficked either to the UK 
or indeed to another country. And that vulnerability, I think, is not fully addressed by the current approaches being taken. Mr Deputy Speaker, it has also been raised about what is not in the bill. And of course, members will recall that at the time when I brought forward um, this bill, it was a miscellaneous provisions bill and was very wide ranging, including many of the issues to which uh, Ms Woods um, referred. However, in order to get the bill through the executive and to get it to the assembly, it was necessary um, that we, we narrow the scope of that bill. Um, the alternative would be that the bill would have been blocked at executive and would not have made it here. And there are, of course, pressing and important um, pieces of legislative change that are needed um, that had to be removed as a result. This bill represents around 70% of our original t intent for the bill. The remaining 30% we have been working through as a department, and we now have in an advanced stage of preparation a miscellaneous provisions bill for early in the next mandate. And so the key to us being able to develop that legislation, to take forward those issues to which Ms Woods and others have referred, um, and to be able to create a stable um, situation going forward, is to have a quick restoration um, of the Assembly and Executive, so that the Justice Minister in future will be able to progress that bill in short time um, at, at the start of the next mandate, and deal with what are essential issues, crucial issues that need to be addressed, um, and I believe should be addressed, and have taken action to ensure that there will be a bill prepared, um, irrespective um, of who brings it forward. At this stage, um, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I simply want to thank again the Chair of the Committee and the Committee members for their support and their careful scrutiny of the bill and the valuable contributions to its improvement um, during its passage. This bill represents the final piece of a jigsaw of interlocking legislation. Legislation designed to provide greater protection from those who seek to blight the lives of vulnerable people in our community through offending behaviour. I hope that there is a message for those perpetrators in our community today, that their behaviour, their exploitation, their sexual offences, um, and their abuse of those who are vulnerable in our community will not be tolerated and will lead um, to serious um, and, I hope, um, swift responses from the justice system. I look forward to a time, Mr Deputy Speaker, when legislation such as this is no longer needed. But until that time, I believe that this and other important bills that I've brought forward during this mandate will contributing to ensure a better future for many people uh, vulnerable people across our community and I therefore commend this bill to the House. Members, the question is that the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The final stage of the Justice, Sexual Offences and Trafficking Victims Bill has passed. The bill is passed. I'd ask members to take their ease before the next item of business. Order members, the next item of business is the final stage of the General Teaching Council Directions Bill. And I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to move the final stage on behalf of the Minister of Education. I beg to move that the General Teaching Council Directions Bill do now pass. 
The final stage of the General Teaching Council direction spell has been moved. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. So I now call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to open debate. Uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And first of all, I wish to put in record the Minister's thanks uh, to the Chair and members of the Education Committee for their acceptance of the case made by her um, to present it to them, seeking both the, their support for this bill and their agreement to move this bill under the accelerated passage arrangements. I simply want to record my thanks for the members of the House for agreeing to accelerate the passage of the bill within uh, what is a very full legislative programme. Members will recall Minister McElveen's statement to the Assembly on 13 December 21, in which she announced the outcome of the independent effectiveness review of the GTCNI undertaken by the Department's consultants, Baker Tilly Mooney Moore. Becker Tilly Mooney Moore's final report revealed that GTCNI was an organisation in disarray, failing to deliver against its statutory functions, failing to address identified audit weaknesses, failing to meet normal governance and accountability requirements for a non departmental public body, and failing to provide cohesive or coherent leadership and direction for its executive staff. It suggested that it was a body seemingly at war with itself, something which should be shocking to hear about any public body. But what is perhaps self-evident when you consider that since GTCNI Council was last reconstituted in 2019, a third of its membership had resigned or been withdrawn by their nominating bodies, was many of those departing citing poor leadership, ineffectiveness and an increasingly factionalised, aggressive and toxic atmosphere within the Council as reasons for their actions. The effectiveness review also drew heavily on self-assessments received from council members and the consultants who have undertaken over 640 similar effectiveness reviews, felt it necessary to state that this was the worst performing board or council that they had ever examined. It is perhaps unsurprising, therefore, that they concluded it is our opinion that the GTC NI is irretrievably broken and there is no prospect of recovery to any form of adequate performance. It's against that backdrop that on the 13th of December 2021, Minister McElveen announced her intention to legislate for the dissolution of GTCNI and to stand down its council with immediate effect. There was widespread consensus in the chamber that day that her actions were both warranted and necessary, and that GTCNI was an organisation which had been struggling for far too long. Some members reflected that our teaching profession deserved better. I would put it more strongly and say that the dedication, hard work, resilience and professionalism shown of our teaching workforce demands better. It demands representation and representatives who are dedicated, committed, unswervingly professional representatives we will always work together to find and advance the best interests of the whole profession. <clears throat> that is the GTCNI our teachers deserved. It is not what they received. And so we will now regrettably have to start again. The Department of Education will shortly begin a public consultation exercise to determine what should replace GTCNI. And they will then move at the earliest opportunity to introduce a bill to the next assembly to dissolve GTCNI while ensuring those functions and services which add value to our teachers and our schools will be protected and will continue to be delivered effectively and efficiently. Members, in normal circumstances, that would be the end of the, of the matter. A line is drawn under an organisation which has so comprehensively failed to meet its intended responsibilities, and we focus on our efforts on creating a fit-for-purpose replacement. Were that the case, this bill would not have been required. However, the Minister of Education has received correspondence challenging the authority of her actions in December and suggesting that these may well be challenged in court. And both the Minister and her officials continued to receive correspondence on a weekly basis from those who wished to resurrect the old arguments and undermine historical decisions and actions taken by individuals within GTCNI. 
Correspondence continues to consume an inordinate amount of departmental time and effort on just such issues, and responding to these letters continues to divert staff from more constructive and productive tasks. The Minister could not entertain in any scenario where the Department could once again find itself powerless to intervene in the operation of such an ineffective, factionalised and toxic organisation, and she will not take the risk that a legal challenge leading to a reinstated council might permit it to cause further damage to the reputation of our teaching workforce. The passing of this bill, therefore, represents a further drawing of the line under GTCNI as it was, because the Department will now definitively be able to prevent that situation from arising. So I thank the members for their support for this bill, and this step forward today um, shows a more positive and constructive future that our teachers deserve. I commend the bill to the Assembly. I call Chris Little, Chair of the Education Committee. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, genuinely and, and sincerely thank the Minister for his recognition of the work uh, that the Education Committee, um, that I'm privileged to chair, has undertaken to cooperate and collaborate with the Education Minister in support of the passage of this legislation to indeed deliver urgent reform of the dysfunctional General Teaching Council in Northern Ireland. It's appreciated. The Education Committee uh, concerns for the General Teaching Council, including its governance and indeed significant dysfunction, are well documented uh, and have been the case since a number of special measures have been introduced on the General Teaching Council. The Education Committee received briefings from various stakeholders on internal governance issues, alleged bullying and intentional impeding of business, which created an untenable situation for the General Teaching Council of Northern Ireland. The extent of the Education Committee's concern was reflected in its approval of the Education Minister's decision uh, to take action dissolving the General Teaching Council in December 2021. The Education Committee uh, supported the Minister's proposal to legislate uh, to strengthen her position uh, in respect of potential legal challenge. After meeting with the Education Minister earlier this year, the Education Committee supported her motion to accelerate passage of this bill. The bill reaches its final stage today and represents the immediacy uh, and that a deeply concerning issue came to require. As a result of this bill, the Assembly will amend Article 101 of the Education and Libraries Northern Ireland Order 1986 to include the General Teaching Council among the arm's length bodies that the Department has power to direct. Can I take this opportunity to reiterate the overdue need for delivery of a new fit for purpose professional body for teachers? As I and other members of the Education Committee have made evident throughout our process, and this bill's progress through the Assembly, the overarching solution must be to create an appropriate similar body that can be of comprehensive service to the critically important teaching profession in Northern Ireland. This vital sector of our community requires a body that is fully equipped to effectively represent and register teachers and to govern any misconduct. Deputy Speaker, this bill brings to term the existing General Teaching Council. However, it is just the start of a process that must be carried forward by the Department of Education to redraw the new entity and provide it with a full range of appropriate legislative powers and sanctions. The Education Committee understands that this may take time, but urges that it be done without any delay. I am sure that a future Committee for Education will continue to work constructively with stakeholders and the Education Minister to provide support and scrutiny of the Education Department's efforts to create a suitable body to effectively support and regulate the teaching profession in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. Um, first of all, uh, we recognise the urgent need to wind this organisation down. Uh, and I suppose the General Teaching Council has been blighted by a series of governance and leadership failures in recent years, and as a consequence, it has failed to live up to its responsibilities 
as the regulator of the teaching profession here. As such as the scale of the dysfunction, we find ourselves here working the fast track, the winding down of the General Teaching Council, and Sinn Féin are supportive of this approach. And essentially, this, uh, this short bill is in relation to housekeeping matters so that the minister can give directions. The, the GTC it describes itself as the statutory independent regulatory body for the teaching profession, dedicated to enhancing the status of teaching. And I would argue that rather than enhancing the status of teaching in recent years, the dysfunction of the leadership and governance arrangements of the GTC actually threatened to undermine the status of the teaching profession. In the autumn, it was a very difficult time for schools due to COVID and the associated staff absences. The General Teaching Council could not process hundreds of newly qualified teachers, preventing them from entering the classroom. The GTC is a departmental public body that is failing, and one that many of its members believe is failing. As legislators, I think we would be failing in our remit if we did not bring this to an end sooner rather than later. And it's important, and I raised this uh, at the previous stage, it's important that we acknowledge the child safeguarding issues, which have been of grave concern to the Education Committee uh, as we looked into the General Teaching Council. Going forward, we must address the shortcomings and put the welfare of our children and young people first. And when I did raise this at the, the previous stage, the Minister certainly gave reassurances, but I think it's important to mention again, because it is such an important issue, uh, such an important issue. Up to now, teachers who would have faced serious allegations might not be an employee of a school, and this could apply for a number of reasons. A teacher could resign from a school before any disciplinary action could be processed. A substitute teacher who does not have a contract with a school could be accused of serious professional misconduct. A teacher who has been referred to GTCNI for serious professional misconduct could make an application to teach in another jurisdiction. And a teacher who has been referred to GTCNI for serious professional misconduct uh, could decide to work as a home tutor using their teacher registration certificate as proof of their suitability to teach children. Uh, and, and, uh, I accept and acknowledge that the Minister gave reassurances at the last stage, and I am mentioning, mentioning them again just to ensure uh, that uh, we as an Assembly recognise the importance of child safeguarding issues. We need a fresh start at Kionkorla. Our pupils, our teachers and school leaders deserve better, uh, and they are quite prepared to work with the powers that be to bring about this much-needed change. Graham Galt of the National Association of Head Teachers summed it up well when he said, We are the sc school leaders union, and our members desire a regulatory body that ultimately serves our children. We are glad that the Minister has taken this action, and we are committed to working alongside her and our department on developing a new effective and fit for purpose regulatory body. Uh, I think the draft legislation before us provides us with the opportunity to make progress. Ongoing work is required by the Minister and her department to produce a clear plan which shows us what teacher registration looks like, but also, crucially, what, regula what regulation looks like going forward. I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I, at the outset, thank the Minister for the speed with which she has acted to address this issue? It was clear to those of us in the Education Committee that not only did this bill warrant approval, but that it should also be moved under accelerated passage, and I am pleased to see it coming to the final stage now. To say the Baker Tilly Mooney Moore report revealed an organisation in chaos would be an understatement. These findings were all the more alarming given the organisation was a public body. For some time now, those within the profession have been raising concerns with the GTC. The lack of leadership within the organisation, the ineffectiveness and lack of professionalism, alongside a systemic atmosphere of aggression. 
This was all made very evident with the findings of the effectiveness review and called upon us to urgently address the problems which had arisen. I know that those within the teaching profession will be pleased that this matter is finally getting the attention it requires, and I agree with the Minister when she says that our teachers deserve and demand better. The bill before us will ensure that we can now wipe the slate clean and move forward to consider what should replace the GTC without the fear of reinvention of an organisation that no longer serves any meaningful purpose. This is without doubt a positive step and will be seen as such across the profession. Whatever the form or structure of what will fill the void now being left with the dissolution of the GTC, we must ensure that teachers are supported with the best services and functions of a representative body. These core principles must be protected and will need to be first and foremost for any new body if we are to avoid these difficulties in the future. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I call Robbie Butler. Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I just want to, at the first stage, I see the new member for Lagan Valley uh, sitting in the seat. I want to welcome uh, Mr. Paul Rankin and, and hope that he enjoys his few days on the bench, although it's not the face that I expected to see here. Uh, perhaps it's expected to see Mr. Donaldson. But um, with regard to the, the matter we're discussing today, um, I want to thank the minister who's not here and want to wish her, her very, the very best. Uh, with regard to her illness and thank her for the speed that she acted on with regard to this report because I know on the committee we had heard a number of reports with regard to GTCNI and uh, our, our concerns were raised with regard to um, our teachers and indeed our probably even more specifically our pupils um, and we do welcome what has happened and I think that the Minister um, uh, pooch for, for, for stepping in and, and bringing this report uh, to us today, sorry bringing this, this bill to its final stage um, I just want to ask one question, if it's okay, and, and perhaps the minister may not be best placed to answer it, but perhaps the officials and the minister for education could respond to that. The problems that existed still exist, and obviously the, the winding up of GTC and I and the creation of a new body is vitally important. However, we have teachers and young people in there at present who are still subject to a lot of the concerns that the committee and members have shared. Um, would it be, and could the minister find out for us, would there be an interim report on what steps the department has taken before the provision of new legislation comes forward, just to ensure that the matters that have been raised, whether it's been in the report or on committee, uh, are addressed in the interim? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I now call on the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to conclude the final stage. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank all <coughs> those who have contributed. Um, again, I um, thank uh, everyone who has made this uh, travel smoothly. It is a situation that neither the Minister or the Assembly should have found themselves in, and that no organisation should be able to um, continue as the GTCNI was continuing and therefore the actions were necessary. Um, in terms of the work that is needed uh, to be done, uh, the Department is eager uh, to be working on establishing uh, the replacement body that teachers need, that teachers desire, um, go, you know, as, as quickly as possible. Um, on the question that uh, Mr Butler asked, I will have um, a written response to him on that. So, <clears throat> in closing, I would state that, once again, this will draw a line on the old. The Department of Education uh, is eager to get on with the new. And so, when the Department of Education launches a public consultation on this issue in the near future, I would invite everyone with a desire to see a fit-for-purpose replacement established, once which will support and enhance our teaching workforce to share their views as part of that exercise. I commend the bill to the House. Thank you. Members, the question is that the General Teaching Council directions bill do now pass. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. And the ayes have it. The final stage of the General Teaching Directions Bill has passed. The bill has passed. The Business Committee has arranged to meet at 1.30 today. I propose, therefore, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend the sitting until 2 p.m. The first item of business when we return will be question time with questions to the uh, Minister for Health. The sitting is, by leave, suspended.
Program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Program Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. The sitting is resumed and it's time now for questions to the Minister of Health. I can advise members that questions 6, 8, 11, 13 and 15 have been withdrawn. I call Mark Durgan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Um, I thank the member. In response to steadily rising demand, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service carried out an extensive demand and capacity review in 2017, which recommended a significant increase in the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service workforce and the introduction of a new clinical response model to introduce more effective performance targets and improve efficiency and safety. Implementing the new CRM is one of my department's transformation priorities and is a key enabler of the wider health service reform required to meet our long-term population health needs under delivering together. However, it is largely dependent on growing the paramedic workforce and the full implementation will therefore require additional recruitment funding to recruit and train sufficient numbers of paramedics. The first key milestone in the CRM programme was achieved when NIAST introduced new evidence-based response targets, and that was done on 12 November 2019. While there are some initial improvements in response times to immediately life-threatening calls, overall performance across all call categories will not see sustained improvement until significant additional resources are in place. My department is currently reviewing a final draft outline business case for the required investment, which was received from NIAS in December 2021, and that will shortly be submitted for further consideration by the Department of Finance. While approval of the business case is entirely subject to additional recurrent funding, the funding required to deliver CRM was introduced within my department's additional funding requirements, 
as part of the Budget 2022-25 exercise. And as Health Minister, I remain extremely concerned about the current uncertainty over the three-year budget planning exercise due to the absence of a functioning executive and the potential delay this is likely to have on key programmes such as CRM. This will undoubtedly affect patient care, and it is vital that clarity on the budget is given as soon as possible. In the meantime, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service continues to recruit and train as many staff as possible within the available resources and to prioritise calls in line with the new CRM. And I call Mark Durham for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer and welcome any uh, progress in this area. However, the sad reality is that people and places have not seen the improvement to date. Where, where some areas and some areas you might have to wait up to three times as long as the actual target time for an ambulance to arrive. arrive. That's completely unacceptable. If it was a Domino's pizza, it's, it's, it's just beyond the pale. If it's someone waiting for hospital treatment, someone who is at risk. Can the minister outline, in terms of the resource required, how much that is and where we are at in terms of securing it? I, th I thank the member, and I, I hope he was trying to be flippant when he was trying to refer to the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service to Domino's Pizza, and wasn't undermining the staff that are doing an, an amazing job within our ambulance service. Because, firstly, I want to recognise the hard work and the commitment of NIAS staff, particularly in the past two years, who, in common with other areas of the health service, are facing increasing demands on their services and challenges in achieving targets. Because even prior to COVID-19. Uh, NIAS have been experiencing steadily rising demand without that matching investment, and this has made it increasingly challenging to meet performance targets consistently across all categories. And this was the rationale behind the development of a new CRM, which ultimately aims to put in place a much more resilient workforce, uh, uh, sustained performance against response times targets in the longer term. So, in the past two years, these pressures have increased due to higher rates of staff absence the number of staff vacancies and the ongoing issues with lengthy patient handovers. These handover issues are linked to, to a lack of capacity and patient flow right across our system. But in the meantime, I am aware that NIAS are recruiting and training as many additional staff as possible within the available resources and have diverted considerable resource from the non-emergency transport service into the accident and emergency response. And the assistance of voluntary and private ambulance services has been key in freeing NIAS resources to respond to life-threatening or serious calls by providing crews to respond to low acuity calls. I understand that while crews respond to calls, ambulance service call handlers, including highly skilled paramedics, are available to provide telephone advice uh, to callers. I call Orlea Flynn. I thank the Minister um, for his answer. And I do think it is fair to say that the response times for amb ambulances are actually an emergency in themselves at the moment, particularly in our rural areas. Um, and Minister, while I do understand the logic of the co-responding with the fair service, um, can the Minister explain why some of the legal and workforce issues were not addressed before that particular announcement was made? Thank you. Um, in regards to uh, what was addressed as Maggie's call, there was ongoing engagement in regards with uh, the fire, um, fire and Rescue Service Board and the main, main union in regards to that. We were in a position actually to go ahead with the Carnlock station as the first responder to Maggie's call, and that was supported by the workforce in that station and joint working between uh, both NIFRS board and NIAS board as well. So those concerns were addressed at that point. Uh, and additional concern has been addressed uh, by the Fire Brigade Union, I think, at a head office level uh, rather than the loca local level. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, a paramedic's work can be challenging, both physically and emotionally, and indeed even uh, comes with a little bit of danger. Does the Minister agree with me, however, that Northern Ireland is fortunate to have the number and calibre of student paramedics coming forward that we do? And I thank the member for the point. I actually visited with uh, Northern Ireland Ambulance Service towards the end of last week in regards to it was the last um, cohort of their internally trained paramedics coming through, and their enthusiasm, their commitment, their desire to be part of the NIOS workforce, I think, was a credit to them, their trainers, but also the service in itself in regards to the investment that they're making personally to supporting the people of Northern Ireland. I call John Blair. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for detail provided already. And we touched on the issue of interagency approach uh, question or two ago. But can I ask the Minister if he can give a broader update on emergency service reform, including interlinkages between first response services, to include, for example, cardiac arrest response? And I thank the member. And I think, you know, he is touching on what the initiative that was has been referred to as Maggie's call. Uh, in relation to what we've been able to do in, in Carnlock Station initially, uh, where we've seen Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service actually coming together in response to that cardiac call that had been a, a system that had been progressed to a point where we could launch it in Carnlock. It's something that I would like to see rolled out across all our stations, both retained and full-time, so that we do see the blue light services of ambulance and fire brigade working hand-in-hand, -hand, especially in those areas where they can, the likes of of cardiac response, so it's it's the start of what I what I think can be a development. One of the the benefits that we have here in Northern Ireland is actually Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service being under the health portfolio, and that's a, an advantage that many of the other uh, areas or devolved nations that don't have. So we can actually see that co-working uh, coming together a lot more efficiently. Uh, and I would like to see what is the initiative referred to Maggie's call rolled out as soon as possible. Moving on, I call Jerry Kelly. Thank the Minister for his uh, answers up to now. Uh, uh, qu which question so number? <laughs> I thank the member for, for his question and his enthusiasm. Um, for, for over three decades, the European Social Fund programme, funded by the European Commission, has been a key source of funding for disadvantaged people, and that includes the long term unemployed, ex-offenders, young people not in education, employment or training, and the people and people with a disability. The ESAF has enabled people with a wide range of disabilities to access and stay in supported employment, and this has helped trust to meet their strategic priorities as set in the, out in the draft programme for government framework and related regional health and social care service delivery models. The fund has been due to finish at the end of March 2022. However, the programme has been extended under ESF Call 3, actually up until the 31st of March 23, and that is dependent on organisations securing the necessary match funding. Beyond this, uh, arrangement post uh, ESF remains unclear, and that includes the role of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund as its replacement. The total value of ESF projects has specifically supported the disability sector in the region of £15.6 million, and that supported 21 individual projects. Most projects have sufficient match funding in place to proceed post the 1st of April 2022. However, I understand that a small number still have match funding gaps. All have a, a minimum of 81% of the funding in place and could be scaled back if absolutely necessary. Um, it is the Finance Minister who leads on fiscal policy and negotiation of EU replacement funding with the UK Government. And my officials continue to engage with the Department of Finance and Whitehall colleagues to ensure that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will replace funding gaps created when the ESF ends. Officials continue to proactively engage with the Department for levelling up housing and communities through established channels on this issue, and we will continue to make representation through the Department of Finance. And I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. Apologies for my enthusiasm, especially after 20 years. And uh, I thank the Minister for his, for his answer, answer up tonight. And you give some uh, comprehensive uh, rundown on some of the funding that's there. But I mean, after the recklessness of, of Brexit, the, uh, there is still harm being done to services in communities. Um, there's uh, the recent loss of funding from the European Social Fund, and countless, uh, um, countless other services are at risk of closing. Um, but as the minister is, is he, and he is engaging, obviously, with uh, Westminster, and he's engaging and with others. But is he engaging with the services that are involved, especially those that are in danger of being closed uh, in the short term? Um, and I thank the, the member for, for his additional question. And I think, in, in clo uh, the, the end of um, my initial answer to him, I did point out that it's actually the finance minister that's leading in the negotiations and the fiscal policy in regards to. EU uh, replacement funding in my department uh, continues supportive of the work that has been done there. Um, in regards to UK Shared Prosperity funding being able to match the required funding and the infrastructure models that was previously met, there has been uh, minimal infra 
information shared on the Shared Prosperity Fund, and while the levelling up white paper was published in February 22, it lacks any confirmation of the quantum of funding for here to replace that 80 million per year. And as I've said, the Finance Minister is leading on that work. We haven't had any direct engagements because, uh, in regards to the organisations being funded through yourselves or through ESF, which is not a, a fund that is directly handled or managed by my department. Moving on, could we have Claire Sugden onto our screens? Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I call Claire number... Sugden. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number three. I thank the member. GPs are often the first point of contact for many people seeking diagnosis, treatment, and support, and they play an important role in promoting health and well-being, uh, supporting people to manage long-term conditions, and coordinating patient care across specialities and sectors. <coughs> They have also played a significant role in our response to the pandemic, and this has included uh, operating primary care COVID centres, as well as undertaking an extended flu vaccination programme and playing a key role in the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine programme. The General Medical Services contract sets out the core elements of what GPs must provide to their patients, and it is an agreed contract covering all four nations of the United Kingdom. However, there is scope for optional and enhanced services to be negotiated annually in Northern Ireland between the Department of Health and the Northern Ireland General Practitioners Committee. This allows us in Northern Ireland to identify local priorities for increased focus each year, and under the Quality and Outcomes Framework, GP remuneration is tied to the provision of quality care against a range of clinical-based indicators. At the outset of the pandemic, the Health and Social Care Board negotiated with the Northern Ireland General Practitioners Committee and my department to stand down the QAF elements of the GMS contract, and that was to enable GPs where they were able to respond to the escalation of COVID by establishing COVID centres without suffering financial detriment. And I can confirm that my department has recently commenced engagement with GPC on the GMS contract for 22-23, and those negotiations are at an early stage. It is important to note, however, that GPs have continued to have a responsibility to provide core services to their registered patients, and that the pandemic has not in any way negated this requirement. The service has been working hard to make best use of available resources for everyone who is seeking to access the care that they need. And I call Claire Sutton for supplementary. Um, I, I thank the Minister for his response. I think that was really helpful because I think there exists a misunderstanding about how GPs are managed in that they are essentially private organisations that deliver an NHS contract. Um, but, Minister, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, the, the issue of accessing GP services across Northern Ireland is one that we as MLAs are regularly contacted about. Um, and because it is so widespread, that would lead me to believe that it's a systemic issue. So um, I'll give you a, a hard question, given that it's probably your last question. Question time. Is the shortage of GPs due to per workforce planning of your department over 10 years? Um, and I thank the member for, for indicating this will probably be my, my last question or health question time of, of this mandate, and I'll miss it greatly. Uh, I can say, in, in regards for workforce planning and training, I wouldn't put the blame uh, at the feet of my department, but the challenge that has come uh, over having one year often non-recurrent budgets that has made those challenges even more difficult. And I fully recognise that the need for additional GPs to be trained, and as such, my department with the Health and Social Care Board and other stakeholders has commenced work on reviewing the number of training places that are available in GPs or for GPs in Northern Ireland. And we've continued, and my department has continued to invest in our work, GP workforce and has actually increased the number of GP trainees by over 70 per cent from those 2015 levels and there are presently 111 new training places available for GPs each year. And work is underway to review the number of GP training places, actually to ensure that we have the right number of GPs to meet our needs going forward. And that's a, a part of a wider piece of work my department has taken forward to explore options for meeting our GP workforce in the most cost-effective way. But it's important to note, however, that the increase in demand for primary care services cannot solely be, solely be met by increasing the number of GPs, and its other elements that include the wider rollout of primary care multidisciplinary teams, as well as the introduction of advanced nurse practitioners and additional general practice nurses, all of which are making a difference to how services are delivered in primary care and contributing to improve patient outcomes. 
and I call Colin Gildrenew. People do continue to struggle to get appointments to see their GP, and that's causing extreme anxiety in patients and putting additional pressure on services and on GPs, especially in local areas like Trillick and Tremor, where there are particular issues bordering the Fermanagh South Throne, West Tyrone constituencies and the knock-on impact. Minister, well, when the people of Fermanagh South Tyrone and West Tyrone see extra health staff being deployed on the ground to support their GP in the rollout of their work? Um, and I think the member nearly set him up there by reference to MDTs because I know that's something he has been uh, pushing my, my officials at the, at the, I think the last health committee. I hope to be in a, in a position within the next week to actually state where that rollout will be. But in regards to GP services in the South West, which he did mention to me where there has been uh, significant GP workforce issues in the Western Trust area, particularly in the southern part and the Health and Social Care Board has been engaging with practices across the South West area. And my department will continue to work closely with the Health and Social Care Board and GP representatives to consider how best to respond to the challenges which face general practices in Northern Ireland and to ensure that we have a GP workforce in Northern Ireland that is supported, that is motivated, is sustainable and continues to provide quality care to patients because we want to encourage even more highly calibre, capable medical students to choose a career in general practice and recognise that positive experiences during clinical placements can have a major influence on such decisions. So the commencement of the graduate entry programme at the Ulster University Medical School in McGee is a significant development in this regard because the curriculum of this uh, graduate entry programme places very significant emphasis on primary care placements with a high concentration on clinical placements in rural settings in the West. And this will help ensure a supply of local students who wish to pursue a career in general practice in these areas. But other elements include the wider rollout, as I've said, of multiplinary disciplinary teams, as well as the introduction of advanced nurse practitioners and additional general practice nurses, all of which are making a difference. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Minister for Health for his answers. Um, could I ask the Minister what discussions he and his department have had with pharmacists to ascertain what role community pharmacy will play in aiding GP services to assist GP services and to move transformation on health care forward? And will uh, community pharmacy be uh, included in the Encompass rollout next year? Um, I, I thank the member and I know, I know her work as chair of the community pharmacy all-party all group as well and the engagement that she continues to have. I, I met with the senior board and the senior office bearers of community pharmacy uh, last week to engage about how we look actually to the next three-year programme uh, of work that they can do in partnership with us uh, in the Department of Health but also across the wider health sector as well. In regards to Encompass, the member will be aware as, and I think the health committee is receiving a an update on Encompass uh, in, in the near future in regards to where it will be rolled out. Uh, the, the initial targets are across all health and social care settings before we look at the wider health family, and that includes community pharmacy, at what stage that will be feasible uh, and cost effective. But the member will also be aware of something that we are looking at uh, in the meantime is that of e prescriptions so that they can be easily transferred uh, across all health sectors and especially into community pharmacy. And I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I know the Minister loves question time so much, that's why I submitted an urgent oral question, and it's been accepted for later. But um, to, to continue with the theme of difficult questions, um, we submitted a priority written question back at the beginning of February, which was to be answered in five days, which was just asking about what percentage of the departmental budget is actually spent on general practice. Is that a difficult question to ask, or is it a piece of information that you might have to hand now? It's not one I have to hand now, but I'll follow up for the member. Moving on, I call to Lewis Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question for Minister. Um, and I thank the member for her question. I, I appreciate that this continues to be a worrying, uncertain time for anyone experiencing long COVID. And I would like to take this opportunity to reassure members that my department fully recognises the need to provide support to those who are dealing with longer term health impacts as a result of COVID 19 infection. On 1 November 21, I launched the first dedicated assessment and treatment service for post-COVID-19 syndrome in Northern Ireland. And these clinics allow people to have a comprehensive assessment of their condition and will help them access the services and expert advice that they need to support them in their recovery. Since then and up to the end of January 2022, 
Uh, approximately 1,000 people aged 16 and over have been referred to the multidisciplinary assessment clinics across the region. And following consultation with paediatric specialists in Northern Ireland, the post-COVID-19 services have been uh, designed for people 16 years of age and older, with the intention that children with persist persistent symptoms after a diagnosis of COVID who require more specialist assessment can be referred to trust paediatric services in the usual way. COVID-19 in children is usually of a short duration with relatively mild symptoms. However, I am aware that some children with COVID-19 experience prolonged illness uh, duration and that the impact upon them can be devastating. So the MDT clinic is one element of the suite of services that are being established for post-COVID-19 patients, and other elements will include uh, bespoke pulmonary rehabilitation, dysfunctional breathing service for patients with significant respiratory symptoms post-COVID-19, additional support for patients discharged from clinical care, both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19, strengthened psychology support to all trusts and signposting and access of self-management resources. I call Dolores Kelly for supplement. Thank you uh, for your answer, Minister. And you rightly out outlined a lot of uh, medical or therapeutic interventions, but there are many children suffering post-traumatic stress type symptoms or indeed social isolation as a consequence. And I watched a programme at the weekend where some children were being helped uh, actually by uh, a charity with, in partnership with uh, a, a riding school in terms of that therapeutic intervention use with pets. I just wondered, Minister, will there be enough flexibility and, and financial support to trust to allow for that imaginative type partnership uh, to deal with that specific type of impact of, of long COVID with children? And I thank the member. And, uh, the, the point she makes is, is one in regards to those mental, mental health supports that have been in place, and the member will be aware that's why I established the, the Mental Health Support Fund as well, because they are doing, and the, and the charities and vulnerable community sector are actually utilising that money to support individuals across society in a wide range of services as well. And I visited some equine support services, which are providing a, a, a great value to those patients that are using it as well. I'm not specifically aware of, of the pet intervention that, that, that the member mentions, but in regards to resources, you know, when I did launch that um, dedicated assessment treatment service back in November of last year, it was in recognition of the immediate needs to establish these very important services. At that point, I made a million pounds funding available for 21-22, and a bid to maintain those services has also been made as part of the budget process for the next three financial years, 22, 23, 24, 25, and then about the imaginative additional ones, we'll look how that can best intertwine and, and then work with the, the main core delivery while we work in partnership with the voluntary community sector. And the member will be aware from the mental health strategy that that's actually a core focus of that as well, how we work with our third sector partners as well to improve service. I call Karen Akilin. I'll get last can call you. I'm going by his lesson, Arasa Frager. Thank you very much the Minister for his response to Dolores. The question I have is in relation to Ministers outlined the role of the MDTs and indeed the psychological and mental health support services. Can the Minister give everyone here an assurance that there won't be a postcode lottery? Because getting access to MDT clinics if they exist and indeed getting onto the waiting list, particularly for CAMS and adult services and mental health as it is, is really, really difficult. Grimogat. Um, I, I thank the member and uh, acknowledge the point she's made. In regards to MDTs, there will be a further announcement of the next steps where we intend uh, to roll those out. But as, as I said, I think uh, in this chamber last week or the week before, that will be dependent on workforce and a commitment for financing over the next three years. And the same applies for CAMS. One of the things under the mental health strategy is that regional approach that we need to take to mental health when we reform it so there isn't a postcode lottery because since coming into this post it's something that I've been trying to make sure there's not across Northern Ireland, especially when we look to rebuild services, should that be surgical or medical or, or mental health supports as well. In regards to the establishment of long COVID clinics, all trusts are progressing uh, at significant pace. We are seeing a slight delay in the establishment of our COVID clinics in the Western Trust, but that should not hamper uh, the support available for patients. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, um, recently there I met with some long COVID patients um, on, on an online meeting, 
And at that meeting, there was raised the issue of the lack of support for, for children who are living with us, and I saw some really harrowing footage of it. So I, I, I really appreciate what you've said today, and I hope that there is rapid progress in engaging with young people and providing them the service. My question is, um, how is your department actually reaching out to other parts of these islands uh, and further to engage in clinical trials? Because there are some very sick children who would benefit from some advancements in the medical um, treatment for long COVID. Thank you. Um, and I thank the member, and I think she will be aware too, I'm not sure if she's directly referring, referring to it, but about those standards and outcomes and practices that have actually been developed uh, in Germany, mm -hmm. which are actually already being accessed by some patients in Northern Ireland. And it's through the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence uh, who are responsible for providing that evidence-based guidance and advice for health, public health and social care partners. And our post-COVID-19 services in Northern Ireland have been actually des designed in line with that nice guidance on managing the long-term effects, which actually covers those identifying, assessing and managing the long-term effects of COVID. So long COVID services in Northern Ireland will be continually reviewed and updated in line with any updates on NICE guidance, and that will be for both adults and young people as well, as to what are safe and effective treatments for those post-COVID-19 patients. Moving on, I call Mervyn's story. Uh, question number five, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the member for his question. Within the Northern Health and Social Care Trust, currently all income received from parking charges is used for the operational upkeep of the car parking facilities. That includes maintenance costs of par parking assets, which is barriers, pay stations, CCTV, and the removal of this income will require maintenance costs for car parks to be sourced from alternative trust funds, and that will result in additional resourcing pressures and an inevitable impact on patient services. Funding sourced from car parks also enhances security on acute hospital sites and provides a car parking team with CCT CCTV retrieval service as well as car park patrolling function on the Antrim area and Causeway Hospital sites. Should this service be removed due to insufficient of funding, this team of staff would have to be redeployed into the Corporate Sur Support Services Department. So free car parking not only will lead to a loss of income, but there is potential for car park spaces, particularly on some hospital sites, to be used by commuters and staff as a park and ride facility. Patients and other service users may therefore be denied, denied spaces when they are attending appointments of sick relatives. This particular issue has presented challenges to car parking provision on a number of hospital sites, and that there is also a number of hospital sites within the Northern Cross that currently do not charge for car parking, such as White Abbey and Moyle Hospitals. I call Mervyn Story for supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. And as this is possibly his last uh, question time as Minister of Health, as a, a colleague in North Antrim. I want to wish him well uh, in uh, the up and coming election and look forward, no doubt, to meeting him, I'm sure, uh, in the roads and, and the can area. Can you come to your North question, Antrim. please? Uh, could the Minister maybe explain or give us some outline? He has mentioned the issue in regards to the deficit in the funding. Does this mean that we will now be in a situation as a result of, of the imposition of this legislation that instead of having money and the car parks being managed, it will be a free-for-all and it will undoubtedly lead to a situation where there could be chaos at our uh, car parks and our hospitals as opposed to a situation where they are currently managed and revenue generated from them? And I, I thank the member, and again, I do look forward to, to those engagements across North Antrim because they have always been engaging and positive, unlike some other uh, constituents, colleagues that we have as well. I wasn't mean. <laughs> I didn't mean now, now, Jim. I didn't mean you. <laughs> don't don't take that personally now. Uh, look, in, in regards, and I think the member ha has reference. You know, and it is reference to the, the hospital parking charges private members bill. Uh, I have raised a number of concerns, as have my department staff and has trust officials uh, with the health committee and with the bill sponsors. Uh, I tabled a number of amendments at the last stage, which unfortunately weren't taken in full, which would have went some way to address <coughs> the concerns that we have from a department and trust point of view, uh, and I think that the bill sponsor could have been accepting of. But we have actually ta tabled further amendments, uh, which will see a, a time frame to allow uh, trusts and the department to introduce uh, car parking charges and the private member's bill intention, because it is a policy that we would or I would share in regards to making sure that those who need 
car parking aren't penalised in any way, but also to ensure that it's not abused. And I hope uh, we can meet uh, in, in willingness with, with the bill sponsor. I know it's something that has been picked up from an issue with Fran McCann tabling a private member's bill in regards to that. So I think it's something that progress can still be made on that actually benefits uh, the patients, visitors and the trust as well, because I think there's a piece of work that can be done in partnership with the bill sponsor on the department and trust. And that is our end of period of time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. Can I advise members that topical question number nine has been withdrawn? I call Patsy McGlone. Much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, um, last June the figures that were given to us were that there were 184,000 people waiting more than a year for the first hospital outpatient appointment and a further 66,000 patients waiting more than a year for surgery or hospital treatment. Now, at that time last June there was an announcement made of a 700 million roadmap to be introduced to help to start address these lists. Can the Minister give us any indication on progress in that regard, please? Um, and I thank the member for, for, his, for his point. And again, the elective care framework uh, that I announced at that time came with a, a 700 million, 707 and a half million pound actually over a five-year period. Uh, we were able to secure funding for the first year. Um, the number of initiatives that were already launched and actually are underway included the introduction of mega clinics uh, to maximise patient throughput, outpatient assessment delivered by GP federations in primary care settings, a regional retention initiative for nurses and midwives, recurrent and significant use of the independent sector, the development of an in-house health and social care capacity, and that included a workforce appeal and continued investment in staffing and the implementation of green pathways and sites. Also in the elective care framework was the day procedure centre at Lagan Valley Hospital, and that's working extremely well, uh, supporting a range of specialities from across the region to undertake the most urgent clinical cases. Uh, we've also looked at opportunities to deliver more elective surgery on a regional basis and are currently exploring other units across the health and social care service. These initiatives, which were aligned or are aligned with the elective care framework that I published, actually set out a five-year plan, which was intended and will systemically tackle the backlog of patients waiting. Uh, I published an interim progress report on the actions in the elective care framework back on the 24th of February. But that uh, also recognises the, uh, the additionality of re non-recurrent funding, uh, which was made, made available in 2021-2022, uh, was targeted at those patients initially. And unfortunately, because we don't have an agreed budget in place, there remains a great deal of uncertainty around the implementation of the framework and a great deal of uncertainty for those patients who are currently waiting. And I call Patsy McGlone for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can the Minister specifically add or uh, clarify if, in fact, those numbers, the, the 184,000 and the 66,000, that were uh, the figures from last year, if, in fact, those measures, that £707 odd million, pounds, is starting to make a dent or reduce those figures, and if so, by significantly how much? I can give the member figures as of the 31st of December if he wants to make the comparison. 147,878 patients were waiting for a diagnostic service. 83,643 were waiting more than nine weeks for a diagnostic test. And 49,632 were waiting more than 26 weeks. 120,097 patients were waiting for inpatient day uh, case treatment. 97,850 were waiting more than 13 weeks and 69,373 were waiting longer than, than 52 weeks. So while those initiatives that I have indicated are seeing us uh, hold steady uh, in regards to some of those figures, some are increasing, but it depends and it shows how much these waiting list initiatives are actually needed as an additionality to what we're currently able to provide in-house. And I call John Blair. Mr Deputy Speaker, last month a potential major incident was declared at Antrim Area Hospital in my constituency. Can I ask the Minister what immediate action he is taking to address the current pressures being experienced by emergency departments across Northern Ireland? I thank the member for his point. Uh, I know he says it's in his constituency, but I also know it borders on my own and is actually with a number of miles from, from my own home, so I am fully aware of, of the pressures and the work 
that is undertaken in Andromaria Hospital. In regards to the potential um, incident that was declared, it's not something that a trust or management team do lightly, but it was, I think, as some members uh, of staff referred as that flare, uh, of flare up to, to call and seek assistance. In regards to that, we have made a number of initiatives, especially over the last 18 months to two years, in regards to how we're seeing our emergency departments actually working together in regards to ambulance, and ambulance smoothing, uh, where ambulances can be and are redirected uh, to emergency departments should there be spare and available capacity. But that's, that's something there's not a lot of in our emergency departments at the minute. So there is a, a major review of emergency uh, medicine, uh, and that review is due to be published very shortly as well. There is no quick fix to this. And I think no matter who uh, you speak to across the medical professions will indicate this. This is about a, a long-term development and investment in not just our workforce, uh, but also the facilities that we have so that we can get on top of that 10 years of underinvestment, both in facilities and workforce. I call John Blair for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the, the Minister for, for that reply. I am grateful, Deputy Speaker, for the reviews being undertaken and the initiatives um, that are underway at the behest of the, the Trusts. But can I ask, in addition to that, um, if all aspects are being addressed in relation to the pressures that are on emergency departments, for example, the issue of access to GPs, which has been mentioned here today a number of times, is, is that impact on emergency departments? being considered actively currently by the Minister and the Department? And, uh, I thank the member he did reference earlier on in regards to the specific point that was raised uh, in regards to GPs and the work that they continue to do. And a, a number of times I have addressed in this House uh, is that misconception or misperception in, in some cases that our GPs are closed. The member will know they are not, but it, it, it's, it, it's a I suppose it's an narrative that's out there that's been hard to address, but I'd like to make sure that, that people are aware that there is access to GP services as necessary. Look, in the recent figures, actually, in regards to access to GP services, uh, indicate that currently practice teams are carrying out approximately 200,000 consultations on a weekly basis, and feedback from our GPs indicate that many patients are presenting with more complex needs particularly those who have a chronic disease, making it more difficult for GPs to see all the people that they would wish to see. So it's not about one part of the health service putting pressure on another part. It's all under pressure at the moment because there's no spare capacity within our service that we can uh, readily divert to help elsewhere. But it's how, um, especially over the last two years, we've all seen it coming together and working as one health service where we actually deliver for the people in Northern Ireland is challenging. The people working in our health service know the pressures they're under, but I've never seen a, more, a workforce a little tired uh, and under pressure that are more resilient now, especially as we come out of again this we have, we have COVID about redressing and getting back to doing the work that they want to do. I call Colin Gildenew. Gormay Agat, last can call you. Minister, the transformation of health and social care here is arguably the greatest challenge facing a future executive. Can the Minister confirm if you will make a decision on the duty of candour, stroke services or workforce planning before the end of the mandate? Um, I thank the Member and they are all, they're all major pieces of work that are currently either in the system or working their way towards uh, my desk. In, in response to the, the duty of candour, I have received an initial response um, from the workforce, which I am currently considering in regards to what that can be, whether I can make a decision. Uh, on the fully informed decision between now and next Friday uh, will be challenging in regards to what exactly has to be done because I have uh, further sureties to, to uh, ascertain. In regards to stroke services, the member will be aware as, as well that I have asked for additional, uh, additional work to be done in regards to the numbers uh, because I think in the review of stroke services at the start did not take into consideration fully uh, the ageing population that we have in Northern Ireland. So There has been a number of developments that actually have been made in regards to stroke services, in regards to the, the accessibility of, of, of certain medications when it comes to, to stroke prevention or stroke reversal, uh, as well, in regards to how we actually support those patients. The third one, Colin, apologies. Workforce planning, Workforce planning again, is ongoing, and the member will know that we set out a number of uh, initiatives in regards to the 2026 project, where there was to be three uh, yearly reports. The one that was due. Uh, 
during this particular period has been stalled due to COVID, but that of workforce planning in regards to additional nursing training places and the additional places and investment that we need to put in continues. And I, I would like to be in a place to make an announcement in regards to that, but I can't give surety to the member, and nor would I want to, to mislead the House at this point in time. But it's work that will continue. Uh, and if it's not done in this mandate, I can assure it will be ready for the next Health Minister, whoever that may be, come the 5th of May. I call Colin Gilden, you for supplementary. Gordon Maggot, and I thank the Minister for his, his answers to those. Minister, there have been very many sad and tragic moments over the past number of years as a result of COVID, but also, regrettably, we have seen throughout the health and secure system various scandals that have rocked the system. Um, uh, Mokamore Abbey, Dunmore Manor, Clifton House Nursing Home, urology, radiology and more. Given the need for clarity and answers for victims, Minister, can you confirm that you will publish the neurology report before you leave office? Um, I, I will do my utmost, and I think it's something the member has asked, um, I, I, I think, at Health Committee. He, he mentioned the, the, the transparency and the challenge. The member will also be aware, since coming into office, as Health Minister, I have announced public inquiries under the Public Inquiries Act into urology, into neurology, and into Mokamora Abbey, especially, you know, which uh, work has already started on within the, in the past week. And I would encourage uh, people to interact with that team as well, because of those three inquiries, I think they all build on what we all want in this, this House, and that's people to be reassured that the service that they get is safe and is quality. Uh, approved and consistent, should that be through all the, the different medical bodies, training colleges, all professional standards as well. So it is imperative that we get that reassurance and that trust back into the general population in Northern Ireland. So I'll not again make any commitments to the members that I, that I can't uh, promise today, but I'll write to him if I can by the end of the week in regards to the time frame on that specifically because he has asked in the past. I call Alex Easton. Deputy Speaker. Could I um, ask the Minister how important he considers the Independent Living Fund to be? Um, and I, I thank the member for his question. Um, and actually, there was a very, uh, again, good engagement uh, between the Disabled People's Parliament and the Health Committee that the Health Committee actually facilitated um, last Thursday in regards to a number of issues. And that was actually the first question. Uh, that was asked, so I'm not sure if the, the member had been watching or was just intuitive in regards to that, but the Independent Living Fund uh, is essential, it's beneficial, and I think as the Health Committee heard and I heard and I, I've heard it previously uh, about the independence, you know, and it's in the name about how that allows people with disabilities actually to live independent, support, independently, support themselves independently, but also uh, the importance that during uh, the COVID pandemic where they were able to be assured of the support that they were getting because it was services and individuals who they themselves uh, were actually employing directly. So I, I place a great value in the Independent Living Fund, but again, in regards to the challenges that are currently there of a recurrent budget, uh, where I would like to do more at this point in time, unfortunately, I'm not able to confirm that. And I call Alex Easton for supplementary. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Sticker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, Minister, I know the Permanent Secretary hasn't given any paperwork back to him yet. Um, will he be launching a consultation on the Independent Living Fund over the next week or two uh, to possibly look at reopening for new applicants in the future before he goes out of office? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that's due to come to me in the, at, at, between now and next Friday in regards to launching a consultation on ILF. But again, uh, if there is something, I will confirm it to the member in writing if there is something that's already in preparation in regards to that. And I call Sinead Innes. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, families who rely on death centres and respite services um, really feel like they've been left behind as COVID restrictions have eased. And I know you announced in January that trusts were instructed to reopen these uh, services, uh, but some families are still waiting for this uh, crucial help to, to finally uh, reopen. So can you state when services will finally resume for respite and, and day care centres? And I thank the member for the point. I think at the last question time there was actually further uh, clarification in regards to that, in regards to the targets that had been specifically identified 
by a number of trusts and how they plan to step up those respite and daycare facilities. Uh, some trusts more ambitious than others, uh, but I had asked that all trusts actually publish their rebuilding plans uh, actually on the department's uh, website in regards to the speed that they will be working at. But I, uh, as uh, the member has indicated, I made it very clear that my expectation of our trusts that they were to get those facilities back up and running to full capacity as soon as was safe and practicable for them to do. And that is the end of our period of time for questions to the Minister of Health. I would ask members to take the, the raise for our next item, which is questions to the Commission. Members, we now move on to questions to the Assembly Commission. Questions 4 and 8 have been withdrawn. I therefore call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, question 1. And I call John O'Dowd. I thank the member for his question. The Assembly Commission has at all times sought to apply the regulations when they were in place and the guidance issued by the Executive in a pragmatic and practical manner. This has included the guidance that staff should work from home where possible. As this guidance is still in place, the Assembly Commission has sought to facilitate working from home where it is possible. The Assembly Commission does not record the average numbers of staff working in person in Parliament buildings each day. The number or proportion of Assembly Commission staff working in person in Parliament buildings to support the work of the Assembly is dependent on business need and will fluctuate from day to day. I think that members will recognise that throughout the pandemic, a significant number of staff have been working in the building on different days, particularly to ensure that the Assembly and its committees continue to do business. It was incredibly important that the Assembly remained able to make decisions and pass legislation during this period. Members will be aware that officials have undertaken a lot of work to adopt how the Assembly works to deal with the constraints created by the pandemic. I would therefore take this opportunity to record the thanks of the Assembly Commission to our staff for the continued support that they have given to us throughout this challenging time. Government. <coughs> Supplementary for Mike Nesbitt. I thank Mr O'Dowd and I join him in thanking Assembly staff for the work during the pandemic. Has there been or will there be any assessment of the impact on productivity of working from home? And is there a plan for the future, a return to what was or a hybrid future for staff? Um, an analysis of, of the outworkings of the Assembly, uh, I'm sure, is possible. Um, a lot of that work depends on the people in this room, of course, uh, how, how, what, how productive we are rather than how productive Assembly Commission staff are in fairness to them. But certainly, uh, it's something that I'm sure officials will take note of. In, in regards moving forward, uh, the Assembly Commission has given uh, staff a commitment to develop a home working policy that and that process is well advanced. A draft policy has been consulted on with all staff and trade union side on foot of the consultation responses. A revised policy is currently being developed. Call John Stewart. Question number two, please. Uh, and Trevor Clark is responding. Uh, can I thank the member uh, for their question? Uh, the Speaker launched the exhibition on Friday, the 4th of March, 2022, and at the event in the Great Hall to coincide with the First Women's Parliament. The launch was attended by members of the Assembly's Women's Caucus, uh, Parliament participants and some of the women who featured in the exhibition and academics, Assembly Commission staff who had also assisted in the exhibition. Mr Stewart for supplementary. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Commission member for his response to that. I just want to praise the exhibition itself and say how important it is that we promote um, the valuable contribution that we will make to politics here. I'm just wondering, are there any plans to extend the exhibition or even to take it on tour to local museums and community centres where young women in our community can see the positive benefit that women make to politics here and potentially get more involved in political interaction? There are no immediate plans, I believe, but the exhibition will be retained for future use and they, uh, particularly will be used to focus on future outreach events, including the potential, the potential to use the exhibition in locations outside of Parliament buildings. Next year, I'm Sir Farig Largy for New Cash to Carter. I call Farig Largy. Question three. Glorious Kelly to Glorious Afragridge. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for his question. I am pleased to inform him that the review on the display of artefacts is at a very advanced stage. And the member may have seen the letter the Speaker issued on behalf of the Assembly Commission earlier today. The review was undertaken by a working group comprised of officials and Dr Eamon Phoenix. It was conducted in line with a set of principles agreed by the Assembly Commission. While it is challenging, Members have been invited to a launch for the new display on Wednesday, the 23rd of March. And I don't want to preempt the launch, but I will give members an overview. The new display reflects the history of the parliamentary and political institutions connected to this building. That includes the period from the original Parliament in 1921. It also covers the background to the Good Friday Agreement and the creation of this Assembly, as well as subsequent political negotiations over the years. The major figures and events over the past 100 years have been reflected in a way which ensures that all political perspectives of the Assembly are reflected. This will see a number of portraits and photographs displayed in the corridors for the first time. It also, would also mean a number of the Assembly Commission's artefacts will be taken out of storage or moved from locations where they were not accessible to the public. I would hi highlight that the Assembly Commission believes that the new range of items on display will be a major addition to the experience of visitors to the building and it seeks to provide visitors with a context to our current politics. The Commission believes the exhibition will be a positive addition to this building and this has been a significant project involving a lot of work for officials. On behalf of the Assembly Commission, I would like to thank them for their hard work. Thank the member for her answer. Um, would the member agree with me that it's important that Parliament buildings through its artefacts and symbols reflects the diverse community which it represents? Uh, absolutely. That is something that was very much at the forefront of the Assembly Commission's mind and indeed the instructions given uh, to the officials and we relied heavily upon Dr Raymond Phoenix and others to ensure that we had as diverse a range as possible. Obviously uh, it would have been I think probably much more reflective if politics in the past had reflected the diverse community uh, that we were saying, particularly women, uh, but uh, I think we have. Uh, Jim Allister. Someone who's campaigned uh, on the artefacts issue for many years, I will reserve judgment until I see the exhibition uh, and the permanency of it, but can I ask this specific question? Will portraits of former Prime Ministers of Northern Ireland be on permanent display? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, the, the, there's a number of uh, figures that will be on display, and obviously there, there, there will be some uh, feedback required uh, by the new uh, assembly and the new mandate as to the success or otherwise of that. That does not mean, however, uh, given the number of artefacts we have, uh, it does not at this stage. Please, suggest if, uh, sorry, excuse me, Mrs. Kelly. If members wish to have private conversations. <laughs> They're not so private in here because they can be audible up here. Okay, thank you. Continue, uh, it is not my understanding that at this point uh, that uh, former prime ministers will be in permanent display, but I will, yeah. uh, I will uh, uh, ascertain the facts of that and write to the member accordingly. Uh, Colin McGrath, I call for Colin McGrath. Question number five, Sir Deputy Speaker. John Blair is responding. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Uh, the member will be aware, Deputy Speaker, that the Assembly Commission has only responsibility for the lawns adjacent to Parliament buildings within its curtilage, and those end at the railings to the front of the building. Beyond that, the management of the Stormont Estate falls within the remit of the Department of Finance, and specifically 
the Estates Management Unit. While the Assembly Commission has not considered an alternative use for the lawns within its responsibility, support and encouragement for biodiversity and pollinators has been put in place through the installation of an apiary at the west side of Parliament buildings. Uh, as well as increasing biodiversity and supporting pollinators, the apiary is used to raise awareness of the dwindling numbers of native bees. Works on the storm and estate under the control of the Department of Finance are informed by the storm and estate woodland management plan and the conservation management plan. These plans have not recommended rewilding of the formal lawn areas. Across the wider storm and estate, the estate estate management unit has provided a woodland environment with minimal intrusion to help protect and expand the habitat for plant and animal life. The Assembly Commission, through the Events Office and the Education Office, promotes the nature trails throughout the estate and encourages visitors and school groups to make use of the grounds when they visit Parliament buildings. In this regard, the Assembly Commission's Sustainable Development Office is a partner of the Eco Schools Group and helps raise awareness of the wildlife and our bees in particular in the estate when meeting with school groups. The Assembly Commission's Sustainable Development Office continues to liaise closely with the Estates Management Unit in order to enhance the biodiversity around Parliament buildings by whatever means possible. Colin McGrath, supplementary question for Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for the answer. It's a bit disappointing to hear that, given that we've got such large, expansive uh, lawns to the front and the side of this building, that we couldn't use even just a small portion of them uh, for some sort of biodiversity and, and rewilding uh, project. Because I think that we could set a good example by having such. Um, a, f- a facility here, and maybe that might be something that the Commission could consider, and maybe the member could bring that back to the Commission to see if that is possible. Um, and given that there, you've referenced some of the other um, facilities within the Storm at the State, is there some sort of formal partnership between the Department of Finance and the Commission, given that most people see the estate as one, and see if there's some projects that could be done jointly? Deputy Speaker, I understand that there would be regular contact between the Department of Finance and the Assembly Commission in relation to the states that matters, and especially where the um, state for which the Commission is responsible interfaces with the remaining Stormont estate. I am more than happy to, to take the suggestion of further work in this regard back to the Commission for work through that Commission and also through the Sustainable, Sustainable Development Office. Cash dig Philip McGuigan. A question for the uh, last can call you. And just following on, I suppose, from the previous uh, question, uh, could I ask maybe if the Commission would engage with wildlife organisations such as the RSPB uh, to see what else it could do to support uh, and encourage wildlife uh, around the environs of the Assembly build? Every speaker, I thank the member for that, that question also. Uh, the Sustainable Development Office will continue to work closely with the States Management Unit, as I outlined before, um, and to, to encourage visitors to Parliament buildings to avail of walking trails, for example, throughout the um, storm of the state. There is no reason, therefore, why the suggestion in the previous question to, to extend that further to other biodiversity trials could not also be done in conjunction with environmental groups. I am happy to take that back in conjunction with the previous point. I called Keith Buchanan. Mr. Deputy Speaker, question number six, please. And Trevor Clark is responding. Um, can I thank the member for his question? Uh, the Assembly Commission, in conjunction with the designers and the contractors, have been investigating a number of water ingress issues in Parliament buildings, but so far have been unable to successfully address all of the issues. Having been unable to agree on the cause of, of and the responsibility for these issues, the Assembly Commission instructed solicitors in June. 2021 to advise on determining liability for the defects. The external experts have prepared preliminary expert reports in this matter, and the Council has been instructed. Given that the Assembly Commission may need to resolve this matter through legal proceedings, the Assembly Commission needs to be careful in its public comments on this matter. But I can advise that the Assembly Commission has agreed that there should be an initial effort between the parties to resolve issues of liability through mediation. Failing that, the Commission will issue legal proceedings against those responsible for the defects. Supplementary for Keith Buchanan. Thank you. And I must say, at times, that this building looks a bit like Steptoe's. And somebody, some people in this building will obviously understand what I'm referring to. It looks more like Steptoe's house than it is the seat of government. There's that many buckets around. That said, does that mean that the repairs can't be carried out until liability is, is on whose side that becomes r- responsible for? Therefore, we're still going to have the leaks until liability is, uh, is clarified through the, the solicitor or legal route? 
the Assembly Commission is closely monitoring the defects that you have referred to and determine whether remedial works are needed to be carried out in advance of an agreement as to the liability. Here, Mr. Kira Ferguson. Kesha called Kira Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Commission offer assurances to us um, that everything you are doing will ensure that the public purse has been, you know, is protected in this attempt to reach a resolution on this issue? I can give you that assurance, and I think that's why the Assembly has went to great lengths in, down, in terms of the mediation process to try and get value for money for the Assembly and for the wider public. And I call Jim Allister. Can the, the Commission advise us when does the limitation period expire in respect of this matter, and what has been the cost to date of such work as has been done? Um, can I thank the member for the question? I have not that information in front of me today, but I will get a follow-up answer in more detail. I can see him, sir. Colm Gildon, you cashed the car. I call Colm Gildon, you. Colm, I got last year call you cashed ever a shocked. Question seven, please. I can see him. Or Dolores Kelly, no frag video hoard. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, Kelly and respond. thank the member uh, for his question. An update on the current COVID-19 health and safety measures was issued to all users of Parliament buildings on the 1st of March 2022. That update set out the current arrangements for ensuring the continuing safety of everyone in this building. The update noted that all coronavirus regulations have ended, but it also advised that the Assembly Commission will seek to follow the public health guidance that remains in place. This is entirely in line with the responsible and effective approach that has been adopted up to this point. The current measures to ensure everyone's safety, including encouraging the wearing of face coverings in areas of the building that can become congested, and suggesting that a, meter, or a distance of one metre should be maintained throughout Parliament buildings. Naturally, the use of hand sanitizer remains in place, as do the protective screens that have also been in place for some time. The Assembly Commission is acutely aware that in the absence of regulations, much of the response to the risk of COVID-19 infection is centred around personal responsibility. In this regard, the Assembly Commission would commend the responsible approach adopted by building users and encourage that to continue. Cash Brescia, Colm Gildon, supplementary question for Colm Gildon. I thank the Commission member for uh, that answer. Will the Commission continue to provide and encourage adherence to guidance uh, to protect visitors, staff and members in Parliament buildings? Um, the, the, the member is right to urge a cautious approach because we know that the infection continues to be rife uh, throughout the community, although thankfully um, the consequences of it are not as uh, uh, fatal as they were uh, a year ago or even a few months ago. However, um, wh whilst the Commission can issue instruct or the staff can issue uh, uh, um, instruction to staff, it would be for party whips and party leaders actually to encourage uh, political party representatives to uh, pursue a cautionary approach and to follow the guidelines. I call Mervyn Story. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Commission members for their answers thus far, and, and I concur with the comments in relation to being cautious. But how long are we going to be in a situation, even though we're in the last couple of weeks of this mandate, where the stationary office in this building is closed to members and to their staff, and that has been the case since the commencement of the restrictions? Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for drawing that to our attention. I am acutely aware of that. Uh, um, the guidance, as you know, is, is continuously reviewed uh, by the Commission, uh, and we do not second-guess the Executive. But if there are particular issues around particular service provision, that is something we want to hear about, and we will uh, reassess and uh, make recommendations and come back to you on that. I call Jim Allister. Mr Robbie Butler to respond. thank the member for his question. As the member will be aware, the Assembly Commission agreed an approach for the decades of centenaries, which requires that any Assembly Commission decisions to mark centenaries be agreed by consensus. The Assembly Commission did agree a programme of events for the centenary. However, political consensus could not be reached on the proposal for a centenary stone when it was considered previously. While it is possible for the Assembly Commission to reconsider any proposal made to it, uh, the issue would remain one of being able to be reached by political consensus. Supplementary question, Mr. Allison. And by consensus, the member means that it is subject to the bigotry of the Sinn Féin veto, 
and that is why this issue has never been addressed. One would have thought that if it is within the capacity of the Commission to address the Platinum Jubilee to the limited extent it did, it surely is not beyond it to address the issue of the centenary of the place where this assembly, uh, uh, the country which this assembly purports to preside over. Just before we respond, I'll just caution members about the use of the certain terminology, please, and be careful in the, the use of words. Okay, Mr. Butler. I thank the member for his, his supplementary question. The member will know that I'm here to reflect the Assembly Commission's corporate and agreed position rather than my own personal view. Uh, it's no secret that there were different views within the Assembly Commission on this particular matter, uh, but that reflects the politics of the Assembly itself. I call Mr. Mervyn Story. Uh, question 10, Deputy Speaker. Well, John Blair to respond. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for his question. The Department of Finance has engaged with the Assembly Commission officials to consider policies and decision-making processes that the Assembly Commission has in place to govern events and requests for commemorations in Parliament buildings. In particular, Assembly Commission officials have provided an update on the review of artefacts the Assembly Commission has recently conducted and the principles which were agreed for that process. Those principles were agreed by, by, on the Assembly Commission by all parties and acknowledged the need to be inclusive of and sensitive to different political views across the Assembly. If the Department of Finance seeks further formal input from the Assembly Commission, that will of course be considered positively. However, it is for the Department of Finance to determine how any review dealing with the storm of the state itself is conducted. Mr. Story, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Commission member for his answer. But given the successful event which was held in the grounds of this estate uh, on Monday, which was to mark uh, the Her Majesty's uh, platinum reign, and it was actually held on Commonwealth Day, does that not show that when there is the absence of bigotry, when there is the absence of political prejudice, that an agreement can be reached? which reflects the history and the accuracy of Northern Ireland, and will the, the member commit to having further discussions with the Department of Finance to ensure that those outstanding issues where there has been a failure on their part to deliver uh, will be looked at in regards to our history and our heritage? Deputy Speaker, I am not in a position uh, individually at this point to make a commitment on behalf of the Commission, but I am sure the points raised by the member will be considered. The um, occasion that the member referred to was, of course, Deputy Speaker, held within the precincts of Parliament buildings and was therefore a matter for the Assembly Commission and not the Department. I call Rachel Woods. Question 11. I can see them, Sir John O'Dowd, and if I can get a horse to the dog. I will ask and call you. I thank the member for her question. The Assembly Members' Pension Scheme is a trust-based occupational pension scheme. Up to five members are appointed by resolution of the Assembly to act as trustees. The trustees are responsible for administering the pension fund in accordance with the scheme rules, the law as it relates to the pensions and pensions regularity guidance. The trustees have, uh, have appointed an, investor, an investment manager to invest the pension fund on a day-to-day -day basis. That appointment and the direction of, invest, of the investment manager is a matter for the pension trustees. While this is a matter for the pension trustees and not the Assembly Commission, I am, I am advised that the trustees have recently appointed a new investment manager. In doing so, they ensured that the need to be able to undertake socially responsible investments was included in the specification for the new investment managers. The member may wish to contact the trustees to discuss this matter further. Supplementary for Rachel Wood. Speaker, and I thank the member for his answer. I've continuously contacted the trustees in the last two years, and I've yet to receive an actual firm date of when I'm going to meet them. But um, the war in Ukraine has pro brought a sharp focus to the reliance on Russian fossil fuels and companies. So, can the member assure this House that there will be a full review recommended by the Commission into the amount invested in the NIAMPS pension scheme, of which every member in this House, I believe, is a member of, into Russian oil, coal, and gas? Uh, just for openness and transparency, just to uh, declare an interest, I was a trustee uh, in the last mandate, but I haven't been a trustee in this mandate. 
Uh, again, I say while the Assembly Commission makes pension contributions, the pension scheme is administered by the trustees and not by the Assembly Commission. Therefore, where the money is invested does not fall to the Assembly Commission. Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Question 12. Trevor Clark is responding. Yeah, can I thank the, the member for her question? Um, the energy costs for Parliament buildings relate to gas and electricity usage. The Assembly Commission avails of a Department of Finance framework for the provision of gas and it also uses a DOF contract to purchase its 100 per cent renewable electricity. The total energy cost for Parliament buildings for this financial year 21-22 is forecast to be just under 480,000. This is an increase of 194,000, almost 68 per cent of the co up on the cost of 286,000 in 2020-2021. Bradley, supplementary question for Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the answer. 480,000, that's a staggering amount and no doubt will increase. And I would ask the Commission, will you investigate why, on the hottest days of the year, the heating in this building remains on? And can we find the off button, please? Can I thank the member for her supplementary question? I think the Assembly, the Assembly Commission will consider what you have raised. I think it's very much in their minds at the minute, given the, the rising energy costs, something that's out, out with the control of the Assembly itself. Question number 13. The member is not in the chamber. I now call uh, George Robinson. Mr. Question 14. And Mr. Robbie Butler is to respond. Mr Deputy Speaker, question 14 is a bit of a record in any sitting, isn't it? Um, I thank the member for his question. The member will be aware that the Assembly Commission agreed to a request from the Assembly branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association to grant permission to plant a tree in the grounds adjacent to Parliament buildings to mark Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee. That decision was agreed unanimously on the Assembly Commission, uh, by the Assembly Commission, and I think that was welcomed by all members as being very positive. Members will also be aware that a speaker's event was held uh, yesterday on Commonwealth Day. At that event, the tree to mark the Platinum Jubilee was officially planted by members of the Co uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association branch and members of the Assembly Commission. The member will be aware that the main focal point of celebrations for the Platinum Jubilee will be, extend will be an extended public holiday from the 2nd to the 5th of June. The responsibility for leading the Assembly in marking civic events and other important occasions comes within the speaker's representational role. Members who were here in 2012 may recall that Speaker Hay held a concert in the Great Hall to mark the Diamond Jubilee with the then Lord Lieutenant at Dame Mary Peters. Obviously, after the May election, the Assembly is, uh, is expected to elect a new Speaker. It will therefore be for the Speaker at that time to determine any additional arrangements for how the Assembly marks the Platinum Jubilee in advance of the June focal point. And supplementary question for George Robinson. Thank the member for his answer. And if the whoever the speaker would be would agree, as this is a unique event <clears throat> that will never happen again, and to recognise the outstanding service Her Majesty has given to your country, including Northern Ireland, could an invitation be extended to the palace for the, Her Majesty to attend this momentous event here in Northern Ireland? I thank the member for his uh, very useful supplementary question. The issue of uh, official invita invites to visit the Assembly and Parliament buildings is the responsibility of the Speaker, not the Assembly Commission. Clearly, we will all be aware that it is not possible to know how a f uh, full a programme of travel and events Her Majesty the Queen uh, will be able to undertake for the Platinum Jubilee. However, it is also the normal protocol that such invites are best taken forward by official channels uh, rather than through a debate on the floor of, of the Chamber. Thank you. And members, <coughs> that concludes our, our assembly questions to our questions to the assembly commission. Um, yep, just Mr. O'Dowd. I'm raising a point of order as an individual, not as a member of the assembly commission. I would ask that the speaker's office takes a, a look at Mr. Allister's comments during that session. I have no doubt in my mind, Mr. Allister is an expert on the subject of bigotry and how to administer it. But I would ask that his comments and during that question time are examined. Well, I trust and hope that you haven't repeated that offence. So, um, if it is an offence, sorry, I have another point of order. Just a moment, um, Mr. Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, Mrs. Kelly suggested that the review uh, into the display of artefacts was very well advanced. 
I should say so, because the Speaker has published the outcome at 17 minutes past two. OK, very well. That's sufficient to say. And, uh, yes, Mr Alice, are you at a point of order? Yes, I, I trust that Mr O'Dowd will look up the dictionary definition of bigotry. You might say it applies to a T to Sinn Féin. Um, I s seriously think that you've probably repeated the claim there from earlier, but we leave those matters for the Speaker. OK, thank you. Members, just take their ease while we move to the next item of business, please. Members, Mr Colin McGrath has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clark, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health to provide an update on the actions his department will take to safeguard children and staff at care homes following the RQIA decision to deregister a centre run by Praxis Care after inspectors found significant shortcomings that place children and staff at risk. And I call the Minister of Health. Deputy Speaker, I am aware that the RQIA undertook an inspection of a children's service residential care home for children in January this year. The inspection findings are clearly very disturbing and found staffing deficits, which in their assessment compromised the provision of quality care for children with complex needs. South Eastern Trusts have fully engaged with Praxis Care and the RQIA to explore the challenges in the children's services and to provide the support necessary to ensure safe care. As an immediate and decisive response, the Trust redeployed statutory staff to address critical vac Apologies. to address critical vacancies within the care home to maintain service provision. The Trust developed a contingency plan to take ownership of the children's service, engaging families and the children to ensure transparency and to provide assurance that decisive action was being taken. The children's service is now registered with the appropriate Trust, and additional Trust staff have been redeployed to address deficits. To be clear, Deputy Speaker, the Trust have now taken full leadership, management and oversight responsibilities in the children's service and will continue to work with the RQIA to ensure this, that safe and quality care is delivered. Longer term, my officials are working with the Health and Social Care Board and all trusts to develop a framework to redesign services for children with disabilities and complex needs. Here, Sir Colin McGrath, Cash Brescia, or I call Colin McGrath for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have spent months and years in this place talking about the impact uh, of inadequate care in mother and baby units and other institutions that the state places children in the care of, and we have always referred to those in the past tense. Yet here we are in 2022, discussing a children's care home where the situation has deteriorated such that the Trust has had to step in and take over. Now, the root of the problem appears to have been staff shortages and staff inadequacies. And there is an inference, Minister, from the RQI statement that it is a result of these difficulties that the impact upon the care of some of the most vulnerable in our community. And I appreciate that we are having difficulties in many areas of the health service uh, with workforce challenges. But I would like to know, Minister, maybe when the Department first became aware of the problems that were being faced and how much intervention there was from the RQIA prior to the decision to deregister the home. I mean, Mr Deputy Speaker, surely the staffing issue did not occur overnight. Well, Meg, I, as I said in my opening statement, uh, the RQ undertook an inspection in January this year. Uh, they served a notice of intent in regards to February and have acted. I think, in, in a speedy way in regards to what work was immediately undertaken with the South Eastern Trust, acting immediately in regards to the provisions that they need to do. So I actually think it shows a proactive response from RQIA and the South Eastern Trust in regards to how quickly they mobilised to make sure that those children who did need that additional support were provided with it. 
Minister, supporting and keeping children safe is clearly an uh, absolutely paramount requirement for us all. I welcome the Trust stepping in to manage and deliver those key services. Have the Trust asked for or been given additional resources to take on the running of the care home? And could this open the way for other failing care homes to be rescued? Um, I, I think in regards to, to the point the members made, it was through the RQIAs and the South Eastern Trust interaction in regards to what needed to be done to address what RQIA had found in regards to those significant staffing defi deficits and not included staff competency, competency uh, in regards to the care that was being provided. Uh, RQIA had also concerns in regards to leadership and government st governance structures as well, which enacted uh, the requirement and the speed of the, the decision that was being taken. And the member will be aware of the other processes that are in place by RQIA and other trusts. At this point in time, the trust has not asked for additional resource been able to do this, uh, but they did mobilise their own staff as quickly as was needed to make sure that they were able to maintain safe staffing levels and the care of the residents was maximised at that point. I call Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers to the questions so far uh, on what is a very concerning subject. Um, I would like to ask the Minister what uh, engagement the Department or the RQIA have had with parents or next of kin of the children placed at risk from this centre to give reassurance and clarity around the situation. Um, and I think the member and that is, uh, I, I think, one of the, the main cruxes in this, and I actually did say in regards to my uh, initial answer to the question that there was engagement uh, not only with the, the parents in regards to the carers but also the children themselves and the indication of the engagement that RQIA actually does have not just following the inspection uh, and the decisions that were to be taken but also in regards uh, to what is required in an RQIA inspection where they do actually interact with the children and young people in regards to the support and the services that they are being provided and if it meets their needs as well. So there was an engagement by RQIA throughout the, the entirety of this process. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, um, I have to say I was shocked, but I wasn't necessarily surprised when I, when I saw the news this morning around this um, a, a form of accommodation. Minister, you'll recall I wrote to you not that long ago about a constituent of mine who has been had delayed discharge for several years now from the Ivy Centre and, and it cuts right across into the Nikki report on still waiting and the lack of appropriate care packages in the community for, for young people and an enduring um, concern we have in the Health Committee that a lot of these children will end up in adult services and then become institutionalised. What is the Department of Health doing about providing proper care for children in um, community settings? Thank you. Um, and I thank the member for her point. The member will be aware in regards to the children's homes regulations and for 2005 and actually the requirement from the Department of Health also published minimum standards for children's homes as well. Um, in regards to that, standard four uh, actually relates to safeguarding children and young people and the other work that needs to be done to make sure there is support for each individual and it's assessed as an individual's uh, an individual needing an individual care pathway as well. The member will also be aware that on the, the 21st of January I actually announced an independent review of children's social care services to take place. Uh, the review commenced in February. It has been led by Professor Ray Jones, uh, supported by an expert panel, and it is expected to take approximately 16 months in that regard. That review uh, will actually be fundamental to the examination of children's services, and that will focus on quality, equity, resilience and sustainability to ensure that uh, our services are capable to respond to the current and potential future demand and the level and com complexity of need and effectively meeting the needs of the children, the young people and families with a range of vulnerabilities and sufficiently and supportively engaging them in the decisions that affect their lives and adequately supporting staff and carers in the exercise of their statutory and other duties in the course of their caring responsibilities. So, as I have announced in regards even to the legislation that we enacted this morning, this is the start uh, of a process in regards to, and a lot of work has to be done in regards to how we make sure the issues that Mr McGrath mentioned do not happen again. The RQIA's intervention, inspection and the quick uh, action, I think, of the South Eastern Trust proves that we are in a very different place than we were when some of those inquiries initially took place.
I'll ask Hankolia, um, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, as we all know, protecting children in care is clearly the main aim of our social care services. And just with that in mind, I'm wondering if the Minister can confirm um, if there has been any safeguarding referrals as a result of this extraordinary action. Um, I'm not in a position to give an answer to that direct question at this moment in time, but I can follow up either with the member directly or through the Health Committee in regards to that specific issue. Uh, I thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker. A minister, like other members, I think the safeguarding of the children and young people is our priority. But also, Minister, I wonder, on reflection, are we paying the staff who are tasked to work in these care homes well enough, insofar as have they the right skills, talents and attributes uh, uh, to look after our most vulnerable, given that there will be, I am quite sure, a disparity in the pay scales between the third sector and the, uh, and the voluntary sector and community sector, charity sector, whatever you want to call it, and trusts. And I think the, the member, I think she does indicate a challenge that we have across uh, all our care sectors at this moment in time in regards to the support of the staff in it in regards to what they are being paid and, and the compensation that actually is there. And that's why, as part of that review, uh, actually into children's social care services that I have announced that has been undertaken by Professor Ray, Ray uh, Jones, will also look at that point as well, because we can't rely entirely on the third sector or the social sector to, to carry out this function. But it's also important why those services are inspected by the RQIA to make sure they are uh, serving at a standard that supports the people who are using their facilities. Uh, but also that the RQIA does act where it seems that action is needed, and I think in this case it has. Mayor Jerry Carroll, case to correct. Call Jerry Carroll. Thank you. Thank the member for uh, raising uh, the issue and thoughts are with the young people failed, obviously, and put at risk. Uh, Minister, practice stated that recruitment and retention of staff may have ex exacerbated some of these uh, inexcusable failures. What assessment has he and his team made that these services should not be supplied by charities, but by the state and the NHS to avoid a repeat of any of these cataclysmic mm -hmm. and uh, heartbreaking failures happening again? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the member, you know, and, and he and I have had the discussions in regards to what is a mixed economy in regards to our, our social care and our social provision, where we do rely on third sector providers, not just uh, those in the voluntary and community sector, but also in the private sector. Um, part of the remit uh, in regards to the review of adult social care is how we actually rebalance that in regards to how much uh, has actually been supplied by trusts versus what has actually been provided by the third uh, private sector and voluntary and community sector as well. I believe the trusts in the department should be doing more centrally, because I believe that's what our national health service is about, is actually providing a, a national health service at all points as well. But I know that's one of the points that the member and I agree on. And that concludes questions on the urgent oral. If members just take their ease while we move to the next item of business, please.
Members, um, the next item on the order paper is a motion to suspend Standing Order 42-1. Clark, would you please read the motion? That Standing Order 42-1 be suspended in respect of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill. And I call Chris Little to formally move the motion. Moved. Thank you. Uh, the Business Committee has agreed there should be no time limit on this debate. I call Chris Little, therefore, to open debate on the motion, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I will keep my comments brief, but I welcome the opportunity to move this motion to suspend Standing Order 42.1 in relation to the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill, as with this suspension it would give uh, this Assembly a genuine opportunity to pass a long overdue legislative reform that is commanding increasingly broad political and public support. Thank you. I can see him, Sir Sinead McLaughlin, Hon Kanchi. I call Sinead McLaughlin to speak. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. After the bill was introduced on the 17th of January, the committee resolved to do what it could to ensure passage by the end of the mandate. The committee agreed to invite the bill sponsor to meet with the committee, wrote to the business committee to urge early scheduling of remaining stages of the bill, and issued a call for views on the bill in advance of the formal committee stage. In this way, the committee had heard sufficient evidence by the time the second stage was complete to progress to an early conclusion of committee stage. The committee has indicated it, I will to ensure this bill progresses, and I am happy to support the motion. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I do not object to the content of this bill. I think it is long overdue. But I do object to the corruption of the processes of this House and of the Business Committee aiding and abetting that. This is last night with the same with another bill. Today it is this bill, and we have short, we've cut corners with all sorts of bills. And I do think that this House is doing itself no credit by playing fast and loose with its own standing orders and its own processes. And I do think that that is fundamentally wrong. And this is a bill that could have been brought a long time ago, I would expect. It's a necessary bill. You know, in my constituency, I have St. Louis Grammar School. They're presently advertising for a home economics teacher. And the application form talks about a community inspired by the Catholic faith, living out gospel values and reflecting all traditions of our Irish cultural heritage. What that has to do with home economics is clearly nothing, but yet it is a barrier to the employment of uh, some. Uh, and of course the bill in addressing that, insofar as it will, is necessary, but it, is, it should not have been necessary to corrupt the processes of this House. As no one else has indicated to speak, I call the bill... Oh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, yes, Ms Dodds. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, no, um, I rise again to support the principle of this bill, but um, again want to put on record my concerns um, around the process that this bill has taken. Um, I have spoken to the proposer of the bill at length, um, and while I agree that this is necessary and that the principle is necessary, it seems that we are now in this House giving accelerated passage to private members' bills. Um, and I have spoken at the um, at the second stage of this bill about some of the concerns around what this bill does do and what it actually does not do. So while it looks at the legal exemption from fair employment law, it, I will in, in, a, in a moment, of course I will, but in just a moment I just want to make this point. It looks at the exemption from fair employment law for teachers and that is a good thing because we should be employing people on the basis um, of equality and on the basis of their qualifications to actually teach a particular subject. But what it does not look at are the barriers to education and to employment in schools. And it does not look at the very important issue around ethos and how some schools uh, may or may not want to protect ethos. It also does not look at um, the issue around the certificate of education that is required.
for some CCMS schools. So while I think that this is a necessary bill, I'm happy to give support to the bill, I think that we have in many ways ignored the wider issues in dealing with the processes around the bill, and of course I will give way. Thank you very much. I want to thank the member from Upper Band for giving way to me. Um, as you know, I, I myself have a private member's bill going through, and would the member agree with me that that takes, for me, it's taken about 18 months of working and trying to get it here. The first three years that I came into the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, I wasn't allowed to come here or fulfil my role as an MLA for Lagan Valley. And at the end of it, because of the removal of, of our First Minister, um, I'm finding it difficult as well. But would the member agree with me that with the time that there is in order to move a private member's bill, 18 months to two years, is always going to congest near the aim? And like yourself, I am supportive of the member here who brings forward this bill or the proposal for this stage of this bill today. I hope you'll agree with me. Um, I, I, I do agree with you, in, and you make some very, very valid points. I suppose the the point of this bill is that I think that across the House there is support for the principle behind the bill and therefore it has been deemed to rush right to rush the stages of the bill. I do have a general concern, Mr Speaker, um, that we are now um, governing by private members' bills and um, that I think will be to the detriment of this House. And I think lack of scrutiny and consultation is to the detriment of this House and good legislation. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I don't have anyone else indicating they want to speak now, so I'll call the bill sponsor, Chris Little, to conclude and wind up debate on the motion. Please. Thank you, thank you Deputy Speaker. And I would like to thank the Executive Office Committee for its support for this motion. And I sincerely hope that it will present this Assembly with the opportunity to progress this important legislative reform. I acknowledge the contributions of Mr Alistair and my Education Committee colleague, Ms Dodds, who I have thoroughly enjoyed engaging with on a, a wide range of education-related issues in the, the time that we have spent on the Education Committee together. I can assure Mr Alistair and reassure Ms Dodds in no small part due to the proactive and extensive engagement and consultation of the TEO committee, that there has been no such corruption of due process for this four-clause bill, which I welcome now has increasingly broad public and political support, and I commend this motion to the House. Thank you. Thank you. And before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that this motion requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. I think, Mr Alistair, your dissent has been noted, and um, I, I feel that the, the motion has been carried. So, um, as there are ayes from all sides of the House, with uh, the exception of one dissenting voice, um, I am satisfied that cross-community support has, in fact, been demonstrated, and the motion is agreed. Okay. Right. Members, we now move to consideration stage of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill. And I call Mr Chris Little to move the bill, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I move that the consideration stage of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill be now taken. Thank you. Um, on the grouping of amendments, uh, members will have a copy of the marshalled list of amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. There is a single group with one amendment which deals with extension to commencement. I would remind members that once the debate on this group is completed, the questions on the amendment and clauses stand part will be taken at the appropriate points in the bill. If that is clear, we will now proceed. No amendments have been tabled to clause 1. The question is that clause 1 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Country no. The ayes have it. Clause 2 stand part 
No amendments have been tabled to Clause 2. The question is that Clause 2 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. <clears throat> we now come to the single group with one amendment for debate. I call the chairperson of the committee for the executive office, Ms. Sinead McLaughlin, to move amendment number one. I beg to move. Thank you. Okay. That's where it is. Um, do you want to continue, please, with the rest of your contribution? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise as chair of the committee of the executive office to move this amendment from the committee stage of the bill. I should say from the outset that everyone we heard from during the committee stage agreed that the exception for school teachers in the Fair Employment and Treatment Order should go. That is what we heard from stakeholders, the Department of Education, the education bodies. That is what we had from responses from the vast majority of respondents to our online call for views. The key questions raised were when. The main hesitation in removing the exception immediately was due to two main factors, providing time for conversations to take place as to how the ethos of a school can be maintained without the exemption in place, and two, allowing for the introduction of monitoring systems to be introduced and the related guidance to be drafted and issued. On the first issue, that of ethos, representatives from the Catholic school sector were very clear when they told the committee that they did not use the exception to maintain the ethos of their schools. Why then the need for any delay in removing the exception? Other stakeholders such as the Transfer Representatives Council, the Presbyterian Church and Church of Ireland felt the time was needed to have the conversations about the preservation of ethos. The committee is not insensitive at all to any of these views. There may be additional challenges to maintaining a non-denominational Christian ethos in controlled school without the cover of an exemption, especially when other stakeholders ask why there is a need for a Christian ethos at all in a school controlled by the state. The Department of Education felt that we had not given sufficient time for consultation with the various school sectors as to how the transition can be managed. This issue has been debated for many years, recent Assembly motions being in 2013, 2014 and in 2021. Why have these conversations not been taking place until now? The second rationale for delay is for the monitoring requirements under the 1998 order to be given time for schools to adjust. The Equality Commission recommended delay in the removal of the exemption on these grounds, as did the Department um, of Education. Again, the committee was responsive to this argument that a delay may be appropriate for the required systems and processes to be developed and for appropriate policy development and training to take place. It has been said that there were some members of the committee who felt that there should be no delay in removing the exemption whatsoever. Indeed, that the 12 months in the bill, as drafted, was indeed generous. At this point, I would like to put on record that the bill's sponsor has been extremely open and flexible in discussions around how long the exception should be delayed for. He is engaged with the Minister of Education to hear her concerns and has listened to the evidence from other stakeholders. The Department asked for at least 30 months, but did not give a rationale for that particular uh, figure. The Committee felt that a reasonable compromise would indeed be 24 months. This is therefore the recommendation of the committee that the provisions of the bill can be delayed up to 24 months, if not commenced sooner, by the Executive Office. At this point, I would like to put on record the committee's thanks to all those who responded to the call for views, whether by writing to the committee directly or through the online survey. I would like to thank the witnesses who gave evidence and for the open and frank conversations we were able to have with them in the committee on this matter. I would also like to thank the Assembly Research Service for giving the committee a thorough and detailed account of where the exception sits in the wider international context. I would also like to thank the sound advice from the Bill Office and from the Examiner of Statutory Rules on this Bill. 
I would also like to put uh, on record my thanks to the clerk and the team um, for, for moving forward with, with pace on this bill. Deputy Speaker, the Committee for the Executive Office seeks to amend the bill to come into force no later than 24 months after royal assent. I would now like to make some comments on, uh, in my capacity as SDLP MLA. My party was founded to pursue civil rights for all of our population. More than that, my party is also proud of its relationship with the trade union movement. For both of these reasons, the SDLP strongly supports this bill. We believe that religious discrimination is wrong and that we must move forward in a spirit of bringing our society together. Our party strongly believes in equal opportunities for workers. This bill is an important move forward in that regard. So I'm proud to be supporting this bill on behalf of my party. Thank you. I guess Nish Eremer Patchikin on Lord. I could just solid Osnium, just to remind members that what we're discussing isn't the merits and demerits of the bill. It's it's about the particular amendment which refers to twelve to fourteen. I realise people want to contextualise it, but just to make sure and have that focus, please. Okay, Gomeleskil of Orig Lanary. Um and I suppose set in the context this this is about the repeal. Uh, of the exemption from the fair employment legislation where schools can discriminate uh, when they're employing teachers. Uh, we don't know of any instance where it was actually used uh, and it's always been assumed that it was CCMS who really wanted this exemption uh, and they stated clearly in committee that they have never used it when it came to employing a teacher. Uh, so. That's the context, and, and the chair has uh, eloquently pointed out that uh, practically all the stakeholders the committee spoke to were in favour of the repeal of this uh, piece of legislation. Uh, uh, just coming on to the amendment, Akion Korla, um, the original bill, and I should thank the sponsor for bringing forward this bill. Uh, it's, it's, it's another important brick in the wall in terms of. Uh, normalising the society that we live in, um, that uh, the, the, the bill stipulated that it would be 12 months before commencement. Uh, the department were unhappy with that and wanted 30 months. Uh, but as the chair of the committee pointed out, after discussion going through our clause by clause uh, in committee last week, it was decided that the, the committee would compromise on 24 months. Uh, and we support that amendment. I now call Dianne Dodd. Thank you. Again, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to give uh, support uh, for the bill um, and to thank the sponsor of the bill um, for the work that has gone into this. Uh, in the previous debate, I have stated my concerns around the process, um, but I don't think anyone in this House um, is uh, in any doubt that this is um, both necessary um, and the right and proper course of action in this particular issue. Um, in terms of the amendment, um, as, as many have pointed out, um, the the department may have liked uh, longer um, to do this. But when we look at um, issues, sometimes um, creating the practical conditions for things to change does take a little bit of time. Um, and so that I am content with the 24 months uh, notice for the bill to come into effect. Although I do believe that many can, in effect, make this happen sooner um, by informally doing it as well. So um, I do support the bill um, and I hope that the 24 months can also be used to iron out some of the issues that were presented and the chair of the committee presented um, in her um, summary of the evidence that was given at committee where many people were worried about um, general Christian ethos and values that may um, that people would want to have an honest and transparent conversation around, um, and uh, where those um, also uh, commented 
on other barriers to fair employment that are not um, strictly related um, to the bill, such as the certificate and access to that certificate. So I would like those 24 months to be used positively in order to actually iron out some of those particular difficulties. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, we do support the bill. Thank you. Can we bring Kelly Armstrong on the screens, please? Thank you. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is my pleasure to speak on behalf of the Alliance Party to support our colleague Chris Little MLA's private member's bill, the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill. Mr Deputy Speaker, it appears the planets have aligned for this legislation. We are at the right time for the majority, if not all, to be in support of the removal of the re revocation of Article 71 from the Fair Employment Treatment Northern Ireland Order 1988. 98, sorry. Um, this simply means that all teachers will now be protected by the fair employment legislation, the same as all other employees. Mr Speaker, this issue has been considered for many years. And before I go on to speak to the amendment, um, this will be why I'm supporting the amendment. Um, the Equality Commission considered the removal of Article 71 way back in 2004, and then they felt that the exception should be retained for primary school teachers in Northern Ireland. It wasn't time then, but it is now. We only have to look at NASUWT website, that's the Teachers Union website, where they call for changes to equalities law in Northern Ireland to ensure no teacher can be discriminated against when applying for jobs, regardless of their religion. And even on the 24th of February, February, sorry, just earlier this year, the BBC education correspondent Robbie Meredith confirmed Bishop McKeown of CCMS said the exemption is no longer appropriate or required. I would like to thank the bill sponsor, Chris, for bringing forward this private member's bill to fix an issue that extends equality protections to our teachers. Thanks also to the Ed Executive Office Committee who worked with the bill sponsor to enable this bill to be able to come to the House for debate and progress. This is a short bill covering an issue that used to be controversial but thankfully is no more. Earlier today, the Agriculture Minister, speaking in place of the Minister for Education, spoke about the professionalism and excellent teachers we have in Northern Ireland. It is right then that we protect all those teachers by bringing their whole profession into the protection of fair employment legislation. And talking now about the amendment, the extension to 24 months enables all employing authorities and direct employing schools time to update their employment practices to ensure fair employment is in place. If you work out the timings, it means that the fair employment legislation will be required by about April 2024, in good time for appointments being made to fill teaching positions from August or September of 2024. It shouldn't be an onerous task for any employing authority or school, as fair employment has existed for all non-teaching rules and for all other employers since the FIDO legislation was enacted in 1998. The Alliance Party gives its full support to the progress of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill and that will at long last ensure teachers are all protected by the Fair Employment legislation. Thank you. And Jiglin, Daniel McCross on the Hoare Chair and Escaline lead the hall. Can we bring Daniel McCross on the, screen, the screens, please? He's gone. So. Therefore, um, I now call then the deputy chairperson, oh sorry, excuse me, the sponsor of the bill, Mr. Chris Little, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and, and thanks to all members that have contributed to the debate today. Um, can I? Thank the Speaker's Office and the Business Committee for scheduling the remaining stages of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill and giving us this opportunity uh, to, be, to debate the, the proposals. I set out to progress the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill to revoke Article 71 of the Fair Employment Treatment Order and to include teachers in fair employment protection because, in my assessment, it is an overdue legislative reform with increasingly broad public and political consensus. I think that assessment is bearing scrutiny now that we have reached consideration stage with a single substantive amendment to increase the deadline for manageable implementation of the bill 
from 12 to 24 months. This amendment proposed by the TEO Committee Chairperson Sinead McLaughlin, MLA, is the product of collective hard work and engagement between a wide range of people and stakeholders, but particularly the TEO Committee. I would like to thank the TEO Committee Chairperson Sinead McLaughlin, MLA, the Deputy Chairperson John Stewart, MLA, and all TEO Committee members and the TEO Committee Clerk team for their proactive consideration, evidence taking and scrutiny in relation to the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill at committee stage, which has allowed this important reform to proceed. I would also like to thank the Education Minister, the Department of Education officials and the Education Management and Sectoral Bodies for their engagement with the provisions of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill. Its testimony to the extent of this work that there does now appear to be an increasing consensus in support of the passage of this bill before the end of the mandate on this occasion at consideration stage on the grounds that it provides that manageable time for implementation. I am grateful for the amendment proposed by the TEU committee with cross-party consensus to extend the implementation time from 12 to 24 months, which I think achieves this objective and is fair and reasonable to all involved. There is no desire from any political party to place any undue burden on schools and teachers whom this bill is seeking to support, and I believe this amendment achieves the same. We owe so much to the teachers and schools that have shown such service and leadership to our community and the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill to include them in protection from religious discrimination on the grounds of their faith is a long overdue and small way in which we can show that support and gratitude to them. It is my intention to submit a minor non-substantive tidying amendment at further consideration stage before the deadline tomorrow. On those grounds, I am now more certain than ever that this Assembly can pass this pod positive legislative reform for fair employment for teachers into law before the end of the mandate next week. Deputy Speaker, before I close, could I also, um, it was remiss of me at the last stage not to, but can I thank Pat Catney as well for his support, um, despite not being a member of the, the TEO committee that has, has worked so hard on this bill. Um, thank Pat for his support and commend him in his efforts for his own private member's bill to provide free period products for all. I think the last few weeks have shown what the Assembly can achieve when we do work together collectively on, on small but significant legislative reforms that will mean a great deal to many people in our community. Thank you. I call the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee for the Executive Office, John Stewart, to end, please. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I am pleased on behalf of the Committee for the Executive Office to make a winding speech on the amendment. And I want to thank all members who have contributed for their participation today. I also want to thank those who have provided evidence to the Committee to inform today's debate. I thank the members for their support for this amendment, and I thank them in particular for bringing their perspectives to the debate. I acknowledge the concerns raised, and I hope these concerns will be allayed through the conversations that will take place over the two years following the Bill becoming law. The overriding interest to the committee is that teachers can apply to any school without prejudice or discrimination. The committee has also seen from the evidence that this can take place without any loss to ethos or to any, in any particular school. Ethos is something that is generated by governors, parents, teachers, non-teaching staff, students and the surrounding community, not by barring employment to anyone on the grounds of their religious convictions. Um, I want to thank again all members who spoke today, um, Deputy Speaker, and there was broad, um, agreement on the amendment across the board. And I'd just like to um, make a few comments as myself, as the Ulsterunist MLA, on the amendment itself. Um, first, I want to thank the Bill's um, sponsor again for bringing this here today and for his tenacity um, on this um, short but significant bill. And it does look now that it is set to pass um, by the end of next week, all being well. And uh, I want to thank all the members of the committee for, for their input into the amendment and discussions that we had last week. Um, I, I think probably originally I said that I would have been content with the 12 months um, as per the original drafting of the bill. But on the back of the evidence given by the Department of Education last week requesting 30, I thought 24 was a, probably a fair compromise um, and shouldn't be looked at to use the full 24. I think that there can be an optimistic and, um, approach to this to try and get done as quickly as possible to change any processes that are there. 
Um, but I, I think that is doable within the time frame. And just to say that the Ulster Unionist Party does support this important piece of legislation. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Amendment 1 has been proposed uh, to Clause 3, page 1, line 10, to leave out and insert words as printed on the marshalled list. The question is that Amendment 1 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clause 3 as amended. The question is that Clause 3 as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clause 4 stand part. No amendments have been tabled to Clause 4. The question is that Clause 4 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to the schedule. The question is that the schedule stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question is that the long title be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. That concludes the consideration stage of the Fair Employment School Teachers Bill. The bill now stands referred to the Speaker. Thank you. And remember, just take their ease when we move to the next item of business, please. Order members, the next item of business is a motion to annul a statutory rule. Clerk, please read the motion. That the Marriage, Civil Partnership and Civil Registration Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022, SR 2022-48 be annulled. Thank you. And I call Jim Allister to move the motion. Move. Thank you. The business committee has agreed that to allow one hour for this debate, with five minutes for all contributions. And I call Mr. Jim Allister to open the debate on the motion. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Two matters prompt the, this prayer of annulment, uh, and they are to focus attention on unnecessary squander and on the process followed in respect of this um, particular statutory instrument. This statutory instrument provides a facility for someone to record their marriage details uh, in Irish. Uh, but to start with the process, astoundingly, when the Finance Committee looked at this statutory instrument and called evidence on it, we discovered that before the statutory instrument was ever brought to the committee, before it was ever made, the Department of Finance 
decided to spend £261,000 to upgrade an IT system to facilitate this and presumed, and that's the point about process, presumed the support of the committee and of the Assembly to <laughs> retrospectively put in place that upon which they had already spent £261,000. £261,000, Deputy Speaker, would employ eight nurses for a year. But the Registrar thought it appropriate to spend that extravagant amount of money on this before ever bringing any proposal next or near the committee. That prompted the next important question of the Registrar. What was the demonstrable demand for this facility? And here the story gets even more astounding, because the answer was, we've had one or two calls a month. One or two calls a month asking for this facility. So the average of that might be 18 people a year asking for the facility to record marriage details in Irish. And in response of that, it was thought appropriate to spend over a quarter of a million pounds. Today at lunchtime I attended with others the Cancer Project uh, meeting. There is a worthy cause crying out for funds. But this House, this Department, thinks it more important to squander £261,000 to meet the needs of 18 people a year. I will. I thank the member for giving way. But at that same committee, does the member agree with me that she herself may have said 18 people, but there was no uh, correspondence from her or at the committee how many people want that? And when that money was given, uh, or how she tried to explain it, that was forward planning. And that money that was spent was just not for the Irish language, but also for to update that which was written in English. The members, next a minute. Respect, respect, that's incorrect. She said it was for, to facilitate the, the Irish aspect. But she did very importantly say, yes, there was no other evidence of demand. 18 people on average was the sum total of demand. And this is for one selected group alone. It is only for Irish speakers. We have tens of thousands of people in this province who speak Polish as their first and native language. There is no such facility for them. We have thousands of people who speak Lithuanian and all sorts of Eastern European, and we might shortly have a lot of people who speak Ukrainian. But these regulations apply only to the special ones, only to those who speak Irish. And of course, the greater number of them, I'm quite sure, already speak English. So that is the context of Mr. Wells and I bringing this matter to this House so that it could have the focus of public attention. It's not that I suspect this House will be in the least worried about squandering £261,000. They've poured a lot more than that down the drain over the years. Uh, but it is about putting a focus on wanton squander, unnecessary, selective for one community and one community only when there are crying out needs in this community for expenditure on real needs, not these pet project needs, not these ego stroking needs, on real needs. And that's the point of this prayer. I call Keith Buchanan, the Deputy Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would like to thank the mover of the motion for setting out the background to his objection to the statute rule, which relates to marriage, civil partnership, and civil registration. The committee considered the rule on the 17th of November 2021 and again on the 23rd of February 2022. The committee divided on both occasions and agreed, following those divisions, to support the rule. 
Members were advised that the rule flows from previous political agreements around the option to register future key life events in Irish or in Irish and English. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think members were a bit surprised that the necessary software changes had been undertaken. I repeat, had been undertaken apparently prior to the rule being laid in the Assembly. I think members were also surprised at the cost which is given as 261,000, as the previous member had said. My understanding is that there was no related ministerial direction and that officials undertook this change under their own authority in contemplation of this legislation. Mr Deputy Speaker, I expect there to be a division today on this debate, no doubt. I hope in his response, or sorry, in her response, I must apologise uh, to the Minister, might clarify if it is usual for officials to undertake changes which require legislation prior to the passage of that legislation. Perhaps she may might always might also comment on the costs related to it. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will now speak as a member of the DUP and a member of the Finance Committee. I and my party share concerns about the timing and framing of these regulations. Currently, registrations of births and deaths can only take place in English for both the headings and the content. We must remember the full cultural package as agreed in New Decade New Approach has not been published, let alone subject to democratic scrutiny. For us to press ahead with these reforms is, in our view, not keeping with the spirit of what was agreed in New Decade New Approach. It is wrong that unionism should be expected to comply to language demands of Sinn Féin. We cannot facilitate a cherry-picking of the agreement when elements that are precious to my community have largely fallen by the wayside. Sinn Féin's disrespect agenda should not be ignored or rewarded in this House. They could not tolerate a commemorative stone at Parliament buildings or the planting of a rose bush to mark the first 100 years of Northern Ireland. The Minister for Communities provided no funding to mark the centenary, and Sinn Féin blocked the lighting up of Parliament buildings and City Hall to mark the centenary. The same party had to be forced into a major U-turn on punitive decisions relating to subsidy of funding. They also had to be forced to have a modest plan to mark Her Majesty the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. There is an important and distinctive distinction between allowing individuals to register life events through Irish and in Irish. New Decade New Approach does not bind this Assembly to facilitating the content of registrations to be published in Irish or bilingual formats. This must continue to be in English. Checks and balances must be included in legislation to, to ensure this principle is respected and any revision restricted to the headings of the relevant forms. In this context, it is notable that new registration forms contained in these regulations do not seem to explicitly state that, they, that data must be entered in English. This raises the question of whether there will be, need to be dedicated translation or interpretation uh, function within registry offices. If this is the case, there has already been confusion around the financial implications of these changes. The explanatory memorandum talks about no or negligible deductible costs, but the committee received separate evidence of at least a one-off capital bill of £261,000. Today, I and my party will therefore be supporting this pair of annulment. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Aisling Riley. Current Falcha, Riven J. Slorchenu, a Kahimera, a Spor Manara, Gagahime Shasu and Shaw, Sablin Gavila, a Sviadol, a Lorcher, Karta Changa, a Goharia, Karta Changa Gilgory. I welcome the opportunity to speak today, but I have to say it is an absolute disgrace that I must stand in this Assembly in 2022 to defend basic rights for Irish language speakers against a type of prejudice, intolerance, and disrespect, which is an unfortunate feature in the contributions of a small and unrepresentative number of members. In a week where the entire world is celebrating the rich Irish culture, language, heritage for Lana Fela Podrick, St Patrick's Day, here we are witnessing the backward, uninformed and disgraceful anti-Irish attitudes of some members. I am an Irish speaker, proud of it, raised with Irish, the native language of this country as my first language. I was educated entirely through Irish medium education. I and other Irish speakers are fully entitled to use our language and to be equally and to equality of treatment in doing just that. In a few days from now, and if you, uh, you've had your time, I don't think you need to be given the stage for any more. In a few days from now, the clocks go forward. Hopefully the two gyms will take that on board and reset their clocks from, 19, from 1690, 1921, or whatever unionist heyday they still bizarrely want us all to live in. Because the days of Gale Gores and others being treated as second-class citizens are gone forever. There will be no return to the failures, the disrespect and the abuses of the past. 
Society is moving on. Try to keep up. I call Matthew O'Toole. Pardon me, I've got last can call you. I don't often start my remarks uh, as Gwaelga in this chamber, but I'm going to do it today for obvious reasons, for very important reasons that I'll set out. I can't believe we're debating this motion today, or perhaps I can. Perhaps it's all too believable that in 2022 we're debating a motion as preposterous and disgraceful as this one. Uh, next year, unfortunately, I'm going to turn 40, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So either I am now or will very soon be a middle-aged man. I was in my teenage years, just barely in my teenage years, when the Good Friday Agreement was signed. That was nearly a quarter of a century ago, and it enshrined the importance of Irish language and culture, and indeed uh, Ulster Scots. For that reason, I genuinely find it impossible to believe that 25 years on, we're still having debates like this one, still having debates not about an Irish Language Act, which we should be debating in this chamber, not about an Irish Language Act, Mr Deputy Speaker, but about a very small, modest piece of regulation, the Marriage, Civil Partnership and Civil Registration Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022, which went through the Finance Committee, which I sit on with the two Jims, the Waldorf and Statler of the Northern Ireland Assembly, who have uh, introduced today's uh, motion. It went through in November. We're now uh, days away from the end of this mandate. We are debating the, um, this, uh, the annulment of this regulation. Um, let's look at the background to this. This does not mandate that people can uh, do, um, go through all of the processes that they uh, want to, ask Gwelga. Um, all it means is that uh, forms for registering a marriage, a civil partnership, a birth or a death can be produced either in English, in English and Irish, or indeed in the Irish language. The original forms themselves, which have to be filled out, mind you, still have to be filled out in English, Mr Deputy Speaker. It just means that uh, they can be produced, and people who are uh, either uh, Irish speakers themselves or treasure the Irish language can have those forms produced in them. A modest, very modest step forward in this place. And to quote uh, from the document, whatever has been said about the cost, a relatively modest cost, let's, let, let's, let's be honest, in, in terms of the software, uh, the Department is quite clear in relation to the operation. I won't give away because you've had long enough, I'm afraid, um, uh, Mr Buchanan. Uh, give us one second. Give us one second. I hear the, the proposer of the motion heckling from behind me. Um, it says there are no additional costs associated with the operation of this rule. No additional costs associated with the operation of this rule. This is a modest step forward. But the two gyms whom, with whom I'm sat on the Finance Committee for the past two years have decided days away from an election to, um, to make hay with it. And in many ways, it's sad, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because I've sat with both Jim Allister and Jim Wells on the Finance Committee for the past two years. And while I share very little in common with them politically, actually, we've often worked together constructively. They're both intelligent, shrewd men. They both know what they're doing. Often, we've interrogated the Finance Department and spending in this place in a constructive way together. But it really is sad the two serious, intelligent men for decades now have, have, divide, have devoted their politics to this kind of stuff, the politics of division, a Paisleyite provocation of trying to divide us. And do you know what? The Irish language is for all of us, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's for everybody on this island, everybody in, in Northern Ireland, whatever our background. And I say that as someone who didn't do enough Irish in school. I finished early. I, I, so, you know, I, I want to rediscover the Irish language, but I'm not a I can't claim to be a fluent Gwaelgor. I can't at all. But I, this motion matters to me. Looking forward, those of us who have a constitutional aspiration in this place are going to have to get real about the offer that we're making. Those of us who aspire to United or New Ireland are going to have to explain to people about how our new constitutional proposition will not just tolerate Britishness in our New Ireland, particularly the Britishness of this part of the island of Ireland, but how we will treasure it and celebrate it and those who want to make an argument, and a couple of them are heckling behind me, for Northern Ireland remaining in the United Kingdom, and that is a perfectly um, legitimate uh, and noble aim for them to argue. But those who want to argue that will have to demonstrate how they will treasure Irishness in this jurisdiction. I'm afraid it didn't always happen in the past. And I hope that some of those across the chamber who take a slightly more constructive approach to making those arguments will see, what this, will see this motion for what it is, 
which is an attempt to divide people and drag us down into a dark past. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I now represent South Belfast, a gloriously Member diverse constituency. I'm close. drawing my remarks to a close, but I come from Downpatrick. And in the Church of Ireland Cathedral in Downpatrick, on the week of La Fela Porig, St. Patrick is buried. It's a Protestant cathedral. And that kind of diversity is what makes this place special. It's what makes this island special. The members Richness, time diversity does not take away from us. It adds the, to us. I only the members wish time the people who propose this motion or could see that. Thank you. I call Robbie Butler. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and after the member from South Belfast, uh, he sort of teed me up rightly. I am going to bring a slightly different tone to this debate so far. To be fair to Mr Alistair, he has been consistent for many years with regard to scrutiny on these items, whether it is Irish language or whether it is finance. I can't say the same for the party to the left of me, because uh, when we know about when we, when we discussed NDNI when we were in those talks, there were two parties which discussed and designed the, the Cultural Act and Languages Act, which we never got to see, and they seem to equivocate whenever... No, it is okay. I am not bothering this. I will just, I'll just go through with, with, the, with the manner that we have been doing uh, and not taking interventions. Um, we will actually... Uh, not be supporting the annulment today. But what I want to say to Sinn Féin is this, and the member from West Belfast talked about it. You might have hijacked the language, as some people say, but also what we've seen over St. Patrick's Day celebrations in America actually makes me deeply uneasy. I see Sinn Féin trying to hijack what is, should be one of the most important days for all of us on this island, whether you're from Northern Ireland or Ireland. And the politicisation of St. Patrick's Day makes me cold. Absolutely makes me cold. Uh, Mr. Speaker, firstly, let me be clear that the UP is not against the provision of documentation of marriage, civil partnership and civil registration certificates in Irish, or indeed any of the predominant languages in Northern Ireland. The Ulster Unionist Party would wish that all certificates could be available in Ulster Scots, Irish or any of the many languages that we have in Northern Ireland. This will reflect a welcoming, diverse and vibrant, vibrant multi-ethnic community. All certificates should, of course, be bilingual, with English to aid identification and access to services across our nation, be that nationally at the United Kingdom level or indeed in Scotland, Wales or in England being available in English. We'll also aid travel and identity documentation, especially in places like North America and many other Western countries. However, Mr Speaker, a worrying development occurred during the gathering of evidence on this rule, and it transpires that an IT system for the translation of documents has been purchased for the sum of £261,000. This should rightly be a matter of concern, especially as it is hard to see how this re represents good value for money. Members may consider if the Audit Office should, uh, however, investigate this as, a, as an urgency, how a contract was let for 261,000 for this service to BT before legislation was even discussed, never mind passed, and whether this represents good or indeed value for money, if any. It must be a matter of considerable, considerable concern to this Assembly that sums <coughs> such as this have been spent without adequate scrutiny or indeed in view of the, the controversy that BT has been involved with on a number of occasions without informing the Finance Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr um, Deputy Speaker. I don't intend to give this ludicrous attempt um, to overturn perfectly sensible regulations more time than it is due, and that is very, very little. To those who somehow feel threatened by other people simply placing the headings of their marriage or civil registration in the Irish language or in Irish and English, I simply have to say to them that they are embarrassing themselves. Last week I spoke at a Queen's University event on Irish language along with Pat Sheehan, and I said at that event that I don't speak a word of Irish, but I cherish the language. Uh, and I think that um, the member for North Antrim knows full well why we would um, prioritise Irish language over the likes of Polish and Lithuanian, and that's because it's a, a language indigenous to this island. Mr um, Deputy Speaker, I will say that I am delighted by any step that enables people to see and sense their culture, heritage and language reflected in options available available to them, especially in public services. Far from threatening anyone, this is a perfectly normal means of managing and respecting a diverse society. I like living in such a diverse society. It is for others to explain what they are trying um, to achieve by intentionally stepping into other people's business. And remember, this is what they are doing for the sole purposes of promoting bitterness and rancour. I will also say that the members who brought this motion, of all the motions they could have brought, in the face of huge cost of living crisis, an ongoing pandemic and a health service in desperate need of reform, need to reconsider their priorities and ask themselves... Yes, I will. The member not think there could not be a more apt time to complain about squander than at a time when vital public money is needed in so much more deserving causes? Members, next minute. Thank you. Uh, 
I think that um, the member for Lagan Valley fairly addressed that, that issue in terms of what the actual money was spent on. It was, it was broader than what this motion would imply today. Um, I, I think that the two members who brought this motion need to reconsider their priorities and ask themselves what they are trying to achieve in a society in which uh, we are all now minorities. The diversity of Northern Ireland is something I cherish and that we should all cherish. I am here to help that diverse society grow stronger. We have serious work to be getting on with. In that context, this motion is nothing but another embarrassment. Thank you. I call Karen McKillen. And like my colleague Aisling Riley, we, we will be voting against this ridiculous motion. Actually, when I seen it in the order paper, um, and I don't sit on the finance committee, um, so I, I went and looked at the committee. I went and looked back, and I have to say, um, I wasn't shocked at the behaviour of the two gyms. Um, they have been described as two characters from the Muppets. Um, however, uh, I, I, I have to say, anybody watching that, the full outrage, about £261,000, where was the outrage when the Department for the Economy incentivised people financially to burn public money? Order, was order, there outrage there? Order, order. Could I ask the member to make her comments through the speaker so that everything is picked up with the microphone? Okay. Um, so, was there was there outrage there? Yes, surely. Anyone was more vigorous in exposing and opposing the RHI matter than I was in this house and elsewhere. So, I would invite the, the member to reflect on her swear in that regard. The member's extra minute. Sa thank you for the extra minute. Um, so, in, in relation in relation to, so I did watch the committee, and I watched every member who were completely appalled by what they were seeing and what they were hearing. Um, it was very clear to me that an official with the status of being able to write business cases and make decisions made a decision in line with NDNA. That is completely um, in keeping with anyone's job in, of that grade. That is a completely appropriate use of public money. No. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> I thank the member for giving way. And uh, 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 on order, in order, committee, order. In, in that committee, Mr. Deputy Chair, uh, the official stated that it was within her capacity in order to spend that money. And that's just to reinforce what the member from North Belfast has just stated. And thank you for giving way. Just to clarify that point as well. Thank you, Pat. I'm sorry for confusing you with Jim Wilde. So I want to put that on the record. Okay, so to bro nor inflation. So, um, but listen, um, the member from North Antrim may be right in terms of what he describes as his figures. That's fine. I mean, the public record is a public record, but the public record in this place, when it comes to Irish language, is nothing but disgraceful for the members opposite. Absolutely nothing but disgraceful. It's sectarian. It's racist. It's bigoted. Shane, that's what it is. Don't try and twist this concern around 260, no, 261,000 pounds. And Robbie Tanara Art, you need to be embarrassed trying to blame Sinn Féin on what other people may do, thousands of miles across the Atlantic. No, I won't give way. I won't give way. I normally would give way to you, but I've heard enough. The issue, the issue at hand here is. Toge August Chucky Shade. You build it and they will come. Now, I didn't hear, I heard the term about burning public money from Jim Wales. I didn't hear anything around the cost that is around each department, the fact that there's no executive been able to make a decision on three hundred million pounds. Not one word. Not one word that we hear about hospital waiting lists about the £184 million pounds that will be spent on a cancer strategy. Nothing. Not one word about the growing mental health crisis, let alone the cost of living crisis. Not one word from the members who brought this prior annulment, which, by the way, they are perfectly entitled to. Had the, had the order, order, order. 
I again ask the member to address the chair and had, not to address individual members. Please had do, they chair. brought the power of annulment around something that caused an inequality in the way that Chris and Sinead spoke about in terms of the Fido bill, then I could have appreciated it. But no, they, they want to try and ensure that anyone who is a Gale Gore who wants to use public services as ratepayers will be discriminated, will be offended. This is nothing short of sectarianism, it's racist and it's bigoted. And anybody who votes for this today is bigoted. Shane Gormagov. I call Patsy McGlone. Gormagov, can I call you? I'm going to be a little bit of a little bit of a little I'll speak both in Irish and English. Um, I'm really shocked to be here today talking about this. Really, really shocked. And it's going to be a smell. I guess Cos Lashling and Shin. It's this more them, Lord Chaskiliga, uh change him McCree, Rehan Shilum, I guess Fos Clinche, Nasulia de Gini. Um I really love speaking Irish. And for those who don't have any Irish, try it. It opens a brand new world to you, an absolutely brand new world. It explains the environment that you live in, those place names, it explains people's history, it brings one thing understanding. Tigville. I made a couple of vocal I guess a couple of ta kovas on. What does kovas mean in Irish? Mutual respect. Ulrich is culture, cultural diversity. Now, anybody that seriously stands up and opposes those two things in a society where we are coming together over a very, very, very bad period of time when people were being slaughtered on our streets, and if people haven't learnt the lessons, that if you don't have respect for your neighbour, Mullawala Masya Nugget, Er the Korsni, Neil Ainrud Tikiogat. If you don't have respect for your neighbour, you have learnt nothing, you have understood nothing. I want to see a society where people of a British background are accommodated. I equally, as an Irish person, want to see my identity accommodated and recognised formally. I guess Shinanfall Shinan Fagwal Akilligadio. That's why an Irish Language Act is needed. But if we're to truly, truly work our way forward to a society which is open, which is rich, which is diverse, which accommodates one with the other and truly respects each other's identities and the diversity that that brings in a very positive and enriching way, this sort of stuff is not the way to go, guys. If you want to make progress, you don't do it by driving a car by looking in the rearview mirror. No, that's not going to work out. That's not going to work out. Because eventually we will come to a day when we will be looking at a new Ireland. And in that new Ireland, I will surely be the first to champion my Irish identity, but equally to champion that measures be introduced to accommodate people of a British identity. Shin Kovas, Shin Ulrichus Kulter. That is mutual respect, that is cultural diversity. And I seriously can't get it why people are so opposed to people going in, getting married, and getting that certified as Gaelic. Must me and Loy, if they so wish. I really don't get it. Seriously, guys, get a grip. Think of the future, not of what past you're harking back to, because that ain't going to go anywhere. Gurmina Maga de Las Kion Kolya. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't uh, going to speak, but uh, I think I had to. It's pretty absurd, ac actually, speaking on this issue. To be frank, the fact that we're discussing this in a context where we have a cost of living crisis, workers are having their wages cut, uh, and uh, people will be asking seriously. The assembly spent whatever it was uh, talking about this uh, prayer of annulment. I think to pick this issue, um, to highlight and have a debate on it, is a blatant attempt to shift politics generally and elections uh, to the right. And I think disgracefully with the DUP response, uh, the member may have got what he wanted here today. We're talking about an amendment to a form. What an embarrassment that people have caused such outrage, uh, so much bluster around that basic uh, point. I say more Irish language, gak gach, all over the place. Uh, and for those people who claim to talk about having concern about a ghettoisation of a language, well, we see how ridiculous that comment is, because this would be open to everybody to use, and there's still opposition 
to it. So people shouldn't be asked, in my view, um, Deputy Speaker, to um, keep their head down, uh, head down or keep their Irish queuing. Uh, like I said, m- more of it. Name my leafa, time make for them, a couple of plain. Um, but I had a son four months ago, and I would have liked the option to register him uh, in Irish. He's an Irish name. I hope his kid Changa will be Irish. That is the aim uh, of me and his mother. Um, so the fact that people can't, the fact there's an attempt to stir up hatred in, in, in all reality around this issue is quite disgraceful, despicable, uh, and that do, it doesn't fill me with despair. It fills me with anger, and it should be robustly challenged and called out. So I will be voting against this uh, disgraceful permanent today. Thank you, Kermit. I now call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargey, who uh, is going to respond on behalf of the Minister of Finance. And you have five minutes. Yeah, thanks very much, and just welcome the opportunity to respond to members' comments in relation to the Marriage, Civil Partnership and Civil Registration Amendment regulations on behalf of my ministerial colleague, uh, Conor Murphy. You will be aware that the new decade new approach deal included a commitment to make any necessary statutory provisions for births, marriages and deaths to be registrable in Irish. The option for the registration in Irish has also been taken forward to include stillbirths, civil partnerships and the conversion of civil partnerships to marriages and vice versa. These regulations are a first step in a phased approach towards taking the the NDNA commitment forward and enabling people to access public services through their chosen language, whether that be English, Irish or both. At present, under the existing legislation, it is only possible for certificates to be produced in English, although the content can include Irish names or street addresses. These new regulations are aimed at providing the public with more choice in respect of the registration of a life event. They will enable certificates produced from a new registration to contain headings in English, Irish or bilingual of having both. And from the introduction of the legislation on the 11th of March, a person attending to register a life event has been provided with a language choice. They can select English, Irish or bilingual of English and Irish, and this has enabled certificates to be produced with headings in the selected language. Once a registration has completed, all certificates from that date onwards are produced with the headings in the language selected at point of registration, and this cannot be changed. I would ask members to support the introduction of the legislation. It will introduce choice, choice that an individual or a couple can choose, either that be Irish, bilingual or English, at the point of registration. It will enable them to obtain a certificate with the headings in Irish or a combination of the two with a bilingual English um, and Irish version. It does not change the current position for those members of society who wish to continue to obtain a life event certificate in in English, because this is primarily about the choice of individuals out there within our communities. And I think it is important just to add in terms of the whole issue around cost, and I know there was some allusion to an ongoing cost around the introduction of this. The initial cost was to put the necessary system in place in order to produce their certificates. There will be no additional costs going forward in the production of the certificates, but this piece of legislation will very much bring huge social value and impact for Irish language speakers, and particularly for those who would like this done in Irish or through bilingual means. And I think just... Yes, of course. I advise the House, because we didn't get this information at the committee. What is the limit of a civil servant, such as the lady involved here, as to the amount of expenditure they, of their own volition, can, improve, can approve? The Minister, next to minute. Well, I don't know what the fixation is around an individual staff member, um, and I find it a bit concerning, not just obviously here, but also at the committee. The reality is that this is a new decade, new approach commitment. Um, Officials um, had got to work to take forward that commitment, which got these institutions re-established again. And indeed, we know that in the last two days of applications being opened, that it exceeded even the figure that the member had given in terms of those who are wishing um, to have their certificates and those life events registered in either Irish or in bilingual. 
And just as I'm sitting reflecting, I mean, I suppose this is an interest to me because I cover languages within my own department. I sat with the Irish language community and the Ulster Scots community a few weeks ago in terms of progressing the expert panel reports and developing strategies. I was also a councillor in Belfast City Council, indeed, where people would go in to register these life events. And indeed, they made moves a number of years ago to have bilingual, bilingual Christmas signage on the front of that building. And again, the same arguments were used around cost, around dissatisfaction. The signs went up, and guess what? Nobody batted an eyelid. The sky didn't fall in. People got on with their business, and they continue to use that building on a day and daily basis for the business that they need to engage the council with. I think in terms of the motivation, I think the motivation around this motion is clear, that those whose argument is to attempt to pit rights against each other, the real motivation is about denying rights. And the clear reality is that this is the first step in making a new decade, new approach commitment, which parties agreed to in terms of the re-establishment of these institutions. This helps fulfil our responsibilities under the European Charter for regional and minority languages. And importantly, this is a step uh, towards equality for all of our citizens. I now call on Jim Wells to conclude and wind up the debate in your five minutes. Hey, Mr Deputy Speaker, there has been much reference this afternoon to New Decade, New Approach. Documents signed over two years ago. And what unionists are noting is that various departments are dipping into the 50-odd recommendations, picking out those that are obviously cherished by nationalists and implementing them, and quietly forgetting the recommendations which certainly will. What ones are you suggesting are being ignored? Members, next a minute. Where are the extra PSNI officers that were promised as part of that deal? And where, 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 where has been the efforts to deal? Would the member also recognise that it's not just nationalists who support and stand for Irish language rights, uh, liberals, centre ground, socialists, and people on the left, as well as people from the nationalist community background? We take that point on board. So is that why 99.3% of those who attend Irish medium uh, schools are from the nationalist community? That's how cross-community that is. Now, Mr. Mr. Peter, we, we, no, I, I have been very generous. I have been very generous, and I don't particularly like the honourable member. So, no thanks. Now, Mr. Mr. Uh, De Deputy Speaker, Deputy Speaker, or, or, order, order, members. I would ask you to simmer down and come back to the debate. Right, Mr. Wells, you have the floor. So, so therefore, we don't have the extra place. Where is the uh, addressing of the educational underachievement of Protestant working-class communities in Northern Ireland? Where, where, is, where is that? Yet, a, a, an official from the Department of Finance took it upon herself to dip into that agreement and pull out a cherry for Republicans called this, the Civil Partnership Registration. It's order, order. Point, point of order. I think it's hugely inappropriate for a member of this House to target um, civil servant and staff within departments. Um, I think there has to be things around employment law and rights for staff that work within our departments that are implementing a legally binding agreement and they're working on behalf of the minister in said department. And I just think that those comments need to be withdrawn. Long wait. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order. I do not believe that that is a point of order. However, I would say to members, all members, that it is not an order for members to make offensive remarks about each other. So I would ask members to continue with a civilised debate. Mr Wells. For a senior civil servant to dip into the uh, new decade new approach and produce a rabbit out of the hat to assuage nationalism. Meanwhile, many of the demands in that balanced package for unionism have been totally ignored. The other issue that has not been addressed this afternoon is the spend expenditure of £261,000 so that a very small, sorry, I wish I could, but I've only five minutes, that a very small number of 
Irish language zealots can go in and register their marriage or their civil partnership in Irish or in dual language. 261,000. Did anybody stop to think, was there a more cost-effective way of doing that? Would it have been cheaper? Would it have been cheaper to have hired a member of staff to come in once a month to actually physically manually type out the certificates for the tiny number of people that actually want this to happen? 261,000. Was there any form of procurement? Was there any form of tender exercise? Or did the company, and we all know who the company is, just ask, think of a figure, go in there and spend whatever you like to produce this particular change in registration? It just doesn't bear, bear sense. As the Honourable Member for North Antrim has said, that's the price of eight nurses. Today we attended an event here about the need for cancer nurses. There's a demand for a need for a hundred extra cancer nurses. This would have, uh, order, uh, order, uh, order, 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 members. It is not an order to comment from a sedentary position. Mr. Wells. I will give way to Mrs. Bailey. I want to go back to the opening statements by, made by um, Mr. Alistair, calling this unnecessary squander, this £261,000 that was spent. But surely, if you're calling for us to annul the SR now, is that not further squander that you're calling for us to do? And if it's a case of just 18 people having registered, well, let me tell you, I don't speak Irish, but when I did go to an integrated school, I learned that my name, I did do Irish, and my name in Irish is Claire Navalia. So if it's numbers up that you want, I'd be more than willing to now, listening to this debate, get down to Belfast City Hall, where I was registered, and register myself in, in, in Irish, therefore making it 19, and I'm sure there would be queues of more people to do the same. The, the, the element. The members made the point for me because the official came to the committee and made it absolutely clear that £261,000 had been spent already. It was farcical to come before either the Finance Committee or the Assembly because the money had been sent, the processes had been set up. Now, if we're going to have any meaningful scrutiny role in this Assembly, we can't have a situation where we're handed a done deal on a plate and told, we've spent the money, you have to accept it. Now, the question people have to ask, no, look, I, if I wish I had an hour, the, the point I would like to make is the, honor, the members on this side of the House have to ask themselves, why do the unionist community are they so suspicious of the Irish language? Why do we have a problem with the Irish language? Why, why is it not that we're, order, we're, order, we're members. all perfectly happy with the genuine expression of people's culture? That's fine. But when the language has been so cynically used by militant republicanism, then unionism gets, has difficulties. Why, for instance, in areas there are no, no translations of the word United Kingdom, Londonderry, Northern Ireland, or Her Majesty the Queen? But why, oh why, are there Irish translations of the occupied six counties, the North and the British state? Because the language is being abused. Uh, order, point of order, Mr. McGloom. Correct. Yeah. Mr. Wells, there it's real, ain't yeah. Just do you want to practice? <laughs> I knew what the honourable member was saying. <laughs> but once Clearly, the member knew that that was not a point of order, but his view is on the record. <laughs> Mr. Wells, if if they want the unionist community to accept the Irish language as a genuine cultural expression, then get rid of the political baggage, get rid of the extremism and stop using the Irish language as a political weapon to try and substitute unionism. Only when that happens, and only when the Irish language fraternity totally disassociates itself with militant republicanism, republicanism, will unionists accept the Irish language as a general cultural expression. Order members, the question is that the motion standing in the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. No. All those in favour say aye. aye. Clear, clear the lobbies. I think we're going to have a vote. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. And I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come into the chamber.
Order, order members, would members resume their seat, please? Order. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. No. No. Do we have tellers? Order members, order. The following tellers have been appointed. Tellers for the eyes, Jim Allister and Jim Wells. Tellers for the nose, Karen McKillen and Paula Bradshaw. I again remind you, uh, as the Assembly devised, as per standing order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person uh, and should not enter the lobbies. I remind members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place and that they should maintain a one-metre gap between you and other people when moving around the chamber rotunda and especially in the lobbies. And again, be patient. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors. Order members, would members resume their seat, please? Order. Uh, Clark, please read the result. 87 members voted, 29 members voted aye, 58 members voted no. The motion is negatived. The motion is negative. The motion is negative. Unfasten the doors. Uh, point of order, first, Carnegie. Sort of raised previously, but I do. Would, I would ask the Speaker's Office to look at the Hansard of today's debate. Firstly, I think it's completely inappropriate for a member of this Legislative Assembly to accuse the Senior Civil Service of a dipping into a budget that has specific connotations. So I would ask that. The second point of order, and still in relation to the member's comments, is I think it is inappropriate all the time to say what you feel. You know, so calling someone names in that context not only was churlish, but it was un unbefitting. So I would ask that those um, two points of order are looked at at, at, at the end of the day's Hansard Gormangov. I, I would take this opportunity to draw all members to the Assembly publication Rules of Behaviour and Courtesies in the House, and in particular paragraph 14, Standards of Debate. Now, uh, we've all been here for some time now, and we're coming to the end of this Assembly, and you ought to know the standards of debate. The Assembly does not observe the concept of some expressions being deemed unparliamentary. Instead, the Chair requires members to show each other respect in the Chamber. 
whether they are on their feet or seated. At all times, you must avoid making personalized remarks about other members. And the Speaker's ruling, full ruling of the 18th of May 2015, which sets out the standards that are expected, is available from the business office. So there obviously there are issues for members to learn. There were a number of remarks uh, made during the, the um, uh, debate, uh, and I'm sure that the Speaker will be reviewing the content and see if he wishes to take any further action. Uh, Mr. Cackney, you, uh, you asked for a point of order as well. Well, I suppose, Mr. Deputy Speaker, my point of order was the same as, as, as the member from North Belfast, and I was going to ask you, can you advise whether or not it is in order for Mr. Wells, the proposer, of the previous motion to impugn the motives of a civil serving civil servant who cannot be here to address them. So it's something similar, but I think that needs answered. We are a scrutinising assembly, and it is in order, in my opinion, to uh, question decisions that are made. Uh, that is why we scrutinise. Uh, we all, all, obviously should avoid being personalising as we do so, uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is in order to question decisions that are made. Um, Mr Humphrey. Yeah, I thank the, the uh, Deputy Speaker for uh, allowing me to make this point of order. I, I do listen to, the, I listen to the debate intently and I, I, I obviously listen to all contributions. And, and I do have to say there is a certain degree of hypocrisy in some of the things I have listened to. I am not going to get involved in the comments about the civil servant and whatever, but it is really for members across the chamber from, this, from us on these benches to complain about people calling people names when Mr Wells and Mr Alistair were called after Waldorf and Stadler and another member referred to them as Muppets, ironically who's raised a point of order. I think that inconsistency is exposed in the House. Or, or, just order members, uh, I think if you... Uh Listened carefully to my remarks. I said there were a number of comments made during the debate, which I am sure the Speaker will want to review. Can we move forward, members? Uh, take ease before the next item of business. The next item on the order paper is a motion to suspend Standing Order 42-1.
Clark, please read the motion. Standing order 42.1 be suspended in respect of the further consideration stage of the Period Products Free Provision Bill. And I call Pat Cackney to move the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, this motion uh, to uh, suspend. No, order, order, order. I'm asking you to move the motion. Sorry. So moved. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit for this debate. And I now call Pat Cackney to open the debate on the motion. Mr. Cackney. Uh, just uh, for guidance on it, is uh, the, the debate on the motion uh, to suspend the standing order? Uh, this is the, uh, the standing order to, to suspend the standing order number 42, Thank you, part Mr. one, Speaker. the accelerated passage. Okay, it's not a role I find myself in often here over the last five years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this uh, motion to suspend standing order 42.1 is purely to do with scheduling. This standing order requires five days between legislative stages. Following consideration stage last week, this would mean that ordinarily the earliest my bill could be brought forward. For further consideration, stage would be tomorrow, the 16th of March. However, given the huge amount of business that we are required to get through before the end of the mandate, the Business Committee felt that there would be more time for further consideration stage to be taken today. This motion will require cross-community support, and I ask that this be approved. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I call Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I just speak briefly in support of the proposed motion. Thank you. And I forward uh, uh, Pat Cackney an opportunity to respond to the debate if he wishes to make any further comment or not. No further comments. Okay. Uh, before we proceed to the question, I would remind members once more that, that this motion requires cross community support. The question is the motion standing in order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. As there are eyes from all sides of the House and there are no dissenting voices, I am satisfied that the necessary cross-community support has been demonstrated. The motion is agreed. The motion is agreed. The next item on the agenda is the further consideration stage of the Period Products Free Provision Bill. And I call, call Pat Cackney to move the bill. So moved, Deputy Speaker. Members will have a copy of the Marshall List of Amendments detailing the order for consideration. The amendments have been grouped for debate in the provisional grouping of amendments selected list. There is a single group of amendments, and we will debate the amendments in turn. The, the debate will be on Amendments 1 to 32, which deal with definitions, duties, regulations and commencement. I would remind members who intend to speak during the debate on the single group of amendments that they should address all of the amendments in each group on which they wish to comment. Once the debate on each group is completed, any further amendments in the group will be moved formally as we go through the Bill, and the question of each will be put without further debate. So if that's clear, we will proceed. We now come to the single group of amendments for debate with Amendment 1. It will be convenient to debate Amendments 2 to 32. Within this group, Amendment 17 is consequential to Amendments 1 and 13, Amendments 18 to 21, and Amendments 24 and 26 are consequential to Amendment 1. Amendment 22 is consequential to Amendment 18. Amendments 25 and 29 are consequential to Amendment 13. And Amendment 28 is consequential to Amendments 23 and 24. I now call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargey, to move Amendment 1 and to address the other amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you. I, um I'm going to move amendment number one as said and right up until um, amendment 32. And just to start out, I just want to thank firstly my team within the department um, in terms of making sure that this legislation was possible, 
and just to do the tidying up of this phase. So to thank Gerard, who's here today, Beverly and Diane and the team, also for Pat, who worked with us as the proposer of the bill to make sure that we could bring forward um, these amendments. And I would like to make it clear from the outset that my amendments do not impinge on the policy or intent of this bill, but rather they will improve the bill's implementation and will correct minor legislative drafting issues. The amendments to Clause 2 of the bill ensures that all public bodies can be properly accounted for in future regulations and are specifically designed to enable protections and definitions around certain premises such as schools and healthcare settings to be put in place. A wide range of premises are caught um, by this bill and it is important that issues around their use and access are properly considered. This is an issue that was raised by the Education Committee and Paula Bradshaw at consideration stage and which has also been brought to my attention by a number of departments. The amendments to Clause 2 address these concerns by enabling departments through future regulations to list their public bodies, define certain premises in respect of their use, and um, who has legitimate access rights to these premises. All other amendments are technical in nature and are simply there to ensure that the bill is compliant with law. For these reasons, my statement will be brief. In terms of amendments to Clause 2, Amendment 1, legal advice indicates that as drafted, Section 2 leaves a risk that many public bodies will not be captured under the provision. The amendment redrafts the subsection so that departments who have responsibility under Section 2 to name public bodies can do so by their functions in respect of hospitals, schools, higher and further education. In restructuring the section in this way, departments are better able to capture public bodies within the much broader definition around their functions. In terms of Amendment 2 inserts a new subsection, the purpose of this section is to address the multitude of different premises where products will be available or caught by the Bill. The amendment extends the regulatory powers contained in Section 2 to enable premises to be further defined around their use, when they are open and who could be said to have legitimate access. This amendment addresses concerns raised at consideration stage by a number of departments around the ability to properly define certain premises, such as schools, to ensure their proper protections are in place in terms of safeguarding the people who legitimately use them. It is extremely important that we consider how certain premises are used and who has access, particularly when one of the Bill's core principles surrounds dignity, privacy and confidentiality. Enabling clarifications to be made around different types of premises assists greatly in this endeavour. In terms of Amendment 3, it is a technical fix. Amendment 4 permits the regulations made under Section 2 in consultation under Subsection 7 to be made individually or jointly, enabling a single department to take the lead if necessary. Amendments 5 and 6 are technical. Amendment 7 confirms that the regulations must be made by affirmative procedure. Amendment 8 inserts a new subsection that provides a definition of a body with functions in respect to Amendment 1. Amendment 9 is a technical redraft. I view the amendments to Clause 2 of particular importance. These amendments ensure that the Bill captures those public bodies for which it was intended and, in addition, allows for clarity around the conditions under which certain premises, such as schools, operate. Failure to pass these amendments would greatly undermine the practical application of the Bill. Amendments 10 to 32 are technical in nature and their only purpose is to make the Bill legislatively sound. I do not intend to go through them individually, however, I will briefly address Amendment 14, as it amends an amendment to Clause 8, agreed at consideration stage. Legal advice has indicated that the provision, as worded, causes a contradiction in the definition of need throughout the Bill. The amendment addresses this drafting issue without interfering with the purpose or intent of the provision itself, and these are the amendments. And I now call um, Chris Little, chairperson of the Education Committee. Mr. Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As chairperson of the Education Committee, I wish to continue to represent the Education Committee's support for the Period Products Free Provision Bill, as proposed by Pat Catney, MLA. 
and to welcome the leadership shown by the community's minister, Deidre Hargey, MLA, to step forward to provide the executive ministry needed for this important bill to pass and providing the amendments before us today regarding definitions, duties, regulations and commencement to enhance this period products free provision bill. I hope the community's minister can show similar leadership to allocate desperately needed sub-regional football stadium funding as well, which I would be glad to welcome just as warmly. Deputy Speaker, can I also recognise the efforts of Education Committee Deputy Chairperson Pat Sheehan, MLA, um, who conducted work in the background to encourage uh, the Deputy First Minister and then the Communities Minister also to provide the Executive Ministry necessary to progress this bill. They told me not to give you credit for this, Pat, but I thought you deserved it, so there you are. Um, <laughs> um, Deputy Speaker, period product provision uh, is an issue on which the, the Education Committee has worked for some time. Um, we believe that period product provision is a gender equality issue and an equal educational opportunity for all issue. I'm proud that the Education Committee uh, boats have supported Pat Catney's ship uh, on its journey, uh, and I'm delighted to see that the Communities Minister has added wind to the sails of that ship today with these amendments. Detailed and analytical feedback from the Education Committee received from departments during its committee stage would be in line with all of the amendments uh, put forward today. Can I uh, also again um, set out that the Education Committee amendments at committee stage um, in relation to the dignity uh, provision in the bill, the aspects of privacy and confidentiality and sustainability with a review to reducing waste are, are also emphasised uh, and uh, enhanced by the amendments that are put forward today. Deputy Speaker, I hope that all these amendments and provisions uh, will indeed enhance and advance period product provision for everyone in our community, that the bill will tackle taboo and it will build empathy and understanding um, for all those uh, who menstruate. Uh, on those grounds, Deputy Speaker, as Chairperson of the Education Committee and indeed uh, as Alliance Party Spokesperson for Education, I support the amendments before the House today uh, and reiterate my support for the passage of this bill onward to its final stages. Thank you. Could we have Nicola Brogan onto our screens? And I call Nicola Brogan. Um, last and Corda, I welcome the chance to speak at this further consideration stage of the uh, period products free provision bill. And I'd like to begin by uh, commending all of those who have campaigned for this legislation and to the bill sponsor, uh, Pat Catney, for bringing the issue of period products before the Assembly. The facts in support of this bill um, in support of this bill speak for themselves. One in ten of those in need of period products are unable to afford them at some time in their lives. One in seven report struggling to afford period products. And as I've mentioned before, research has found that 49% of girls have missed a day at school because of their period. So I'm really glad to show my support for this legislation because it will go some way in ensuring that girls um, don't miss school because they don't have access to period products. Last Concorda, I'm speaking in support of the amendments brought forward by the Communities Minister and I'm again grateful to her and to her Department of Officials for their, their guidance in ensuring that this legislation can progress through the Assembly. These amendments provide additional clarity which will make the implementation of this legislation easier. Amendment 1 clarifies that the public body specified within the bill involved in this duty must include bodies in relation to hospital, school, further education and higher education premises, but it does not restrict provision at other locations. Amendment number two establishes the right of access to premises and addresses safeguarding issues around who can have access to the likes of a school or other premises during closure. Concerns around the right um, of access have been raised during committee stage of this bill, so I am pleased that um, the amendments have been brought forward by the department to address these concerns. Many of the remaining amendments are technical adjustments, and I'm happy to support, to support these as well. Last and quarter, this is an inclusive bill that has many opportunities for further development after it is enacted. 
the bill will go some way to address the gender inequality, social injustice and the period poverty that, period poverty that exists in society. Um, and last and Corla, I would just like to conclude by again thanking the bill sponsor, Pat Catney, our communities minister, Deidre Hargey, and all of the organisations and groups and, and individuals who have helped us shape this very important piece of legislation. So I will be supporting the amendments and I urge all our members to do the same. Gara Mila Mavit. I call Diane Dodds. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, again, um, I rise to support um, the general principles of this bill. As I have said, uh, on many occasions in the House, um, the thrust of this bill um, was already uh, in the pilot projects that were uh, instigated in the Department of the Economy in further and higher education and uh, with the Education Minister um, in uh, that department as well. I think that this is an important bill dealing with social inclusion, the issues of poverty and ensuring that no girl is excluded from school or from the workplace because of the inability um, to purchase uh, period products. Uh, having said all that, and the member knows that I have been consistent in this, I think this is another example of a private member's bill um, that will uh, bring significant cost but has no business case to actually help us um, outline what the cost to the taxpayer will be. However, it is important that we support it and again um, I will uh, be supporting the bill. Um, I do welcome the opportunity to participate in the debate on the amendments, and I'm going to limit my remarks to amendments 1, 2, 4, 7, 8, 14 and 21. Amendment 1 stipulates the bodies that will ultimately be required to provide free period products. The bill as currently drafted specifies health trusts, regional health and social care boards and bodies responsible for school and education premises. Amendment 1 instead proposes to capture bodies with functions relating to hospital premises, schools, higher education and further education. This may afford more flexibility in terms of ensuring the provisions of the bill can be implemented. However, replacing trust, uh, references to trusts with definitions of hospital premises in Amendment 21 may narrow the scope of the duty to provide products. And we are not against a targeted rollout of provisions, but it would be helpful if the Minister would explain if there is um, any um, notion of the extent that this um, amendment um, would change this. Amendment 2 would allow departments greater discretion to define the extent of eligible premises, describe those persons deemed eligible or not eligible for free period products, and make distinction between premises that are in or out of use. In the main, we believe these provisions are sensible and may help to avoid abuse or exploitation of access to the products, as well as for the potential bills to be racked up in supplying products to premises not routinely in use. Some schools have raised concern on this front, and it is crucial that there is scope within the regulations to address this point. However, we do hold reservations regarding the new power to make descriptions of those who are eligible to avail of free products. This should not give ministers license to move away from the reality that it is women and girls who will benefit from these provisions. That said, the proposal to make regulations subject to the draft affirmative procedure through Amendment 7 may provide a barrier to this and allow greater scrutiny and accountability. Amendment 4 would ensure that regulations specifying the premises covered by the duty to provide paired products can be made by two or more departments acting jointly as long as the bodies specified are within the remit of at least one of those departments. This again would seem to make sense and allow for a joined up approach to scrutiny by the Assembly. However, we are also uh, clear that this should not be to the detriment of consultation on a sectoral basis when informing. Uh, the detail of regulations or indeed target monitoring of the impact of the provision on different establishments. Amendment 8 amends the frequency of the proposed requirement for departments to review regulations 
and monitor the impact of the bill from every three years to at intervals of no more than three years. This would seem to mitigate circumstances in which the supply of period products to certain premises could only be discontinued at the end of the three-year period, rather than through an earlier update of the regulations, if that was indeed required. We are going to oppose Amendment 14, which I do believe undermines the agreement reached on amendments at consideration stage, which rightly emphasise the reality that it is women and girls who benefit from the provision of this bill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to support the further consideration stage um, of, of this bill, and it's great that we are now debating, when I th reflect on the last debate, that we've actually finally got back to the future again, talking about pre free provision of uh, period products. As outlined by the Minister, uh, and as she has indicated, most of the amendments uh, to this bill are actually very technical uh, in, in nature, and it's a matter of really tidying up um, the bill. We are also supportive, however, of um, the substantive amendments outlined by the Minister, uh, as it will definitely improve the bill and lead to better legislation. And can I thank the Minister and her team uh, uh, that have worked so effectively with uh, this bill sponsor, Pat Catney, to bring um, this bill to this stage. This bill means so much to people. Through the journey of this bill, I have heard so many stories uh, from, from many people who have had to endure embarrassment and shame as a result of not being able to access uh, period products. So I'm proud to support uh, this further consideration stage. I am supportive of all of the amendments as outlined, and I look forward to the onward journey uh, uh, of this uh, bill coming into law. Uh, and I thank my colleague, Pat Catney, for all his hard work. And I know that many people in the future will look back at this as a really positive move by this assembly to bring forth good legislation. I wish we did that all the time. Uh, as effectively as we're doing it today. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak here today, and I'd be very brief. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the sponsor of the bill, Pat Catney, for bringing uh, the bill uh, forward and to have reached this stage with it, and hopefully it will come to a successful conclusion next week. I also want to thank Dirty Hargy, the Communities Minister, uh, for taking on the lead to respond uh, at consideration, further consideration to, to this bill. Uh, and, uh, it, it was welcome at the previous stage that uh, the, the Assembly accepted that this bill would most naturally sit in the Executive Office, and, 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 and I think that's, that's just right. Um, the, uh, the amendments that the Minister has brought forward are, by and large, uh, technical amendments. Uh, a couple of sub substantive ones uh, in, in regard to the Executive Office making regulations, uh, and, and I think that will strengthen this bill. Uh, what I think uh, will also happen is that we will have taken a step forward, a big step forward, uh, in terms of uh, gender equality and eradicating period poverty. No, no woman or girl uh, should be at a stage where they can't afford period products, uh, and this is a major step forward for this assembly. I'll be supporting this bill, Carmelvet. I now call the, the bill sponsor, Pat Cackney, to respond to the debate. Oh, sorry, apologies, is there an arm? I, I call Clara Hunter. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I too will be very brief. Um, just to add uh, my support and to reiterate it and re-emphasise it, uh, both for my colleague Pat Catney, but also, um, of course, for this very uh, important bill at this further consideration stage. And Pat, I, I have to say, we're literally and figuratively uh, behind you today um, as we're at this stage. And when passed, we know that this bill will allow for the free provision of these products, which will undoubtedly improve the quality of life for hundreds of thousands of women uh, across the north. Um, whoever, when they need these products. Um, it's just absolutely vital that they get them, especially in our most deprived areas. We will be supporting all amendments today, and I'd like to thank Pat, the departmental officials, uh, the Minister for Communities, and all those at the Bill Office uh, for their time and efforts to see this bill through. Uh, 
I welcome the cross-party support for it here today. And the SDLP is about putting people first, and I think that this piece of legislation is so important and is a real example of that. Um, but I think it's also an example of what we can achieve, as my colleague Shuneet has mentioned, when we collectively work together. And the past few weeks have been very enlightening, I think, uh, to witness what can go through this House uh, when we work as a team. So uh, thank you, Pat, for bringing this important piece of legislation forward um, that I believe uh, plays a huge role uh, in equality and social justice. Uh, and I look forward to next week uh, when it goes through the House. Thank you. And I now call Pat Cackney, the sponsor of the bill, to respond to the Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do thank the support right across the House uh, and all the engagement that I have got and the help that I have got. Um, I want to thank our Minister Dirty Hargey for helping to bring this through the Assembly. Uh, I know the difficulties that were there. We spoke about them. I spoke about it with the, the uh, Chair of the Education Committee, and I know the help that I got from Pat Sheehan as well, and I know he paid tribute to it. And I want to pay tribute to every single person that's helped us shape this and where we are with it today. I particularly want to thank the officials from the Department of Communities that have given up their time to work on this. I would especially like to thank Beverly, Diane, Martina and Jared. We have had a number of meetings over the last few weeks with frank and open discussion about the amendments coming forward. They have made themselves available at any time for any discussions that were needed to move forward. As the Minister has stated, most of these amendments are technical in nature, so do not require a lot of discussion. They have served as a good way for me to get more acquainted with the Interpretation Act, Northern Ireland 1954, which I am sure members here looking around, oh, there's maybe one more senior than I am, uh, will know this piece of legislation cover to cover. I recommend it to all members, particularly any that suffer from insomnia. Regarding the more substantive amendments, I would like to thank the Minister for bringing forward amendments one and two. But, absolutely. Thank the member for giving way, absolutely. I appreciate that. Uh, the member is aware that uh, indeed the Education Committee took on the very early role uh, that he had uh, requested. Uh, indeed, uh, Mrs. Dodds made, made the point that this is a bill which at this moment in time does not have a natural home, and indeed which many suspect has a budget uh, that will be much more expensive than the outline within the, the, the current bill. Would the member agree with me that, particularly in education, where the budget is under so much stress at this moment in time, that should this bill pass, that the cost of the bill implementing the bill and delivering uh, the products in schools ought not to be at the cost of the current education budget, but should be in addition and supplied the cost in addition so that the education budget does not face further stress should this bill pass. Thank the member for his intervention, and yes, I do agree with what you said. I think it's a little bit above my pay grade as the bill sponsor to know exactly where it sits within uh, the executive office. But as we have known, the Minister uh, for Communities has taken that on board. In fact, I thought at the outset uh, that uh, it would have sat better with uh, the Health Department. But we are where we are. It's cross-cutting, and it will go across all departments. And I believe that there will be, sub there will be agreement through all of those. So there's no one particular party is facing the costs of this. But the costs are not as great as we might have thought. I'm not going to speak on the cost today, and we'll do that so I will at, at the next stage, because I've done it on that, that last stage. But I do thank the member for making that very valid point, and I am in complete agreement with what he has said. Uh, by allowing the departments to bring forward the regulations uh, to persons on the premises, these amendments help to address some of the concerns the departments have raised about the operation of Clause 2. Uh, they are also a more elegant solution than looking ambiguously at definitions of those legitimate causes to be in public uh, 
building. So I want to try and legitimise the cause for people to be there within that public building. These amendments fit with the whole ethos of the bill to create a framework to allow for the free provision of period products and in line with the requirements in Clause 3. They will lead to a better functioning scheme under Clause 2. Similarly, Amendment 4 that allows departments to make regulations jointly with two or more others makes sense and indeed it addresses the point already made by the member opposite. Uh, due to a knowledge on the cross-cutting nature of the bill, Amendment 7 is important as well to give overall scrutiny to the Assembly. The other amendments are technical, so I again want to thank the team from the Department as well as the oversight given by the Office of Legislative Council. These amendments lead to better legislation and will lead to better schemes being developed when the duties come into operation. I do have more to say, uh, but that's all I, that I reserve remarks for today. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call on the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to wind. Yeah, thanks very much, and thank you to everyone um, who's made a contribution today, and in, indeed at the, the previous stage as well. And I suppose just to comment quickly on the remarks be, made by the Chair of the Education Committee in terms of sub regional study. I know it's nothing to do with this, but just to assure him that I have proposals ready. Um, they are ready to go. I'm looking at a legal advice in terms of how I can progress those, but of course the quickest way of doing that is having a functioning executive in which I could present these today or tomorrow, um, and that would be the quickest way. I think getting back to the other items, um, I mean this legislation is welcome. It's quite clear from the previous stages of this, and indeed when it was discussed at committee, it's necessary and will have a hugely positive impact on many people's um, lives. And I suppose my role in this was just to get it to this point to ensure that I could work with the sponsor of the bill and the proposer to ensure that it becomes law as well. And hopefully by next week um, that will be the case in terms of moving that one step closer. I think in terms of some of the queries that were raised, I mean, the regulations um, will clearly set out premises where products are available and how they can be accessed. They will be subject to assembly scrutiny, as was said, so there is no attempt to remove any bodies. And indeed, the amendments ensure that anyone who menstruates um, can have access to these products, and I think that that is really clear, um, that they are open for those who need them. Um, and I think in terms of Amendment 14, the Office of Legislative Council have clearly stated um, that this amendment does not impinge on the policy or intent of the amendment agreed at consideration stage, um, and it is really an attempt uh, to redraft it in a more appropriate legislative uh, form. So again, I am glad that we are at this point. Again, I want to thank um, Pat for working with the Department in terms of the amendments and indeed everyone in the House um, in terms of getting the amendments through at this stage. Um, and obviously, these are the amendments now. Hopefully, that we can all vote on and move it to the final stage. Thank you. Amendment proposed to clause two, page two, line eighteen, leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is that amendment one be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment two has already been debated, and I call the minister uh, for communities to move on the amendment two. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 2, page 2, line 37. Insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is that Amendment 2 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 3 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 3. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 2, leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is Amendment 3 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 4 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 4. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 2, insert words as printed on the marshal list. The question is Amendment 4 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 5 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 5. Moved. 
A member proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 3, leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is Amendment 5 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 6 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 6. Moved. A member proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 9, leave out words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is that Amendment 6 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 7 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 7. Moved. A member opposed to clause 2, page 3, line 10, leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is that Amendment 7 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 8 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 8. Moved. A member proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 11, leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is that Amendment 8 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 9 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for the Communities to move forward with Amendment 9. Moved. A member proposed to clause 2, page 3, line 13, insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is that Amendment 9 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 10 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 10. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 3, page 3, line 25, leave out words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is that Amendment 10 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 11 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 11. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 3, page 3, line 27, leave out words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is that Amendment 11 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 12 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 12. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 3, page 3, line 29, leave out words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is Amendment 12 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 13 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for the Communities to move a formally Amendment 13. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 6, page 5, line 18, Leave out words as printed on the marshal of the list. The questions of Amendment 13 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 14 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally at Amendment 14. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 8, page 5, line 38. Leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is that Amendment 14 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I'm, I'm hearing ayes from many sides of the House. I'm hearing no's from the DUP benches. Uh, that opposition is on the record. Uh, I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 15 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Agreement to move formally Amendment 15. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 3, leave out words as printed on the marshal of the list. The question is Amendment 15 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 16 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Agreement to move formally Amendment 16. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 9, page 6, line 4, insert words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is that Amendment 16 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 17 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for the Communities to move formally Amendment 17. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 9, page 6, line 5, leave out words as printed on the marshal's list. The question is Amendment 17 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 18 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 18. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 10, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. 
The question is Amendment 18 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 19 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 19. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 11. Leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 19 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 20 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 20. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 14, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is Amendment 20 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 21 has already been debated. The Colour Minister for Communities move formally Amendment 21. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 14, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 21 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 22 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move forward with Amendment 22. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 14, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 22 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 23 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for the Community to move formally. Amendment 23. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 16, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 23 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 24 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for the Community to move formally. Amendment 24. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 19, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 24 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 25 has already been debated in the Columbus for, for communities to move. Formally, Amendment 25. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 20, leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is Amendment 25 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 26 has already been debated in the Columbus for communities to move. Formally, Amendment 26. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 23, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is Amendment 26 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 27 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 27. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 25, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is Amendment 27 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 28 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 28. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 25, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 28 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 29 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 29. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 9, page 6, line 26, leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 29 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 30 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally Amendment 30. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 10, page 6, line 31. Leave out and insert words as printed on the margin of the list. The question is that Amendment 30 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. <coughs> amendment 31 has already been debated. And I call the Minister for Communities to move formally. Amendment 31. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 10, page 6, line 36. Leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 31 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. 
country no the eyes have it the eyes have it amendment 32 has already been debated and i call the minister for communities to move formally at amendment 32 moved amendment proposed to clause 11 page 7 line 2 leave out and insert words as printed on the marshal list the question is that amendment 32 be made all those in favour say aye country no the ayes have it the ayes have it and that concludes the further consideration stage of the period products free provisions provision bill the bill stands referred to the speaker next item in the order paper is adjournment the question is that the assembly do now adjourn the assembly is adjourned This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary 